No, priamo v tom mojom účte YouTube. Viac svetla by malo byť tam. Máme malo svetla. Píše tam, že nedá sa tu s jedným kúčom, len dva s kúčom. Tak necháme tam pôvodne, už máme malo času na menu. Ano, prosím. Ano? No? O, nedá sa to. O, ne, nedá sa to so na dva streamy. Píše tam, že tam tu prikladný kľúč a že... Nechávame to tak, jak je. V zadných radách by sme nemali sedieť, všetci sa posunieme trošku dopredu. Posledné dve rady by nemali byť obsadené. Nikoleta, you can be here. Môžete tam dostať čokoľvek. zase príliš blízko pri kamere. Dve a pol metra od kamery. O jednu radu ďalej. Thank you. 
tak ako včera, aj dnes budeme klásť otázky, tak som zvedavý, že ako budete mať pripravené otázky. Ja som urobil nejaký schedule, ako budem zadávať, ale keďže zatiaľ sme nedodržali dohodu, že pol hodiny pred 9.30, to mali byť všetci študenti zúčastnení, tak budem oslovať tých, ktorí tu sú. Takže poprosím vás, keby ste vnímali to, čo vlastne speakeri hovoria a postupne vám budem dávať slovo na kladenie otázok a prosím, keby ste dávali odvodné otázky, to znamená nie také typu, že ako sa cítite alebo aké je počasie, čo včera sa párkrát stalo, ale proste niečo, čo dáva zmysel v zmysle odbornosti a posudzovania teda profesionálneho pohľadu na problematiku. to Teams partner. Uh, please switch your camera for the beginning. We'll test our uh, audio if it uh, is uh, still uh, working. Uh, and uh, if uh, there will be uh, anything technical, okay, we'll start our conference. So please uh, feel free to try to uh, say hello. <laughs> no, no I, I don't hear your 
song, so it's, it's my turn for the day. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, fantastic. Okay, perfect. Uh, Hello, Hello, Hello everyone. everyone, once again, after the massive session of yesterday, I'm looking forward to see uh, the presentations for today. Today will be much more chill out for me. me. Just, <laughs> so, have a nice day. Uh, okay. So, uh, everyone, once again, after so massive session of yesterday. I'm looking forward to see uh, the presentations for today. Today will be much more chill out for me. Just some voice. Uh, uh, have a nice day. That's the YouTube session. The YouTube session is amazing. Massive session of yesterday. I have to find a playlist playing this session. Presentations for today. Today will be much more chill out for me. Okay, so mishmash, fantastic. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Before we start, uh, uh, so for colleagues, we have a session on uh, YouTube, and I share uh, the website to the chat. So, uh, yesterday the YouTube session was quite low. The sound. Uh, I see. So, uh, which one? Uh, the participants uh, low sound or participants? The YouTube link uh, from yesterday. The sound. YouTube link. Okay, so students that uh, have to care about uh, how to pick up like that. I have information that uh, it is not possible to put a uh, higher level of, of sound in YouTube. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everybody for our uh, the second day of uh, our conference. Uh, as we spent uh, yesterday uh, the day, so we met students uh, from Bratislava, from our first grade of uh, 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 from uh, uh, graduate studies, and then we met students from Belgium, uh, two groups, uh, that was very interesting, and then we had students from uh, Lusophona, and they uh, showed us uh, their project uh, from game design. Uh, I, I think that it was a very, very successful meeting, and we can compare our com uh, ambitions with uh, ambitions from students from in future from all over the Europe and, and uh, it is the main goal for future to be participants for uh, uh, community that uh, the name is uh, Film EU and uh, our school uh, started to be a member of uh, this Film EU and there are eight participants, uh, uh, they are from Ireland, uh, from uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, Portugal, uh, then uh, Belgium, Estonia, Bulgaria, uh, I, I think Denmark, uh, and, and uh, maybe Lithuania. So eight universities. And uh, for today's program, uh, the first speaker will be also from this uh, uh, this community from Film EU, <coughs> uh, Tobias uh, Flusnergen. He is originally from uh, Germany, and uh, and uh, uh, he will be the first speaker. Then we'll have uh, Victor Manuel Navarro Remezal from Spain. Uh, then uh, will be uh, uh, 
Rosa uh, Rodriguez de Almeida from uh, one spa from uh, Lusophona University. Then I want to invite uh, our special guest from uh, London, from England, uh, Nicoleta Wood. So say hello. Yes. Uh, she came personally and she will participate also on her presentation and later on the workshop. And uh, 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 last guest today will be Peter van Oite from Belgium slash uh, Canada and I will be very interested in his participation in uh, Canada professional uh, uh, staff. <coughs> And, uh, and then in the afternoon, uh, with the beginning approximately at 2 o'clock, we'll have a workshop with uh, both our special guests, with uh, Nicoletta and Peter. Uh, and uh, the host of this meeting will be Michal Shabik uh, as our teacher of both uh, the studies program, game design and the visual effects. So it is a, a very brief uh, a program for today. I, I would like to uh, give a first introduction about for everybody and then Tobias will start his uh, presentation. So uh, Philippe uh, try to tell something uh, uh, in, in the beginning. Uh, can you hear? No, it was just saying, uh, uh, just saying hello and um... I hope it's going to be an amazing session like yesterday and looking forward for seeing uh, all the, the talks. Thank you. Yes, uh, well done, please. Uh. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm also looking forward for the sessions today and I hope you, you like what I'm going to talk about, about game design in, uh, in a bit. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Victor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, hope you like my presentation as well. I have to teach. I won't be with you the full morning, but we will talk later after my presentation. And I will be available afterwards. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, so we uh, are introduced, everybody, now in this moment. And uh, I, I want to say that we met with uh, Tobias uh, two days ago on the ground of Albert uh, He attended our atelier and uh, I showed uh, him uh, several works of our students. So he is kind of informed. And uh, what is uh, the most important for me, uh, he, he is a uh, uh, scientist in the area of script play with connection with uh, artificial intelligence. It is for me a huge theme for future because I'm uh, uh, very sure that probably in, uh, may, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe in 10, maybe 20 years, there it will be possible that, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence will uh, be able to make scripts. So it's, it's my uh, hope for future. And I will tell something about him. Um, as a film lecturer, uh, he teaches in a creative production and European film heritage and project uh, tutoring and thesis supervisor at uh, Russophona University, uh, Lisbon, for the Euro European Master Program, uh, as well as the Master Film Studies and uh, Cinema Bachelors and uh, uh, Green Production. It, it will be very interesting, this uh, Green Production for me. Uh, he also works in uh, exchange programs like uh, Looking uh, China. Yes, it's uh, very interesting. And uh, research programs like uh, uh, Crescine, I don't know if pronunciation, and Film Term, uh, Future, uh, uh, future uh, Film Education, uh, Accelerate, Cyanotypes. Uh, and the film EU research innovation transfer. Since uh, 2020, he is also part of the uh, curriculum pedagogy and artistic research development of the European University's uh, Alliance for Film and Media Arts, Film EU, and Film EU Plus, uh, as well as a project supervisor for yearly pilot and a coordinator for the joint research project. 
uh, on screenwriting and uh, GPT-4. Since uh, 2021, he has been uh, researching on his artistic-based PhD at the Film University of Babelsberg, so he is originally from uh, Germany. Uh, uh, and uh, artistic artificial intelligence uh, writing and screenplay, screenplay uh, with uh, AI. His artistic works as a director and or editor include a variety of feature films, uh, short films, television art, and music videos. His film, uh, Menschen Kopfe, uh, <laughs> it's probably, probably my pronunciation, uh, was screened at more as 25 festivals worldwide. Among his editing works uh, is the restoration and re-editing for uh, Yelmas Gunez, uh, which uh, premiered at Cannes Festival 2017. Tobias also works a story analyst for international feature screenplays and is a certified green consultant for film. Production. So this is a very brief introduction of Tobias. Please, uh, you, you can tell some uh, first words and then share your presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and welcome everyone uh, for this day and for this first session. Um, thank you for the long introduction <laughs> and um, I am uh, I'm currently, um, yes, I'm German, I'm, uh, I'm teaching in, in Lisbon, in Portugal. Two days ago, I was still sitting in that room where you are in right now in that cinema because we presented Film EU, the next edition of Film EU. And um, I, I can't see you all, but I think you are, some of you were there. Um, and I'm going to present to you today something um, that is a little bit off the track from, from, the, from the game design and VFX, but it has a deep connection to it. I hope you will find out during the presentation because I'm going to speak about um, GPT and screenwriting or GPT and storytelling. And I had um, many conversations with uh, with uh, two days ago, and I see that your department is very much focused on the storytelling aspect. So I think we have a we we have some um, some joint uh, efforts here. Um, the screen is still shared, so I can't share mine. I guess um, you, I guess you, you can share. You, I can. Okay, you, yes. I'll try to overlap that. Um, Right. Okay. So uh, I guess you see my full screen um, and uh, at the first slide of my presentation. So you see, I'm affiliated with a couple of uh, institutions: FilmU, uh, FilmU RIC, which is the search uh, department, or FilmU Wire. This is the future research department of FilmU. I'm teaching in Lusophony University in Lisbon, uh, and I'm there part of the research center called CCAM. And at the same time, I'm affiliated with a film university in Babelsberg in Germany, where I'm doing my PhD. I'm on the same topic. Um, my project that I'm that I'm presenting today, which is part of a film you wide project, uh, is called Machine Acts, collaborative screen writing with GPT. It used to be called collaborative screen writing with GPT-3 when we started uh, one and a half years ago, but we just dropped the three because four was introduced and um, I think soon we're going to have more. And I mean, yesterday Meta Llama 3 came out. Uh, so this is a constant process of, of new inventions. This is an artistic research project, um, and I'm emphasizing on this because uh, it has these two components that I'm going to also present today. It has a scientific part, a philosophical part, uh, even um, looking at what is AI actually, what is its nature, and it has an artistic part. So how are we going to use this artistically? Um, the beneficiaries from this project and also from today's presentations are uh, screenwriters. Um, this is now a focus on cinema, you see, but I mean, I think you can transfer that easily to the games and uh, department and to 
to that is screenwriters, producers, or professional story developers, academic researchers in film, film students, like probably many of you are, um, and also uh, the viewing audience, so the general audience. Um, this is just briefly the team of, of Machine Acts. I'm not going to go very deep into that, but you might see that we have a quite a variety of, uh, of, of approaches from storytelling and artificial intelligence over the philosophy of art to music, XR, LARP, game design, computational photography, so we, and even sociology. Uh, we had a quite a broad approach. I'm going to present only a narrow part of this today. What is AI? And I think this quote um, is, 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 I like this quote always, like a, like a snake in eating its own tail, artificial intelligence exists in a circular relationship with its human creators. And I hope you will see during the presentation what that means, because we created artificial intelligence, we humans, and we nurture it, and it comes back to us all the time, and it's a loop, um, a constant loop, uh, and we almost, it's almost that we invented a new living creatures in quotation marks, a new creature that lives in the, in the, in the service all around the world. This project um, focuses on artistic research. I think you are all aware what that is. Uh, artistic research is researching with artistic means a scientific problem um, and finding out and or giving solutions um, uh, in an artistic way um, about a problem that exists in the world and that problem well, problem sounds so hard right uh, so the question the research question is how can we collaborate with a machine um, for for uh, with uh, for screenplay writing we are focusing on machine learning and large language models on GPT. I'm not going to go into the distinction of, you know, deep learning, machine learning, LLMs, so large language models, GPT. I just take it as more or less the same for today's session and skip that definitions because I think that's not useful for what we're going to talk about today. Um, we have uh produced a, a three-part mini series screenplay and i'm showing you some examples of that um these are keywords for our research focusing maybe here on the co-creation of storytelling and this is um my side we don't see uh, what you're talking about uh, uh, you don't Switch uh, uh, slides, please. Yes, where are you? I'm still. I'm already on slide five. I, I, didn't I you see anything we, of that? We, we saw all the time just first slide. Oh man. Uh, okay. I'm sorry for that. I'm gonna unshare and share again. Uh, okay. Can you see now the slack second slide or the third slide? Yeah, we, we can see. Yes. It's new. Okay. Okay. So this would have been the the quote that I'm that I've been talking about, like uh, the 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 deep connection between AI and humans in a circular relationship, um, and um, the artistic research slide um, that we're focusing on uh, artistic research with uh, GPT and looking for a problem, a question of how do we write screenplays? How can we co-create a screenplay? with AI. Um, these would be some keywords, uh, natural language processing, GPT-4, co-creation, storytelling, and we have also bots and stable diffusions, but I will jump over that today. So my scientific research questions are, I have two, you will see on the next slide, I also have artistic research questions. So this is the nature of artistic research. What are the new artistic affordances of co-creation? between AI and human technologies, and how can we use these artistic expressions to facilitate new opportunities? I'm focusing here on the artistic um, approach as opposed to a technological approach and so forth. Are machines really creative or do they just simulate this creation? And what is the difference between human and machine creativity and how can we both enter in a uh, fruitful exchange. 
the artistic research question, which is the other side of the coin, how can we, how does a dialogue develop between the human and the machines? And what are the, what are the tools of this co-creation? What are the prompts that we're going to use? And the big question is, is GPT-4 or are all these language models nowadays, are they only a statistical word processing machine or can they ever be an equal writing companion? The outputs of that project, um, I said, is, uh, are, are the screenplays and case studies we did with the students. We created metaphor bots, uh, image creation bots, dream bots. Um, and we also had LARPing sessions um, that might be of interest to you. I'm going to speak about that later. The co-creation between AI and human storytellers means that we wanted to create a satisfying output quotation in the form of a screenplay during this creation of the uh, uh, research on narrative processes. What means satisfying output? Satisfying output is a uh, is a is a, is a <laughs> definition is a definition that we have in screenplay writing, and that is. A satisfying resolution is one that effectively addresses the questions and the themes and the topics that are introduced in the initial uh, um, setup of the film. So the answer that most of the times the protagonist is looking for must be answered. The questions that he or she is looking for must be answered in some way, not necessarily positively or negatively, but they must be answered. And this sense, Second quote, this sense of fulfillment is achieved when the conclusion aligns with and meaningfully explores the central topic of the film. Good stories make you feel you've been through a satisfying, complete experience. That means that um, we must take AI to the point of being able to create that satisfying conclusion. It does not mean that we're satisfying does not mean happy ending or tragic ending or ambiguous ending. That's another way of ending the film or the story or the narrative. It means that the question you ask at the beginning, is the world a good place to live, for example, must be answered um, or can humans survive uh, uh, the, 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 the attack of fungi uh, on, on the whole planet? Last of Us. Yes, that's the initial question of that series. And this is answered throughout the question. And it can be answered with yes, no, maybe, but it needs to be answered. GPT is a black box. All of these language models are a black box because we don't know how they are really trained. We assume, but we don't know. And this makes it quite hard scientifically because uh, we have to guess. We know where the data is coming from. The data has been, it must be said like this, it has been stolen from the internet uh, under some pretexts of research. It has been turned into, uh, it has been analyzed with, um, with, uh, with, with algorithms that we are, that are far beyond my, or I think all of our knowledge. Uh, yeah, that's the secret of OpenAI and all of these um, companies. The, uh, the, these data has been labeled by, by, you have to say that, slave workers in the developing countries. Um, uh, AI is not this clean and automatic and super duper thing, but it has also a big part of, of slavery work included in that. Um, that makes it quite hard to predict the outputs. That's the that what makes us that that's what's important for us. Um, that makes it quite you all. We never know what you really get. Sometimes you get hallucinations. Hallucination is the definition of when GPT is writing nonsense and without reason. You know, sometimes you get brilliant outputs. Sometimes you get mediocre outputs. So how is this human machine collaboration working? We have set up what we call a writer's room situation. A writer's room situation is a collaborative environment, like a table, uh, 
where a group of screenwriters or storytellers work together to develop, write, and refine a screenplay. You see already the three steps of writing and of, of, of a screenplay process, developing that, writing that, and refining that. Um, this is uh, a screenshot from a, you know, a tour. This is how a, a, a writer's room looks like. It's really just a bunch of, of, of seats. And this is um, the, the, the board where people are plotting and creating the storylines. So this is actually what we have in mind when we speak about collaborating with AI. I know we are creating a digital environment, but this is what I always have in mind a situation of a co-creation with uh, with two or more uh, different people, and one of them is TPT. How do we talk to machines? Um, that's a huge field, and um, there is an article, I'm zooming in a bit, I hope you can see that, there is an article called Principles Instructions of All You Need for Questioning These Models, um, and it sets up 26 ways of talking to machines and I, I just want to show you some of them because I really like the first one because it says you don't need to polite with these machines. Um, there is no need to say please or can you please or can you don't if you don't mind, thank you. You, They say you just talk to the machine and uh, tell it what to do. There are others um, of like number six if you are creating a storyline that is doing this and this, I'm going to give you a tip. Uh, I'm going to give you money. Um, and I think your task is, or you must, that's the way to talk to the machine. This is what this article suggests. And this is also what my experience showed during the, during the past two years. Um, of course, I'm gonna. I, I feel it's strange to say to the machine, "You must develop a screenplay with this and these parameters." Instead of "Could you please?" Because this is how we talk to a writer's in a writer's room situation to a human being. Okay, so that's um, if you wanna if you wanna have this article, that's you can see later. This is the article um, link. <clears throat> uh, so I'm gonna zoom out again. We created three screenplays and we created um, three topics that we had to start with because I think all of your experience already shows when you ask the machine, can you please, please create a screenplay? I mean, that's very naive, but let's assume you ask that. Can you please create a screenplay? Then only very, very mediocre slash shitty stuff comes out. Um, that's not relevant for real artistic um, um, invention or creation. We had a, uh, we had an example that we were always referring to, the Devs, this miniseries uh, by 2020. Um, this is by Rx Garland um, um, because it also has this, you know, technological focus and um, and 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 this the time travel and it's 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 a very cool series also, but it also deeply connected to technology. Because you have also probably experienced already that for GPT, for these language models, it's very easy to speak about technology. It's very hard to speak about human emotions, human relations, human dynamics, but it's very easy to speak about a, a technological environment within the Silicon Valley, within a startup in San Francisco or somewhere, um, because this is uh, this is where most of this training data is coming from, right? We also have to speak about what kind of text is a screenplay actually, or what kind of, if you transfer that to the games department, what kind of um, template do you have for developing a story for a game, you know? And a screenplay, we, uh, we first of all, it's never actually really published. Sure, it's out there on the internet, but people hardly read it. Only a very specific type of people read it. Uh, directors, producers, uh, all the people involved in the film, but the general public does hardly read screenplays. You can see the very special format, the number of uh, scenes, uh, scene left and right, the, 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 um, the scene heading, the dialogue is in the middle, and so forth. This is, by the way, the first scene of Chernobyl, uh, the series. 
A screenplay is a blueprint for something else. And in my case, a blueprint for a film or a TV series. In your case, probably the blueprint for a, for a game. So it has another purpose than itself. These were the three topics that we were developing, uh, with that, that we were starting with. And actually, we were developing that with GPT also. Surprise me with what I want. Transdividuals, future subjects, and the divide itself, and Narcissus and the Oracle. These are all topics that are that have to do with the human AI relation, um, and these are topics that are like also kind of philosophical debates that are happening right now. Um, we wrote these four screenplays. You can see number one has 48 pages always the eight sequences. Um, that's the normal, the classical uh, approach for a cinema screenplay um, that has been shown by Frank Daniel um, from, from, from uh, uh, yeah, and, and I always ask it also for an outro um, to have, like in Black Mirror, uh, you know, that other TV series, you have the classical narrative and then an outro who reflects that. We have 50 scenes. Um, and I'm going to just jump to the next one. This is 72 pages and 103 screens. And the next one is 47 pages. And so it's quite long screenplays. Um, um, and if we have time later or uh, like in the question sections, I can, of course, open those screenplays. Also, what were uh, the good things and the things that didn't work? The good things is um, that you can ask GPT anytime, it never sleeps, um, it never pauses. Sometimes it has a network failure uh, and sometimes you have a message cap because you ex exceeded the 40 messages per three hours, you know that problem, uh, even though in the paying version. But you can create very easily anything you want, but only if you know what you want. And this is the pitfall number one, if you are not clear, if you don't know how to write a story, then every result from GPT-4 will be boring, mediocre, or uh, a bad. Um, and so you first, when you start this, the first thing you need to work on is your prompt. And um, People are making now like a secret about their prompts. Um, and this is because they have been working very long about on, on how to talk to the machine. You see, that's the topic of co-creation and how to, um, uh, uh, how to refine that prompt in a way that you get the result you want. You would obviously always start with you are an experienced screenplay writer for a TV series, you know, you need to set the uh, set what it is, what it should pretend to be. Sorry, what it is is wrong. What it pre should pretend to be is the right way to say it. Um, and you have to give it examples. That's why I said before Deaths, for example, or Chernobyl or Black Mirror. So you have to say you are an experienced screenplay writer and you are you love the TV series Chernobyl or you you name it, you know, you have to give it an example and then you have to be very clear what it should develop. And you cannot develop a screenplay in one place. Of course not, because the output length of GPT is not 48 pages. It's much less. You know, we all know that it thinks in tokens. So uh, it's this is a process of around 200 or 300 prompts for for each screenplay um, for a first draft. Um, I can go more into the into the into the practical stuff also when you have some questions later. I wanna wrap up a bit by saying um, giving you some philosophical quotes on that um, on that whole process. What is GPT? Is, is it like a typewriter AI generation will change how we write? Yes, I think we all agree on that. But systems like GPT-3 in this case 
are more than just generators of text. They are mirrors that reflect our own thoughts back to us. So we live in this loop, in this, in this snake, you know, uh, that I've described before. Everything we're doing from now on will always be fed into the system of AI and will come back to us. This creates maybe problems because the, uh, the, the training data that is produced now for future AI models might be weaker than the ones we've created before. But this is how we live. We have to live with this mirror that AI gives us. But there is also a huge critique on this whole process that seems so fast and super duper and, and, and so on. Because the current GPT systems, they provide remarkably little in the way of explanations and anything about the world. They don't tell us why the world is like this. They just mimic statistical patterns of how language has been used in their databases. GPT knows nothing about the world. You have to be sure about this. The only person, the only um, one who knows anything about the world in this co-creation process is you, is us humans. Everything the machine does is simulation of this based on text. GPT does not have access to the senses we have. We have so many different senses. We can smell, we can see, we can hear, we can think, if you say that thinking is also sensory. GPT can only produce text and images. And based on the images, it can now produce videos. But it can never have the feeling of smell, the feeling of touching, the feeling of thinking. GPT is a stoch stoch stochastic parrot. I, you, I think you've heard that expression. It can only blah, blah, blah what it has been trained on in their databases, but not and combine everything in a new way, which is also a definition of creativity. Yes, but it cannot create anything new. Just jumping to that Chinese uh, room um, example of John Surly already like 40 years ago, AI has very little to tell us about thinking since it's not about machines, but about programs and no program by itself is sufficient for thinking. Thinking is a sensory, sensory ability. It is impossible for computers to develop a consciousness because they lack all of these sensory abilities, the ones I was just talking about. Current computers, because we don't know what's gonna happen when we have quantum computers, right? But still, it will lack the sensory abilities. We, you could also name that, like Raphael Miller says it, an advanced mimicry that is almost uh, indistinguishable of intelligent behavior, but it's still only mimicry and it's still not <coughs> intelligent behavior. So the question is, for right storytellers and for any artist, why should we place our trust in a machine to narrate human stories when such an entity like the machines lacks any form of corporal, of, of, of body, of sensory experience, smell, or first-hand experience of life, you know, um, given that it's only trained on text. <laughs> we the only way of overcoming this problem in an artistic way is to create a meaningful relation of creative partners, where, like in a writer's room, everyone has his or her or its task of, um, I can, I'm very good at this, you're very good at this. The machine is very good in writing so many tokens uh, per second that humans will never be able to uh, achieve. The machine has access to large databases and can remember many things that we humans can not remember. It can see patterns of different stories uh, by analyzing hundreds or thousands of stories. We cannot do that, but the only uh, person here who can create meaning or who can curate 
meaning is as humans. And this might be a suggestion for uh, Lev Manovich, the great guy. You should all read him and see he's publishing everything. Uh, and he's uh, really at the forefront of this, uh, of this of co-creation with the machine. Art, AI art, is a type of art that we humans are not able to create because of the limitations of our body. And he says, yes, we are limited, and this is our advantage. How does the concept of art and storytelling change when it's produced with machines? You will have to answer that for yourself, but I hoped I could give you some of some inspiration, philosophical and practical inspiration with this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, uh, it was a great experience for me and a great uh, place for thinking. I uh, know that uh, for explanation of uh, this theory for future, uh, I will have to discuss you with you much, <laughs> a, a, a lot, <laughs> uh, because uh, generally I think that all these things about uh, ability of touching and smelling in, in future will be possible for uh, in 100 or 200 years or when uh, uh, there will be uh, age of uh, humanoids and, and uh, you know artificial intelligence that will be really exact uh, similar beings as, as uh, we are. So uh, in, in future I, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, this artificial intelligence will uh, be able to smell and to touch and to think, I, I, I'm sure. But for this moment and next 10 years and probably for your life, it is exactly what Tobias said. And, and, uh, and, and from my side uh, of, uh, point of view. So uh, I would like to uh, give a uh, uh, possibility to uh, have a question uh, Miss Rakotsiva, if uh, she is here. Uh, the mic is not on. Uh, microphone, we are preparing my, my microphone. Uh, uh, later, I will give uh, uh, possibility to put question also to Philippe and Gilson and, uh, and uh, uh, So, Ms. Rakotsiova. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, closer. Um, well, my question uh, is uh, if you incorporate ChatGPT into your work for workflow uh, for tasks other than uh, screen writing. And if you also consider to make a whole project by using only AI based on your screenplay. Okay, uh, so the question number two is yes, we're planning that uh, to make a whole, and I, I assume with whole you mean uh, one with images and sound, right? Um, yes. uh, so we are going to, we're going to do that. Um, the thing is, this is still too weak, um, even though Sora, that's the OpenAI video generator, or Runway ML looks great when it's advertised. Um, it's not consistent in characters. It's, the, it's not consistent. And you have 
to do a lot of work to put the things together. Um, if we're speaking more about automated cinema, uh, I think I just created a new genre here. Um, if we sp if we want to do that, um, then we still need to wait a half a year or one more year or something in order to so that this is fluent, so that uh, this is. And also uh, the second part of that is I also want to get away a bit of the big companies. Um, there are so many open language models out there um, that and and in the future um, video and, and audio generators and, and so on. I want to focus on that more because I don't think that the future of of of, of AI lies in closed um, closed companies, but it lies in like Wikipedia or something lies in open models um, that are that are um, developed. And I mean, there are so many open models right now, you know, um, Mist or half open at least, backed by a huge company, Mistral in Europe or Llama by Meta. And, 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 and you just need to go to Hugging Face and, and see all of these hundreds of models out there. And the first question was, uh, how do I integrate uh, AI in 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 work other than AI in other than screenwriting? Right, um, a lot. I mean, translation. Um, I live in a country which is not my mother language, so I, I use it for translation. I use it for correcting uh, my Portuguese also sometimes. Um, I use it. Um, uh, for summarizing stuff that I might want to read, but I'm not sure if I should go these 200 pages. Um, um, uh, that's, 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 and I, I, I mean, yes, and this is another thing, what AI will probably be used for very soon. If you check perplexity.ai, this is another, uh, this is another um, uh, company. I guess my guess is that it will replace the current search engines very soon because of the tailored personal answers uh, that you will have. So instead of asking Google uh, best restaurants in Tallinn, um, you and then you get a list of um, you know that I think this will uh, this will replace um, the search engines quite faster than than we think. Yes, thank you. Next question will uh, give our student from the visual effects, uh, um, Miro. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad you talked about the philosophy of all this. Uh, that, you know, what it is to be uh, human and uh, how machines are not able to really experience that. Uh, do you ever get like mm, some kind of existential crisis from this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really when scary. I get this, and uh, yeah, I a lot of sci fi novels really talk about this the whole thinking machines. So, um, I'm curious uh, how you view this. Uh, be careful with the word thinking machines. Machines do not think, they just simulate thinking, but that's not a, 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 a smart thing. Um, no, I'm not. Um, I, uh, I think, and I'm not, you know, I'm not like, a, I don't want to say now the world uh, is only developing at its best, but whenever I'm sad about that, um, I remember that all of my imaginations are, are coming uh, about AI. Are coming from dystopian Hollywood films, um, Terminator 2, and so forth. Um, and whenever I'm sad, I just click on um, reading Jan Lecun, uh, the French guy who works at Meta, who says how great, a, what great achievements AI might bring in the future, having personalized GPT assistance uh, that will help you so much in learning, in navigating through the world. Um, 
I do not believe, but I mean, that's a belief and that's not a knowledge uh, that um, the machines will, I mean, we are the ones who train them, right? We are the ones still in control. So we have to, we humans can decide if we want to train the machines to have the same goals as humanity. Save the planet, for example, um, create a living together in respect and harmony and so on. If we train them, if we do not train the machine that, um, then that might be harder. But um, I, I still do believe very much in what Jan Le Kuhn says, that we are the ones in control and we are deciding that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, please, uh, the next question we'll put uh, mm, uh, our guest uh, from uh, Internet, uh, Philippe. Yes, I do have. Um, hi, Tobias. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Good to see you. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. Yes, uh, and to bring some philosophy and communication science here. Um, and what I think here is reading a book is a way of uh, experiencing uh, telepathy because the, the writer enters in our head and transmits a way of thinking, a way of their sensory experience. You spoke, you spoke, uh, you spoke about smell, etc. So the the authors, the writers, bring us their life into inside our heads. So, for instance, I don't know the Gulag Archipelago book. We cannot send AI to a Gulag to have a relevant book like that. Um, so, I understand that ChatGPT helps a lot on reviewing. Uh, text on technical writing, but my question is how risks we have with AI for creativity in writing? That was clear. Um, yeah, how, what risks would we have in writing? In, in which sense do you mean that? In, in the sense, for instance, um, using too much AI, that AI is copy ideas from other ways of writing. And for our students in general, for script writing classes, how AI could be not only a powerful tool to write some new things, but also if they have some risks for creativity in writing. The biggest risk in using AI in writing is its in inherent mediocrity. Um, it is. I mean, and that's clear if you look at the training data, what is out there uh, in, in the world uh, on, on text for, let's say now, screenplays um, is a vast majority that is like, um, you know, merged uh, into this database. And this is, of course, uh, all of that is very mediocre. Mediocre means that it's the sum of it all, right? And you need to prompt very cleverly not to fall into that trap. So the risk is if you are using AI without your own mind, if you just want to outsource the thinking and the creation process to a machine, only if you are in control, if you human are in control in that creation process, and the machine does, let's say, the production of the text, um, the, the, the creation of the text, but you are the ones, first of all, prompting, secondly, selecting, thirdly, curating, thirdly, putting that together of different outputs. Only then you have a meaningful output. If you don't do that, then you should, I mean, I think, you know, have you ever done you cannot simply not put the output that what GPT puts makes and put that into a into a, an email that you know or into a something that it's simply not good enough. It's simply art. It's artificial. You see, you would it uses words that you would never use because you know uh, you're not. I'm not a native English speaker, so if I use words like affordances. You know, or something. It's it's it. I would not use it, so it's recognizable that it's not written by me. And this is just an example of a word. You know, if if you think that bigger, 
you always need to curate it you always need to change it you always need and so i think that is the big risk also for students to just be lazy and outsource the thinking and i mean if you do that you if you think in in competition and market terms and and and, and so on you will uh, you know you will not be a successful screenwriter or, or anything and if, if you're studying film or, or games or whatever, that's what you want. You want to bring the, the, the you want to bring your games to the people, right? And if you if you do a lazy job, then you will not do that. Okay, thank you. Very uh, very well answered. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson Almeida. Uh, will be next speaker, so it's uh, uh, your time for your question for Mr. Wilson. <laughs> So actually, my question was very similar uh, to Felipe's question because uh, that that is my one of the the the, the things that uh, keeps me up at night or uh, regarding AI is the the lo not losing of creativity but everything looking the same or possibly looking the same. But I think I got the the, the answer. Um, I don't know if uh, a question uh, for for AI systems. I don't know if you. Uh, because since it's it's my area, if you know anything about uh, some AI is being used for game design, or or um, if you if you know anything about it. <laughs> um, honestly, not so much. Uh, I just I sometimes I use, but now I don't know the website anymore. I just I use the world building, like a, like graphics um, on that. But honestly, no, I have to, I don't know about that. Um, I can, but what I can add to yours and Philippe questions one more aspect, and that is, there are formats out there in the film and, and TV world, and maybe also in the in the in the gaming world, where innovation is not wished. So the mediocrity is part of the whole concept. Let's take telenovelas, uh, you know, soap operas, where you are, where the characters should not change. And they must stay the same throughout three years, uh, where the concept, where the location of a castle in England does not need change, because this is what the product, the, the film is made for, the series is made for. So innovation is not wish, wished, and then GPT is actually great. But have you ever seen the dialogues GPT is writing? I mean, it's, it's so awful. There is no subtext in it. There is all the information. It's only like um, it's all it's it's almost like a like a like a you know it, it it's so absurd that you really cannot use that in the first place. So there is a long way to go still. Okay, and, I, and sometimes I, it so. even forgets the 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 characters midway through the dialogue. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure about this subtext, sub but uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's agree for this moment. I think that subtext uh, uh, artificial intelligence can do in some way, uh, even now. Ne next uh, question will put our special guest, Nicoletta Wood. Hi, Tobias. Hi. Nice to, nice to meet you. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I would ask, um, how, uh, how did it all start? How did you, I, I mean, obviously people find out about ChatGPT, but um, how did you come up with the idea to you know do the research and um, and get into it? So uh, there was a guy called Ross Goodman um, who used to be Obama's speechwriter, and then he was sick of politics, and then he developed some stuff, um, uh, some AI stuff back in 2019 or something, uh, and he made a he put a camera on top of his car and went through America, uh, drove through America and made a photo of, I don't know, let's say every five minutes or every two minutes, I don't remember, and then turned this photo into text and this text became a novel called One on the Road, imitating Czech curious, uh, you know, um, on the road. And this made me so curious, how can you turn images into text? Um, and uh, and then I started out and actually my first approach was not text writing, but it was I wanted to create an automatic editing machine because I'm also a film editor. <laughs> and so I wanted to have material like, a, let's say, one hour of material and then make it uh, edit that automatically. 
and I failed gladly uh, because it has way too many layers. Editing has much many more layers than screenwriting because screenwriting only has text as an output, but editing has image analysis, color, color analysis, sound analysis, movement analysis, emotion analysis, blah, 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 blah. That was simply way not achievable like three years ago. And I, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of doable uh, nowadays, but again, more in technical way than in an artistic way, uh, just to make things faster. You know, here we are again with the efficiency um, and not the artistic approach, which sometimes even requires slowness and, uh, you know, not outsourcing of your creativity, but, you know, that. But that's 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 how I started, um, and um, and I think I mean I I'm what I'm focusing very much on. You hear me repeating that is this artistic aspects. Um, there are many people out there who know everything about LLMs and and how much and billions of tokens and the future of the world and so on. What I want to know is what I want to research on is the artistic as opposed even to creative. You know. The artistic um, uh, use of AI in in screen world, in, in the screenwriting and film world. Thank you. And the last question will put our uh, special guest uh, Peter. Hello, hello, and good morning. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a, a, um, another similar similar question to Felipe. Um, and, and Wilson, because um, it's something it's something that that keeps us all busy, uh, especially as creatives. So with with the with what you said about stochastic patterns <coughs> and basically AI being a very advanced form of statistics, um, the more people uh, are going to use AI, are we then sort of doomed to get to like one big gray average because it's statistics and it's feeding into itself all the time so so considering the amount of ai generated content that is now on the internet already outpacing human generated content in some fields are we already headed towards some sort of a, some sort of a dead end for the language models that we have today and in the future, what do you think is needed to overcome overcome that dead end? Is it more specificity? Is it is it in that way going to generate more stuff for humans to do to control the AI, or do we need an actual new technological revolution to overcome the limitations of this one? You are absolutely right with that fear uh, of, of, of mediocrity being the, 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 the what's happening um, because the AI text that, that the text that have been produced with AI are now feeding back into the system. You yeah. see when you use GPT, you can uh, yeah, there is this little a, a little uh, checkbox where you can say use my outputs for future training data. Have you seen that? You yes. should un uncheck that, by the way. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and also because of privacy. I mean, that's another a completely another topic. Privacy, you know, uh, and exactly. we can't go into that now. But uh, yes, and so everything is. I mean, no, it started even before. But you're right. Everything is going into that direction. But it started even before because the training data is focused on western culture um the screenplays are western europe uh, western uh, and and with western i mean even not even our west in terms of uh, europe but uh, uh, america and the american culture is completely different uh, than the european culture we experience that now with 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 guys like trump you know or the the whole de debate on guns uh, have you ever tried to ask the machine uh, to write a, screen, uh, a scene where um, where two people are kissing or even two men are kissing? kissing? Um, yes, that works. But everything beyond kissing, the machine rejects to write. Um, everything that has to do with, with, with sex, for example, is simply not allowed. It's against our policies, you know. What all these policies is, uh, 
Silicon Valley policies opposed to all the 8 billion people on Earth. This does not work like this, and this is, I think, why this will bre break up this monopoly. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, have you asked GPT to write a bank robbery with detailed descriptions of, of how many guns it has? It's very easy. And I mean, I don't know about guns, you know, I've never had one in my hand, but I, 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 I you know, it's, it, come on. And this is not our culture. Uh, the, and, you know, this is not our experience. <coughs> this is not our life. Have you ever tried to ask uh, the machine may, uh, like uh, 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 that your main character is an artist? Guess in which city this city, uh, person is living in. Of course, in Berlin, and she's a graffiti artist, <laughs> you know, because this is the the perception of Hollywood. No, not Hollywood, but of, 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 of this training data, artists live in Berlin and are graffiti artists. Yep. Have you ever made a story that is set in Sao Paulo in Brazil? Uh, guess what, uh, where the, the milieu is, you know, guess what? It's of course, it's a drug gang, you know? This is the perception of these kind of training data. And, uh, and you, you have to prompt very hard uh, to, to get around that. So here you have the mediocrity already in motion. And now imagine if you add fake news to that, because how should AI be able to decide what's fake news, what's not fake news, you know? Mm -hmm. If you add that to it, these companies have a huge problem in, in labeling and classifying their data and, and to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, because what, what I've been seeing in day-to-day -day tools now, things like Copilot, is that those same big companies are integrating it into everything they're using, and it's in their interest to push us to use whatever their systems generate as is. And that's, uh, I, can't, I can't write anything anymore without some pop-up saying, why don't you rewrite this with Copilot? Why don't you rewrite this with something else? Um, and, and probably most people will do this. Um, so it is, it, it is in that sense, in, 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 in my view at, at this time, sort of the snake that eats its own tail. And um, lately I've been thinking back of this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awful film. Um, but it's very, <laughs> it, it's it's very current. Uh, it's called Idiocracy. I don't know if if you've seen it. Try try and see it. It's 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 a, it's a crazy film. But it's also the film that uh, it predicted Crocs to be popular. Um, and there's a story behind it. Look it up. It's it's um, and and it's it scares the shit out of you because the same thing that happened with Crocs can now happen with AI. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, Good. Yes, thank you very much. It's uh, it was a very amazing uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, we will continue in uh, our program with the uh, next speaker. It will be Victor Manuel Navarro, Renesa, <coughs> and uh, I, I will tell something from his. Uh, Bio. Victor Navarro Remezal is a game scholar from uh, Techno Campus University Pompeu uh, Fabra, Barcelona, Spain. He is founding member and the, pres uh, and the president of uh, DIGRA Spain. I don't know this company. Or, uh, 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 and uh, the co president of the history of games conferences. His last book. As an editor in uh, perspectives on the European video game Amsterdam University Press 2021. His research interests include uh, player freedom, uh, Zen inspired games, and uh, slow gaming, uh, regional game studies, and game pre preservation. He has uh, taught animation uh, cinema for years and uh, collaborates as a, a critic of the medium in uh, several uh, radio stations and magazines. Currently he is uh, one of the two uh, principal investigators of the project Ludomythologies, Myths and uh, Ideology and in uh, Cinematography video game. So please try to uh, confirm <laughs> or, or explain and uh, try to uh, tell your presentation. Uh, 
Uh, we don't hear you. Uh, put microphone on, please. Switch microphone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slides well? Yes, very good. Okay, so thank you again, Ludovic, and thank you, Sylvester, who invited me uh, originally. I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> video games and uh, animation. I will try to make it practical, but it's mostly uh, an invitation to rethink video games as um, interactive animation, not to, uh, not to ignore the importance of mechanics or storytelling or any other part of video games but I want to introduce the importance of animation in uh, video games. I have to say that I will try to make it brief because I have to teach at 12, so I, I have to leave at around 45, um, 50, but I will try to um, be here for your, for your questions. Uh, yes, and about uh, DIGRA, DIGRA Digital Games uh, Research uh, Association is the biggest, currently the biggest association in game studies uh, in the world and I'm the president of the Spanish chapter. So if you need anything about uh, game studies, you want to look for a nice conference, you want to look for uh, references in game uh, research, I think DIGRA is the place to go. And I'm not saying it just because I'm the president of the Spanish chapter, but I, I, I have had very good experiences with, uh, with them. Um, my specialty, as uh, you have said, Ludovic, is um, game research. I mostly focus on video games because I work in an institution that is uh, dedicated to video games. I, I teach in games and media, but before I joined my current institution, I used to teach uh, animation for many years. I had a full course on uh, animation, not as a technical thing, but as a history and film theory of animation as uh, cinema. So. I, it's not my main uh, line of research, but I've been thinking, I've been reading, I've been teaching animation for a long time, and uh, it made me realize that um, video games have animation, as we all know, and uh, your students there are probably very familiar with uh, using animation for video games and designing video games, thinking about the animation. But uh, the, my, my, my experience with animation made me realize that we need to think not that video games have animation, but that video games are animation. And this is a very, might seem like a very um, small uh, difference, like splitting hairs to look for a, one of these uh, discussions that we fear is love. But I think this is an important distinction. Video games do have animation. Um, animators work in video games. We need to include animation. But video games are animation because they are an animatic form. And being animatic is way different from being uh, cinematic, from capturing reality with a camera. So I'm going to explore this uh, line of thought, and I'm going to give you some ideas, some, uh, some snippets of lines of uh, venues that you can explore as either uh, analysts, uh, critics, or practitioners to um, work in video games as animation. Uh, again, we all know that video games have animation. Some video games do not, so I, I'm going to say this first. Some video games only have text, and they are perceived as um, non-normative, as an exception. So much so that they have been labeled as text games, and they live in a sort of separate reality. Um, the players of text games are super loyal. It's a very strong niche. But people that enjoy um, text games do not normally share the same space with people that play video games in general. If you go to a video game forum or you go to a video game magazine or a YouTube channel, uh, text games have been, in a way, isolated. So this, this is the, the exception. And in a way, the importance of the visual side of video games uh, has uh, naturalized this distinction between text games and so um, called uh, no normal or regular video games. I'm going to show you uh, several images, and I'm going to ask you which one does not belong to the group. Okay, uh, text games are a different thing. They're going to be different, put uh, separate. But let's look at this and consider which one does not look like a video game to, uh, let's say, 
a gamer audience or a general audience. Normally, we will identify uh, something like the Ninja Turtles games as a video game because it has pixel art, the caricature uh, um, aesthetic of the one in the top uh, right corner uh, looks like a very traditional video game and the hyper-realism of something like Death Stranding is very video gamey, so to speak. But live action, having live um, actors in front of a live performers in front of a camera and capturing that image is not the way to go normally in video games. I do enjoy video games with live action. This is not a critique of live action. I'm just saying that normally these are very exceptional. Uh, quantity wise and let's say perception wise, if you go to the top seller or most celebrated video games every year, maybe you will get one with live action and the others will be um, either 2D or 3D. So, <clears throat> unlike cinema, video games are mostly animatic. They are made with animation. Uh, in cinema, we still have to defend that video game, uh, sorry, that animation is not a genre, it's a form, it's a technique, it's a collection of techniques, it's a medium or a supra medium. But in video games, live action is the exception. So it's the uh, contrary. We have the contrary situation. In video games, live action has been dismissed, uh, frowned upon. People do, uh, historically, people have ignored live action. And when there's live action, it tends to be low quality or uh, FMV video games, as they are normally called, as seen as a lower form of video games. So, video games are animatic, they do have animation, and I want to include this uh, nature, this uh, animatic nature, as one of the pillars of video games. If you go to theoretical books like this very, uh, very good book by my colleague Sobik uh, Mukherjee, the president of Digra India, if you need to know about the research uh, of games in India, Digra India is a place to go. You will see that video games, uh, according to uh, Sobik, who is a specialist in, in literature, video games are ludic, meaning that they have rules of games. They are games, they are meant to be played, and they are uh, rule sets. They are narrative, they can't tell stories. They do not tell stories all the time, but they can't tell stories, and they normally do uh, nowadays. Uh, video games with uh, storytelling are very popular. And video games are machinic, meaning that they are technological, that they are run by, a, by a, a complex machine, and that they need to, or they exploit the operations of the machines. They exploit the um, capacity of the machine to run procedures. So video games are ludic, narrative, and machinic, and there's a balance in that. Uh, all the three, um, let's say, pillars are important. But I'm adding here animatic. And we normally only discuss animation when video games really look like the kind of animation that we can recognize. When they look like traditional cartoons, when they look like uh, Ghibli uh, movies, when they look like anime, then we think of animation. But video games are normally animated all the time. So something like Cuphead was celebrated as a, an animatic uh, video game. But all, all video games are animatic. And this has a, let's say, a philosophical, a conceptual side, and a practical side. I'm not the first one to defend uh, video games are animatic or, a, a, or as animated texts. This chapter in the Animation Studies Reader, for example, by Chris Palan, defends it. Fundamentally, all video games are animated texts. However, the way that, I'm sorry for the karaoke, sorry for reading it out, but I, I do agree with this sentence. The way that interactivity serves as the key identifying marker on the video game results in the always animated nature of video games being frequently ignored. Uh, the only people to not ignore <coughs> uh, the, the animation and the animatic side of video games are <coughs> animators themselves. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I, I heard something from coming from, from the room. Okay, yeah, uh, I will continue. The only people uh, thinking about animation regularly in video games are animators, and there's a lot of theory, and I'm sure many in the room will be familiar with this uh, book and with these uh, fundamentals of video game animation, fluidity, field, readability, context, elegance, are ways to design animation and to animate things in video games in a way that feels satisfactory for the player. So animators do think about animation. This is obvious. This is, um, let's say, a platitude. 
and there are, for example, YouTube channels focusing only on the animation of video games. My proposal here is that even those who do not think about animation all the time, even those that are not animators, uh, say game designers, uh, narrative designers, game writers, um, game directors, producers, anyone working in video games should think of video games as an animatic form. And I'm using the word animatic in a very, let's say, philosophical, conceptual way to mean not something that is made with animation, but something that creates the illusion of life. Something that is giving, in a way, life to elements through movement. Animation is not about the particular drawing or the particular uh, element, 3D element, but about the way we conceptualize movement and the way we create the illusion of life, as Disney said uh, from the beginning, uh, with a very particular movement. So animating something is creating the illusion of life through different, uh, different techniques. And an animatic apparatus, as Deborah Levitt says here, is a way of framing reality and framing thought through animation. So in a way, if we see video games as um, being about the illusion of life and video games being about, let's say, uh, the uh, hypnosis, uh, hypnotizing, uh, hypnosis, hypnotizing people with animation, we will slightly change the way we approach video game design and video game, um, let's say, video game thinking. So I'm going to give you four perspectives, four main areas that you can exploit as um, game developers, as animators. This is also a defense of the animator in the video game studio. If you are an animator and you want to work in video games, uh, you have to make your case. You have to say that animation is not just something that you add to make video games look beautiful. It's part of the design. So I'm going to give you four, uh, let's say four general areas, four areas that I want to explore in the future and I want other people to explore uh, in the future. Uh, as a teacher here and a researcher, I'm dealing with history of video games. I teach history of video games and the current president of the history of games uh, conference. And my first um, reaction to everything is to think about history. So I'm going to propose uh, here to focus on the history of video games and the family that we will include by thinking about video games as animation. Normally, when we talk about um, video games and the history of video games, we tend to think, we tend to jump to um, computers, the history of computers, of computations, uh, of uh, engineering, and we see the history of video games as something deriving from technology. Video games come from many sources. Video games have um, many ancestors, from uh, computers to analog games, board games, literature as well, um, the entertainment options of the Penny Arcade. Uh, pinball was a key uh, element in establishing the uh, video game industry. And I want to also add optical toys. I don't know if you're familiar with optical toys, but they are one, to me, they are one central element in, let's say, creating the space that video, game, uh, video games will occupy uh, decades or centuries later. Optical toys were the new medium of their time. This very good uh, book, very, very um, recommendable uh, reading, Playful Visions by ben Meredith Bath, explores and explains optical toys as the uh, new media of the 18th and 19th century, not only as precursors of cinema, but as revolutionary technology that people have to um, people had to learn to use, people had to uh, become familiar with, and there were a lot of debates. There was a lot of uh, play testing, so to speak, a lot of uh, experimenting with. Um, optical toys in the 18th and 19th uh, century. I wrote a, a review of this uh, book, and I think the review is open access, but I will recommend, I will strongly recommend reading, reading the book. Um, optical toys are part of what the, uh, for me, the main expert in the early cinema, Tom Gunning, called the um, player mode of attraction. And when I discovered this idea, 
it made me reconceptualize everything I knew about early cinema and video games. Uh, Tom Gunning, following Dula and Patrol and other authors, writes about a difference between a player mode of attraction where the relationship with images is based on interaction and touch and the viewer mode of attraction that is closer to theater, which will become the foundation of cinema. Cinema as we know it today is based on the viewer mode of attraction, whereas video games are based on the player mode of attraction. But the player mode of attraction uh, existed before video games and before cinema. We have been playing with moving images for a long, long, long time. Um, for example, I lived in Kyoto last year for three months and I visited this uh, very nice museum, Toy Film Museum, where everything was crank-based. Uh, there was a lot of toys where, especially children, could manipulate a crank and activate an image. And it was sold as a toy in the 20s, 30s, before the um, Second World War. Toy film cameras were very, very popular among children. And this made me think of this very nice console, the Playdate. Have you have you played with Playdate? Have you tried it? Uh, anyone? I mean, we, we can talk about this later, but if you don't have a Playdate, it's, uh, there's a lot of creativity happening in the Playdate space. I, I love it. And the control element, the main input element, is a crank, very similar to these cameras. So what Playdate did was going back to the origins of the player mode of, att of attraction. By thinking of history in a different way, I think they found a different way of interacting with images, a way that feels new and at the same time is older than video games and cinema. We can connect, for example, uh, virtual reality to the stereoscope viewers of the 19th century. The, let's say the genealogy is very straight. You have these machines, these, these wooden pieces in the 19th centuries where you looked at images and they became 3D, stereoscopic, in the 19th century. And this was a huge, huge uh, boom. People fell all over it uh, in the 19th century. It was super popular. Then uh, there was an economic crisis. They fell out of fashion. But nowadays we have uh, virtual reality as a direct continuator of the way the images were thought, conceptualized, and sold through uh, stereo stereoscopic uh, visors. And if we think about the history of video games as the history of the interactive images, we, we realize that video games have continually incorporated new ways of dealing with images. It's not a way, it's not a matter of um, technical efficiency. It's not a matter of getting more and more powerful in the machine, in the technology. It's a matter of expanding what players can see. If we think, for example, of the birth of sprites in the 70s in Atari, we will see that it's not just a jump in quality. It's a jump, a jump in concept. With sprites, we saw the advent of iconicity. And you took a look at the Japanese video games that took over the world, that changed the, re the relationship between, um, let's say, regional um, industries. And Japan conquered the world. Video games were made in America in the beginning. And then Japan came in and conquered the world in part, I would say, because Japanese video games were super iconic. Uh, Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and uh, Donkey Kong, they took after manga, anime. They were very visual, uh, very... Um, conscious about color, very conscious about animation, about characters, and they created something that was visually appealing all over the world. So it's a history of moving images, of dealing with images, and we can expand the family to moving, uh, moving toys. And I will say that some interactive things are not video games, but video toys. And I encourage you to create video toys, to try and create uh, video toys. For example, the Tamagotchi is not a game console, it's not a video game, but it's interactive and it's digital. And it's based on animation, iconicity. This is before emoji, but I, I think we can all agree that the origins of emoji are in this kind of images. And the Tamagotchi is a close relative of video games. 
perhaps not a full video game, it would be weird to call it a video game, but it's a video toy. And as game designers, I think you can be very creative and very successful if you explore this idea of video toys, of removing, let's say, the winning conditions, the, 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 the challenge of video games, and just focusing on animatic interactive images. For example, these toys like the e-ship that was super popular in the 90s. Uh, there's a, an artist called Natalie Lowhead who has a couple of um, blog entries on uh, video or virtual toys. And I find it very exciting. Uh, from a creative perspective, I recommend reading this and I think you will be uh, excited to create new things. Um, these uh, screensavers were super popular in the 90s and they, in a way, they taught people how to read digital images. Our contemporary relationship with digital images come from what we experimented and what we learned in the 90s. Screensavers, uh, desktop toys, have paved the way for things like the interactive animation of um, Mario uh, von Kickenbach and uh, Michael or Michael uh, Frey, who uh, together have created games like Plug and Play or Kids. This is not a video game, this is an interactive animation, but it's sold in video games market and it's super entertaining. It's very fun, it's super appealing, and it's just playing with images. It's like a a combination of interactive short film with um, interactive animatic, uh, animatic uh, animated toy, and I will um, strongly recommend playing it if you want to be um, digital artists. This is the kind of thing that you can do when you liberate yourselves from the necessity, from the obligation of creating a game with rules and with, let's say, traditional systems. You can experiment with things like this, uh, the kind of things that playables um, publish, like, for example, uh, this game or video toy or animatic toy or whatever by Japanese animator Atsushi Wada. I love Atsushi Wada and this uh, is just a toy. It, it has no winning, no losing. It's a very, very uh, exciting thing if you want to experiment with interactive animation. So this is the main element, but I want to also make you think about industry, how video games are part of what we call the media mix, uh, I, I encourage you to read this book, Animes Media Mix. In Japan, the media mix, animation, comics, uh, live action is always prepared together from a commercial point of view. And video games are becoming a central part of this. And you can find that <clears throat> animation studios participate in video games, creating uh, cutscenes, for example. Studio 4 Degrees um, have created a lot of animations for uh, video games. You can find character designers coming from manga and jumping to video games. There's a lot of cross-pollination. You find uh, anima uh, animated movies created with uh, video game engines. For example, Away, this movie was created by a single creator, Gins uh, Zivalovis, one person creating a, a movie, a full movie, with the aesthetic of video games, with a single computer and with just Maya. So there's a lot of connections between uh, animation, uh, comic books, manga, anime, uh, video games, and you can exploit this industry, you can be a part of that without necessarily being just focusing on video games. Perhaps you want to be an animator, a character designer, and you can find clients all over the map, all over the spectrum, not just in video games. Uh, for example, a lot of video games are sold with the anime label because they look like traditional uh, animation. I want to also question the matter of realism and remind you that realism, the pursuit of realism, which seems to be like the main uh, battle of AAA games, of blockbuster games, realism or photorealism is just but uh, one aesthetic, just one aesthetic uh, in video games. We can also talk about caricaturism, cartoonism, if you may, and abstractionism, abstract uh, video games from a visual point of view. Something like this is not photorealistic. Zelda Wind Waker is not photorealistic. Photorealism, for many people, is sold as the future of video game visuals. Photorealism has been a thing since the 90s, when we capture, when video games capture uh, live actors and digitalize, digitize these images. But I think capturing reality 
need the thoughts of an animator. It's not only a matter of capturing reality and reproducing reality, it needs animators. And animators can do things um, more important than just shrinking the balls of a horse in something like Red Dead Redemption. Uh, you can create living creatures, so to speak. You can create things like this robot, which is super animatic. This is very cute, very appealing, and it's created on the principles of animation, not just on trying to imitate reality. So I would say, I don't want to explain all the theory, we can discuss this later, but I will say that don't, uh, I would recommend not being linked, tied, bound by photorealism. You can explore other aesthetics, you can explore other type of images. Photorealism is one, perhaps you want to work there, but even photorealism needs animators. But caricaturism, abstractionism, other types of animation are part of video games and have been part of video games since the beginning. And I want to remind that in animation, the artifice, the, the trick is part of the appeal. People are aware of the, of the technique, but the technique reinforces the sense of reality. In a lot of uh, video games, movies, you know that that was animated by a team of people, but this illusion is created not by hiding the technique, but by celebrating the technique. So don't be afraid of the technique, don't be afraid of showing your cards when you um, prepare something in video games. And lastly, I want to finish with the uh, space that players occupy in uh, video games when we think of video games as animation. Players are, in a way, and this is not my idea, this is something that uh, Russ uh, Greenberg defended, when players interact with a video game, players become animators. It is the role of the designer to allow the player to become an animator in a way, because we are going to take control of an image. We are going to take control of the image. We are going to move the image around, and we are look for we are going to look for chains of actions and reactions. And this is a way of giving a stronger sense of immersion to players. So we are animating characters, and we are having a complex relationship with the character. Because, for example, some animations only happen when you don't control the character, like uh, here with Sonic. We take control of the character, we move it, but the character moves when we don't give any order. And this gives, let's say, a stronger personality, a stronger sense of avatarness. The avatar is presented in a stronger fashion. So you can exploit animation to, let's say, make the relationship between the player and the uh, character stronger, more intense, and more appealing. Also, we can think, uh, we can also think uh, about humor. Humor normally comes from timing, um, from a very precise movement in traditional animation. But in video games, we can amplify uh, movement, we can exaggerate, and we can give players a set of react uh, reactions, a set of uh, relationships and reactions that are going to be interesting in themselves. For example, when I jump and I get a funny animation, I forget about the reason I jump and I focus on the uh, appeal of this animation, of this uh, jump or this dance or this whatever. Controlling something gives us the possibility of experimenting with actions and reactions and funny animations, humor um, in animation is a reward for players in itself. Uh, le uh, let's remind that when we play, we play as the player and we play as the character. So we can create situations where we laugh at ourselves. We do something and we, as players, we laugh at what we happen on the screen to us. So this duality is something that you don't get in traditional animation. And it's very, very rewarding. If you exploit this, you are going to get very happy players. I can assure that. For example, the uh, first slide, the opening slide, had this uh, dancing and singing pose. This is from a, a, a game called Watam. And Watam is basically a playground when you take control of different characters, you make them interact, and you get funny interactions. For example, when I control the toilet, the living toilet, I can take a poo and I can flush it down myself. I am not the toilet, but I am the toilet. I can take control of the poo, and this chain of reactions is a reward in itself for the player. So I, 
I encourage you to think about things like that and to uh, give importance to animation in video games. Video games are, again, games. We have to give players things to do and things to play with. But it's also um, the, the medium is also a way of playing with images. We are players acting as animators. We know that the animation is not natural. It's artificial. It was created by someone. We can tell stories with animation. We can exploit this idea of the visual toys, and we can combine it. Think about everything you put in a video game as a visual toy that the player can play with for a, uh, a fragment of time, for a moment in the um, long run of the video game. And this is going to my, my presentation. This is part of a longer chapter. If any of you want to read it, it will be out this year, I think. And when it's out, I can send you the, the, the scans of the book, the PDF of the book, if you want to know more, or you can ask me any question now uh, if you have any, any doubt. Thank you for listening, and um, let's play animatic. Let's think, let's think animatic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to just ask uh, how many minutes we have uh, more uh, if you have to teach. Uh, uh, yeah, I can I can do ten minutes. Ten, ten minutes. Okay. okay. Ten so minutes. Ten, yeah. Ten, ten sorry, minutes I, 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 I was, not, was not counting on the delay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, so um, I I think that I like very much your thought about uh, about humor in uh, game design. It's excellent idea. Uh, you uh, uh, talked also uh, about uh, um, uh, uh, new techniques or new technologies, and, and uh, uh, we are on the ground of uh, film faculty, so there is also the question of uh, fusion among film and uh, game design. And uh, uh, mm. if you mentioned uh, realism, so my first question is, uh, you, you don't like realism? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> from your point of view, uh, you are a um, character designer and uh, animator. So, uh, what, uh, uh, what, how can you see the future of uh, realism in the uh, film industry, of, of game, game design, exactly? The future of what, sorry? Uh, the future of uh, film industry, in game industry, as, as, mm. as fusion, and, and uh, how, how you see this genre? Okay, yeah, yeah I think uh, if you want to find a middle ground, if you want to find a connection, animation is the way to go. Um, I have friends working in the animation industry, and they are collaborating with people from the video game industry. People are jumping from one industry to another. So you can either be a narrative designer, just thinking about stories, and then you can, stories and mechanics, and you can work in both. Or you can be a, let's say, animation designer, not just an animator, but an, an anima animation uh, designer. And I think uh, video games and uh, cinema have very different demands. But the demand for animation in animation cinema and uh, in, in video games is very, very uh, similar. Uh, I have talked about this with people working in animation, and they told me that the production pipeline of video games and animation cinema is closer than the production pipeline of video games and live action or of animation cinema and uh, live action. So I think. Uh, in animation, video games and cinema are going to become more connected, and it's a good thing to know more about animation, even if you are not uh, an, animate, an animator yourself. It's a good thing to prepare uh, to know more about animation, because it's a, it's a, 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 industry-wise and, and conceptually, they are going to get uh, more connected. OK, uh, thank you for your answer. Next uh, question will put uh, our uh, student uh, Mr. Froni. Hello. Uh, so my question is, how do you add personality to a character through simple animation to better sell the emotion? So shown as a really simple and stylized animation, so I want to know how do you uh, add 
Sorry, Sorry the, the, the connection is breaking uh, a bit. So how do you approach uh, characters with simple animation? Or can you repeat it? Sorry. Uh, how, how do you add personality to your character mm. through simple animation like you show them? To sell yeah, the that's, better? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, one of the three principles, if you um, want to know more about animation, I recommend reading the 12 principles of animation that were set um, uh, by Disney animators in the book, The Illusion of Life. Everyone in the, the animation industry uses these principles. And there's one principle called appeal. And appeal comes from exaggeration, abstraction. So even if you are trying to use a photorealistic style, I think um, thinking about appeal is super important. And you can give appeal to a very simple shape like Kirby. For me, Kirby will be like the Kirby the, uh, from uh, Hoshinokabi from Kirby's Dreamland will be the, the best example of giving appeal to something that is very basic. Kirby is just a circle with a face, and the, the animation, the keyframes of Kirby are very identifiable. Kirby falling, Kirby jumping, Kirby, uh, Kirby flying, but it's very appealing because you can, you can see the expression in every uh, keyframe. You can identify the characters, the colors are very uh, recognizable, the silhouette is very recognizable. So I will um, answer to your question, just think about appeal. Focus on the rules of appeal. Abstraction, simplicity, appeal. You can give appeal to a pixel character, a very small pixel character, or a very detailed 3D uh, character. But you have to focus on what makes a character appealing. A silhouette, uh, colors, expression, gestures, these are the kind of things that people are going to remember. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Rafaeva uh, will put a question. games that don't actually have animation in them can be successful because like most visual novels that I played for example were quite enjoyable but they didn't really have any animation. Uh, yeah another very good question I have friends working in uh, visual novels and I will say that visual novels are almost uh, let's say on the brink of animation for example uh, Steins Gate, they made a remake with animation coming from the TV series. And uh, even when you just have, let's say, static images, you have the expressions changing, you have a bit of, uh, you, you change the, the setting, the space. So it's like a comic book, but you can, you can use what you learn about animation to create a better visual novel. But let's remember that the same way that text games were separated from video games, visual novels, I love them. They are very popular, but they are seen as a niche. So I would say you can apply the principles of animation to visual novels, but you have to know the niche. You have to know your audience. You have to know what makes uh, visual novels interesting for the uh, audience in that niche, for the people in that niche. And uh, I will not obsess with giving visual novels more than what they do. Uh, I can give you the case of a game called Murder on the Marine Express. It's a game made by uh, people in Spain, but it was, it was created using the rules of Japanese visual novels. So they tried to imitate the style of uh, Japanese visual novels, and they gave very limited animation or very limited uh, drawings or frames to every character because they knew that people in uh, the uh, field of visual novels they like static, uh, let's say, static uh, portraits, static images. So you can apply the things you learn about animation, but I will not obsess with giving visual novel animations. They are static games, they move very little, and it's, um, there are a lot of experiments with drawings and, and, and animation and live action in visual novel, but uh, let's say a, 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 and a, standard, a standard visual novel is um, static, and it's good that they are static. So just know your audience and know what they want. Okay, thank you. 
So uh, I think that uh, we have uh, enjoyed your time for presentation. Thank you very much uh, for, Thank you. Uh, for your uh, 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 nice interpretation of uh, philosophy that uh, I'm not sure that it is also my philosophy because uh, as, as I said that uh, I, I'm a fan of, uh, uh, of uh, realism. Uh, in uh, in our school, and uh, I think that uh, mm, uh, the science of uh, 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 realism in uh, in uh, mm, game design uh, will be in future very uh, important and main uh, stream mm. in uh, developing of game because uh, the future of uh, game design and film is connected to new technologies, to uh, Unreal Engine, and all these things that. Uh, yeah. very realistic. <laughs> I do agree. I do agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much. So yeah. now we'll continue with uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson Rodriguez de Almeida. I will tell something from his uh, bio. With a, a degree in the digital animation from Universitat de Lusofona, Wilson Almeida began his career as a 3D artist in a cross media <laughs> project. Uh, Maurinho uh, and uh, Special Ones. In uh, 2012, he uh, pivoted to game design as, uh, and, and has uh, worked on PC, uh, console and uh, mobile games while working for several studios such as uh, Bika Studios, uh, Nerd Monkeys and uh, On Top Studios. In uh, 2014, he began coordinating the day development meet uh, event and uh, even since that experience he has been an active member of the Portuguese uh, game development community as an organizer of several other events in collaboration with multiple uh, companies, higher education and research institutions, namely Microsoft, Miniclip, uh, IST, UL and uh, uh, Compa Limond Foundation. He teaches game design at the University of Lusophone. So with introduction, please Wilson, uh, your time for presentation. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Hello everyone, can you hear me and see the presentation clearly? Yes, everything is clear. Okay. So, um, hello everyone, I'm going to talk uh, about um, so game design, um, the, specifically the puzzle process of out of line. Uh, so let me just uh, control the slides here. Uh, so I already got the introduction. So the, the main topics for today, I'll go talk a little bit about the project history. Um, then I'll delve into the, this puzzle design process. Of course, there are things here that um, some are specific to the project, but uh, I will try to take uh, as much as possible things out of the project's context, and that can be applied to, to different projects, not only game design projects, but creative projects in general. And then we'll see the main takeaways from all of this, the, this trip uh, that was creating this game. Uh, but first, let's just watch a small trailer so that you get familiar with the, with the game. Okay, so um, the project uh, began as a school project from Francisco, which was the, the original creator of the game. Um, and while attending, uh, attending, still attending school, they uh, created the, the first prototype. 
then they participated in the PlayStation Talents Portugal uh, event, where they got awarded the best game into 2018. Then shortly after that, they started to work or tried to, to do a partnership with the local game studio Nerd Monkeys uh, to develop a vertical slice. And once they got to develop that vertical slice, then Nerd Monkeys was able to strike a deal with the publisher. And um, shortly after that, I joined them in the end of 2019. Of course, we all know what happened in 2020. So during when we were ramping, ramping up production and during full production, COVID hit. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the impact uh, uh, of that on the, on the game's production and how we dealt with that. Um, and eventually, 2021, in June, the game was released. So just to summarize, Autobline is a 2D hand-drawn puzzle platformer with a lot of animation, just uh, since we were talking a lot about animation on our, on our last, uh, uh, that, uh, last talk. Uh, and it was released for PC, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox. So, the puzzle design process. This is just a puzzle design process. There's not a or the puzzle design process, okay? So this is this was my approach for this specific context. So as you as you see, I entered the project midway. Uh, so there was already a vertical slice. So there's al there was already some gameplay, and then I entered to um, to work from that from that point on. And when I was uh, developing the game, um, I had the need to, to add uh, some sort of process. This is natural to do when we are designing a game. Uh, but uh, some of the things uh, that I learned during this project or that I have learned in past project and applied and in this project, I think if they are important to share, specifically, of course, if you want to make games, but not only to, to make games, to some different types of creative projects, and will, I will talk more about that. So the first thing is to define core values, and you'll see this little character. This was the first uh, version of the character, then it evolved. Uh, I will show more uh, about that. But defining the core values before doing that, um, so since you are joining uh, a team that already is producing something, so it's not starting from scratch, it's important, and specifically in this case as a designer, but I, I think this can extend to, to uh, the other areas as well. If it's a small team, it's good to know what was done before and why those decisions were made, uh, so that you get that information and know, okay, what was the, the history of the project, in a sense. Um, but as a designer, a lot of the, the, the things that you have to do pertains to documentation sometimes. so. If there's any documentation around, uh, you must read everything, play everything there is to play, uh, like prototypes, the vertical slice in this case, uh, and of course, talk a lot with the original creators so that you have the clear understanding of the vision of the game. Okay, Because at the end of the day, you are there in the design position to structure the vision and not to change the original vision. Otherwise, you are making a different game. Uh, so in this case, there was some documentation to, to, to read, but not much, because Francisco is an artist, so he mainly thinks and communicates through visual, uh, through a visual medium, so there was a lot of art, it was uh, very scattered, um, so I had to, to, to talk with him and try to pick all of these ideas from his head into uh, some documentation that the team could, uh, could all uh, um, participate and to help with discussions and planning the whole game. So that was the, the main thing, getting stuff out of Francisco's head uh, into a document that everyone could, uh, could work with. Uh, and again, it's important to emphasize this idea of, okay, not, you are not there, uh, you, you don't enter the game, uh, the, the team, the production team as a game designer to break everything. You enter there to add to it and contribute to it. To it. So it was very important to keep the, the vision um, intact because it was that vision that gave us the funding and gave us uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to be creating this game. Uh, so out of this defining core values, there are two things that come out. Um, in this case, it came out in, a, in, a, in this type of documentation. I have to uh, say, I'm sorry, I apologize for, for having some of these images blurred, 
but um, it's what I can share from the project. Uh, although it's it's uh, it's been uh, three years now, but uh, still uh, this is the the to the extent to what I can share. But you can more or less see uh, how the document uh, uh, is uh, organized. But the idea, the main takeaway here is okay. I need to create something to uh, allow the team to uh, um, to work together and see the whole game in front of us. So the idea of this overview is to have the holistic vision of the game. Um, to have the general layout from from start to finish, um, and writing in writing that you can see on the uh, bottom part of the of the um, of the document are the story bits, uh, how the chapters are divided by zones, um, and for each zone there's a list of mechanics and elements that are within those zones. So when a certain character comes into play or when a certain mechanic comes into play. That's all written up in this document. And this, before the before COVID, we had this on the office in a wall, so everyone could um, could uh, uh, look, could uh, write on on the document. Um, and this was very helpful for the discussions uh, around the, the the where things would happen, the story for the whole team to to be part of it. And also, the, a second thing that came out of this document is, uh, of course, the puzzle design values. And in this case, this, these uh, short topics are the guidelines for the puzzle creation. So to have a direction, uh, to know what constitutes a good puzzle for this game or what constitutes a bad puzzle for this game. Uh, and to help everyone understand what the puzzle should be doing and help analyzing if we are uh, meeting these standards or if we are straying away from this path. Then we go to the second step, which is to create a framework. And framework uh, in this sense is this uh, like the box of Legos. So there's pieces uh, um, that you can take out of this box and create something with those pieces. Um, in this case, um, the out of line framework would be, OK, I can uh, take that document that I just shown you and then see, OK, I have this uh, zone, specific zone of the game that has these specific elements that I can use. So I cannot use the other elements from the other zones. So I will constrain with uh, to, to these pieces. And as an example, like it doesn't matter here the name of the zone, but for this specific zone, I had this mechanics to work with and these elements to work with. So I know that my framework will be around this uh, uh, number of elements and I don't have to uh, uh, think about the other ones and I only have to design uh, using those guidelines that I've shown you, design with these elements puzzles uh, to, to and create gameplay with these elements. Uh, so the idea of this, uh, uh, why do this is to, of course, provide a little uh, more certainty to the to the chaos that is designing a game. Uh, constraints is always good um, so that we can have a more manageable uh, work uh, or design work within uh, uh, constraint elements so that we don't have everything at possible at all uh, at all times because that's that's hard to, to manage um, and forces to focus and to be more focused on the on the work we are doing when designing the puzzles. Uh, and uh, some a sub product of this is by knowing and understanding these Lego pieces uh, really well, or these elements, you get to understand the possibility space. So what does this mean, the possibility space? In mathematics, the possibility space is like the the whole, uh, all the answers that are possible to a given problem. Okay, so in the sense you understand so well the pieces that you are using that uh, you know how in theory, all the possibilities that you can create with them. So we move on to the mechanics exploration. And in this part, um, we get to go inside the editor. In this case, we were using Unity, but this could be Unreal. Uh, or if you are trying to apply this to a, a different type of project, this could be uh, Maya or Blender or whatever you are using uh, inside a, a bigger project. Um, but here, the objective is to, OK, try to materialize uh, some ideas uh, uh, using the previous elements, but uh, in a way that you are 
just exploring what is possible to do with them. So in a way, it's acting out that idea of the possibility space. Okay. So uh, here it's just a, a complete uh, um, expo explorative uh, exercise. Uh, so some of this stuff doesn't make too much sense. I'm just exploring elements and grouping them with, uh, with each other because at this stage I'm just taking the elements that uh, I picked to, to, to create puzzles and I'm just, uh, if they are new to me, I'm just exploring them without uh, judging too, too hard uh, myself what I'm doing. So uh, the idea is to, at this stage, just have fun with the functionality that you are given inside the editor. Uh, so you're not trying to create uh, any meaningful puzzles yet. You are just uh, trying to uh, explore as much as you can without editing yourself, your work. You're just, just creating stuff, okay? Uh, trying new combinations, pushing the limits of the tool. But at this stage, you are not yet designing a puzzle. You are just seeing what's possible with this new functionality that you are given. And of course, uh, as you go down, uh, um, as you go down the, the, the development of the project, some of these mechanics, are, you are already familiar with them, so you don't need to, to do this uh, step, of course. This is just for new mechanics that you are exploring when they come to you. Because uh, as we went uh, through the development cycle, sometimes I had new mechanics to, to use. But one of the things um, that happened during this, uh, during this uh, uh, exploration was a, a sudden realization that, okay, we had a severe limitation uh, on some of the tools that we were using. And that poses a big problem because we are trying to uh, uh, produce content at a specific uh, pace. And when the tools cannot, uh, um, cannot go uh, as fast as you wish, um, this be becomes a problem. So, um, but in a sense, uh, and this is something that you can take away for, for uh, other types of creative projects, is the iteration cycle needs to be fast. So being the, 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 this one of the, my main uh, concerns when designing a game is to look for where can I optimize the iteration cycle. Something had to be done. We couldn't hire more programmers because we only had one programmer and by, or I, as I say here, we have a, one programmer and a half, me being the, the, the half part, I, although I'm not a, a, a formal programmer, but I can manage some stuff, but not to create the tool sets. Um, so to, it was not the fault of our programmer because he was just only one guy. The team was really small. So, okay, uh, since we cannot hire at more people at this point, and this is a problem, we had to, to compromise, of course. Uh, so. Um, the, 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 the goal here was, okay, I need to be able to create puzzles as fast as I can, uh, but using the, the, this tool set that is not updating uh, or is, it's not uh, uh, as fast as I would like. So just to give you an idea of what that means, uh, when you have an idea and you want to see it on screen, this should be a, a fast, um, uh, so something that I can implement as fast as possible in a, in a game environment. Uh, and you do tools, you create tools for this to be uh, possible, at least to give you a, a general idea of how things will be. Uh, but the tools will very hard to, 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 to do this process because at, at some point when I was going for a, a specific point of complexity, past that point, the tools, uh, were not very easy to, to, to manage. So uh, I had to find time. And for this, um, I decided to, I always do this in a way in every game project, but in this case, I had to consciously separate very well the creative puzzle design work from the puzzle implementation work. So this led to the next step, which is the sketch puzzles and interactions. So I really love, uh, whiteboards and, uh, and paper. Uh, so you will see a bunch of white, whiteboard scribbles that I, I, I do. When we were still uh, at the office before, before the pandemic, uh, I used to do a lot of playtesting with the, the whiteboard and the sticky notes 
to simulate uh, characters or uh, elements from the puzzles and have uh, people play the, the prototypes to, to just to, to throw ideas around and see how, how they were um, faring. And uh, so you will see a lot of scribbles like this. Um, so the solution, again, was to, as I was saying, use paper and whiteboard to do all the sketching that I needed. Um, of course, it's not that uncommon for people in game creation to use this type of concept of, of uh, puzzles or design ideas in paper or, or whiteboard. Um, but I will do this, uh, a, like, I will say, it, in, like, for example, four hours in the morning for this, and then on the afternoon, I will be doing uh, the implementation part that I will get to in a minute, but I will do this in bulk. So I'll be creating puzzles, designing puzzles uh, in, uh, in this paper format that I will explain uh, how specifically, but I was quicker this way. Uh, but it's important to highlight that for this to be possible, of course, I had to do the previous step of mechanical exploration, exploration because I had to keep designing this in paper, but knowing that it will be possible to implement. So I had to really know the tools inside and out um, before doing this. Uh, here's some more scribbles uh, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, some spots in the, in the game. Some of these ideas, um, I don't remember right now exactly. Some of them might be there, some of them might be scrapped. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that also. But how is the process in this case? So keeping that framework in mind, so all the mechanics and elements for a given zone, I will do sort of storyboards uh, with uh, numbered vignettes. So like one, two, three, four, and I will show you uh, uh, an example next. Um, but this will be, uh, so these numbered vignettes will help me to already uh, see how the puzzle complexity or difficulty could be uh, more or less, depending on the number of, of vignettes that, uh, that will uh, exist. Um, and the idea was to, okay, start small. So creating small interactions with these elements because it was faster, because you can create more variety faster, uh, and it's easy to, to get stuck. It's easy to, since it's easy to get stuck, this is a way to avoid it. So if you try to do a very, uh, um, very complex thing from the, from the young set, you'll be uh, probably at the beginning of the project, you'll be stuck. So start small and, and go from there. Uh, so on the left, you can see some of those uh, numbered vignettes um, that uh, I used to talk. Very simple. At this stage, this was something that was only for me to use. Okay, uh, this this is for me to uh, design and implement. Um, so it could be more abstract like this. Uh, this I already talked to you about. So start small. Don't go for complexity right from the from the get go. Um, and of course, once you get all of these smaller interactions, you can now look at uh, some of them and maybe you can start to connect them, uh, like putting them, uh, reorder them, shuffle them, um, because you can start to get the sense of uh, a more complex puzzle emerging from this. Um, maybe there's a theme that this can tell some story. Uh, when I say story here, of course, uh, in, a, in a sense of presenting them with, through the challenges that are presented to the player. Um, maybe you can remove a mechanic that was already established to see how unbalanced or balanced it becomes. So iterate, iterate, iterate. Now that we have a bunch of drawings, uh, we can go finally from concept to playable. And the idea is to re really just build and test these small interactions. So in the editor again, um, as I was saying, I, I did this in bulk so that I could now uh, stop the creative work and do just implementation uh, since the tool was very was very hard to use because um, the, the worst thing that can happen to, to, a, to a tool when you are designing or, no, or when you are doing any kind of production is when the tool stops your flow, right? So that's the, 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 the issue. Uh, that we were having, and so this was the the the, the way to to go around that. Uh, so 
implementing the bulk of the of the puzzles that I had uh, created, uh, build them inside the ad editor. While building, uh, it's important to don't judge right away uh, because sometimes this little snippet that you are building um, can look maybe boring, uh, isolated, but maybe it's an important step for to combine to create a more uh, uh, balanced puzzle in the end. So at this point, just take the, the paper, the ideas in paper, and then just implement them uh, uh, without thinking, but too much thinking, uh, because you will do that after after the after it's it's built uh, it's built in the editor so once you once you complete the 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 build of the the, the building process of the puzzles now you can start to play test something and here yes here you can cut stuff and judge uh, 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 what you just created uh, because sometimes uh, mechanics are breaking because you are pushing too hard uh, sometimes you miss some, you are missing some programmer magic, or uh, other times it can just be a bad idea because it worked on paper, but it doesn't work on on the on the editor. Uh, so at this point, you just keep the one that work and move on. Okay. Now comes the part where you start to integrate into the level because uh, during the production we had the the whole game playable from start to finish in a, what's called the gray boxing stage. Uh, I, if you recall the, the, the little video I showed you where there was a lot of gray boxes uh, that I was prototyping. So uh, we already had more or less the places where the puzzles will be put together. Of course, this will be uh, uh, rearranged when we were doing this integration. Uh, but during this step, this is where, okay, uh, I can start to think about difficulty progression, uh, the complexity, am I introducing uh, a, um, a very complex puzzle first before or after uh, this, this specific location. Uh, and also this is where uh, art and design will influence each other because sometimes when I was coming to the, to the sections to implement the puzzles, there was already arts uh, in place. Other times I was the first one to Put the, the the puzzles together. So this was very back and forth between me and and Francisco, um, and we were always talking. And it was very natural. Uh, it was very easy to work with this team. The team was amazing. There wasn't ego fighting, uh, which is great. Um, so it was very uh, a very very pleasurable to work on this game. Um, and at this stage, uh, uh, since I am putting uh, things inside the level. Sometimes I had go, I had to go back to steps four and five, so I had to go back and okay, draw more ideas and then implement them uh, in the editor and push them to the level because maybe there's a missing step for a puzzle that becomes clear when you put it inside the the, the level uh, location, and so it's just uh, um, iteration. And this is an example of a. a level section, you see some parts are still in gray box, some parts already have some uh, some more finalized art, uh, and I will come here and will start to uh, mount everything um, and put the puzzles in, in place, as you can see. So how do you do this uh, when you are putting stuff in place? You have to keep uh, be mindful of the complexity of the puzzle, so the number of steps to solve, uh, the number of moving parts the player must keep track, uh, the different mechanics that are being used, because um, in, especially in, in puzzle design, we have to be mindful that uh, in general, and this is something that uh, was already studied, uh, the short-term memory is about, people can, can uh, remember about five or seven things at, at time, and it depends from person to person. Some people can remember more, some people can remember less, uh, and so you can, you, you should be mindful of that when creating puzzle games so you don't bombard people with a lot of information at the same time. So this is something to keep in mind. Also, the size of the puzzle, uh, does it span uh, uh, across several rooms? Uh, can it be contained within the camera, uh, the view, the viewfinder of the, or the, the, the screen the player is seeing? Because if I need to remember a puzzle state from a different location, that needs to be taken into consideration on the complexity of the puzzle. 
Uh, but um, besides complexity, you can group them uh, also by the, the mechanics they are using. Uh, and with these groups, again, you can look for a different way of ordering the complexity of the puzzle. Maybe you want to introduce a specific mechanic first, or you want to introduce this mechanic later. Um, and this helps to, to organize the, the, um, the puzzles. We had a, a, an Excel sheet where we had, that unfortunately I cannot show you, but we have all the, 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 um, the puzzles by uh, type, uh, how they were organized, by complexity, everything, so we can keep track of the progression of the game. Uh, um, so if this is all, all well and good, the, the puzzles are deployed in the, in the level layout that was previously defined, and we can move on to a different section. Of course, when I was, when I was working on, the, on this, uh, I used to work on more than one section at a time. Um, and so it depends on what you, you are doing, but it's a very organic uh, pro, uh, pro, Although this is a very step-by-step -step process, it becomes very organic because you are uh, maybe in step six with a specific zone, but you are in step three with another zone because there's a new mechanic. Um, so you go back and forth between all of these steps. Uh, then play tests, which which was uh, uh, unfortunately the lowest point for us during this production because of the pandemic. This was, I think, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, hit that we took uh, was on the play test because there was no play test opportunities and we had uh, difficult to adapt. To, to this particular uh, uh, task. All of the other uh, uh, tasks we could adapt very well, uh, but this one, you need people. Uh, because this further emphasized for me the, the, the need for you as a game designer to be present during playtests to see how people react, how the players are reacting. Their body language is very important for, for what you are creating. Um, and to get that uh, non-verbal feedback because it will be, uh, especially in a, in a puzzle game, uh, where you really want to know where people are work, uh, looking for, uh, they're, they're like uh, uh, to see what they, the elements they see first, so that you can organize the, the, uh, the puzzles in a better way. But uh, eventually, of course, we end up doing some online play tests. We, we, it, it took some time to, to organize this because you, you couldn't just send a build uh, because it's a game in production, you have to manage the, that uh, uh, policy side of not showing the game before, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was uh, something hard for us to, to manage. We used Parsec and other tools, but uh, um, it wasn't ideal. And also, we had some external companies that do playtesting uh, provided by the publisher, but they were not very, very good. Uh, I would love to show you their reports, but I can't uh, because you will see it. It, it wasn't as good as a playtest as it could be. Um, but some general tips. Uh, so playtest as much as possible. We were, of course, doing this inside and with and with people closer to, to the people in, in, within the team. So like uh, husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends from the, the team members will be uh, our first uh, playtesters uh, because they, they were uh, confined uh, together. Uh, I, I, for me, this is very important. Playtesting physically will be orders for, for for me orders of magnitude better than remote playtesting. This was, I've seen this clearly. Um, of course, you can do. Uh, it depends on the type of playtesting you are uh, you are doing. But for a small team, um, it's it's very it's it's you need this. Uh, and I already talked a little bit about this watching people play to see where they are looking for and you need to be present in the room for, for this or you can ask them for to film their faces but people are not that comfortable doing this sometimes so it's hard okay so some major takeaways and things that you can maybe apply to different projects um, so of course be very adaptable um, because by being adaptable, you can also design your own design process and everyone ends up doing this one way or the other. Uh, maybe they don't write about it, but you, you, you have some 
uh, process that you are using. But if you are conscious about it, maybe you can do something uh, to it. Um, one thing that for me is very important, and I think this is uh, across creative uh, uh, projects, is the, the iteration cycle needs, needs to be as fast as possible as you can do in a good way, in a productive way, not just be fast for the sake of being fast. Uh, but if you are cautious about this iteration cycle, you can look for the bottleneck, uh, what is the bottleneck and how can you fix the bottleneck. In our case, as, I, as I've shown you, it was the tools, um, but there was really no option to change that. And maybe uh, if we did fire another programmer and or maybe if we stopped produ producing the game uh, development further and we dedicated time to the tools, maybe I, I would not be here talking about the game today. So in, at the end of the day, I don't blame anyone, uh, just to be clear on that. I, the game was released. Uh, it was a little bit of a hard time using that, but it, this is just a lesson that you can, uh, and I took from this, and you can take from this, is really treat well your tools, especially your custom tools that you need to, to push content uh, uh, for your project specifically in games, but not only in games. Um, and have fun, because creating a project with, uh, with a close team is always a unique experience, because people are different from, from team to team. And I've been doing this for almost 10 years. I, I really, I always enjoyed the, the working within the teams, uh, meeting different people, uh, uh, breaking bread with them, as you, as you would say. Uh, so, in, at the end of the day, just look at what you're doing. You are creating a cool project. It can be a game, can be a movie, uh, can be an animation, and just have fun. Um, so thank you uh, for for listening to me, and hope this was interesting for you to to hear about. Thank you very much for your presentation, for explanation of process of making uh, a project of game design. Uh, now it is time to have some questions about this process. So first uh, we'll put question with uh, Kuczekova. Okay, hello. I hope you can hear me. <coughs> um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and I was wondering uh, what the question, the, the most thing, the thing I was thinking about the most was um, if you think that, um, you know, we've been talking about the AI, and if you think that the AI could uh, probably come up with these type of puzzles, because they are very complex and um, you know, um, human mind is sometimes very, um, how to say it, um, well, human mind can come up with type, these type of ideas, and do you think the computer could do that? Uh, so if I understand correctly, you're, you're asking if uh, we, AI might uh, not substitute, but create some of these ideas, some of these puzzle ideas, is that it? Yes. Um, well, there are uh, some AIs, uh, AI tools that people use in, uh, in game creation that are used, for example, to uh, go through the levels that you created to see if they are possible to, to be played. Uh, so they, you give some parameters and they play uh, the level and you see, okay, is it possible? Is it hard? Is it... So there's, there's some tools for that, but they are all custom tools. Um, for creating puzzles, the same the same thing uh, uh, is needed. So you need before creating the game, you need someone to take a long time to create the tools for your game. So in a small production like this, it's not uh, uh, very uh, efficient to do it. But um, for example, in a game like Candy Crush, uh, they have some tools to create levels because it makes sense for them because they are already doing like a thousand levels at this point or, or more, I don't know. Uh, and it makes sense for a long standing product like that to, to uh, invest money in creating a tool like, like you are suggesting. So it is possible. Um, 
maybe not for all the games because some games are, are more simpler than others so they have more variables but in this specific case uh, for a small game like uh, like this um, it wouldn't make sense to do a tool like that at least for now maybe in the future it becomes easier to create that tool uh, and it, if that's happened for sure that will be great to have as a companion to, to aid me in creating puzzles Thank you, and Mr. Falco, next question. So, hello. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentation, and um, my question is, uh, which tools uh, did you use when you wanted to share your um, game design with uh, other members uh, of your team? If you had something like an internal uh, Wikipedia or something, uh, so the, the tools we used uh, in the, before before the pandemic, I just use a whiteboard and I just invite people over to 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 come to the whiteboard and play the the, the levels in the whiteboard. Um, when uh, when we went to 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 our homes to, to remote uh, to work remotely or remotely working, um, we uh, well, I play tested. Uh, with my my wife <laughs> because she, she was the one that I, I had uh, uh, available to to test uh, I also of course discussed with uh, with my colleagues but usually what I ended up doing was okay since I separated the work uh, as I as I explained in bulk I could uh, implement in bulk and then I can share that uh, that uh, already playable uh, playable uh, puzzles or Playable interactions inside the editor, and that that was just a, a simple way of uh, of sharing things. So I could just uh, push uh, through GitHub, and they had access to the project, and they could play uh, the the ideas that I was that I was creating. So in the pandemic, that that was the way. So I I had to implement them so they could test them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the game design wasn't written down. Well, it was. At the, those scribbles that you saw, uh, but I, I at that point I had to be uh, I stopped doing more of the documentation and had to do the puzzles because I was the only one on the team, so I was either documenting stuff. So for example, the the, the document overview that I shown you, I could iterate it more on that document to be more uh, uh, to have even more information uh, uh, given to to everyone. But I I had to create the whole puzzles, <laughs> all the puzzles for the game, and use the tool and, and iterate on the tool a little bit and program some stuff. So a lot of hats to wear because it was a small team. So I could not be just doing fancy uh, diagrams for the team to, to, to check out. Uh, but if I had more designers on the team, for sure, uh, I would document because that's what you usually do on, on, a, on a bigger team. OK, thank you a lot. Yes, so last question we'll put uh, our guest uh, Peter from point of view of uh, visual effects artist, maybe about iterations or so. Uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Wilson. Um, a very, very intricate process designing, designing these puzzles. Um, I was very happy to read about how important it is to interact with uh, your playtesters, uh, specifically in the same room, and how important their body language is, um, which reminds me of test screenings for films, um, where it's, 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 it's the same thing. It's not just about the reviews that the people give at the end, it's also those people are typically filmed in cinemas, and then their behavior while watching the movie is being, is being analyzed, and based on that, uh, especially in larger studio films. Uh, there will be changes to the script, reshoots, um, all, all that sort of, all that sort of thing. Um, so that was really interesting to see. Um, I was wondering, just out of my my own interest in more um, story-driven games, have you worked on games where the actual puzzle design was part of the story? So you were involved in in basically designing a story. Um, either around your puzzles or through your puzzles um, and, and, and sort of all designing the entire
flow of the game um, through through your work? Uh, well, it, that's a great question because Out of Line tries to convey all the story through the the, the gameplay, uh, but the narrative here it was back and forth between me and Francisco, uh, and of course the, the rest of the team. Uh, some of the puzzles help convey the story, but not all of them. So the whole production was not uh, like the example like you are asking, but parts of the of the game were designed like that. So some puzzles of the game were very important to uh, explain some parts of the of the story of the game, uh, which at the end it, it's a, a more abstract story, uh, but there are underlying themes, but it's not. Uh, of course, a big inspiration for us will be Limbo and Inside. Mm -hmm. uh, Inside is a game that does that really, really well. Um, but we, not all the puzzles were, were like that. So my 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 answer will be okay. I did some of that in this game, uh, but I never did a game that was all all like that from yeah. the from the get go. Mm. And um, and and a sort of small on, on the side question. Um, following up on the first question about AI uh, being um, capable to design these, I've, I've seen some posts on LinkedIn lately uh, about people showing up, apparently AI uh, designing or building a game based on a single prompt and saying, give me a hundred levels of this where a character does that and that and that. And then obviously you've got a thousand comments saying, you know, game design is dead. Um, we're all going to be replaced, all of that. Um, and I was wondering, um, you, you, you must have read some of those things as well. Have you, have you tried playing one of those games that, that were AI generated? Unfortunately, I haven't yet played those kinds of games. I have read about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't had the time to, to play it. But again, it's, I think it's the, 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 the same. For now, at least, it's the same thing with what we see with movies and Sora. I think it's the same thing. So it's looks limited. Um, of course, the, it can expand and be and be more complex and maybe create more intricate stuff. But again, we we get to the the that topic of the mediocrity. So mm -hmm. it you always need uh, uh, someone to make it tailor made. If you took the AI and then you uh, with your own design. Uh, um, um, uh, so philosophy or whatever you 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 want, you train the AI to create a spe something specific. Then I think that will be great. Uh, otherwise, it will be like fast food. Uh, but people might enjoy that. Uh, uh, like a lot of people might enjoy that type of game, uh, as we were talking about the telenovelas and and, and all of that. So uh, yes, I think. Uh, Maybe a lot of people will be uh, uh, without a job because of it. Um, so that just means that we need to push further uh, and design things that the AI is not is not capable of. I guess. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank and, you. And in 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 section of free questions, so I, I uh, the possibility to put the next question to uh, student of uh, visual effects in the second class. Hello. Hello. Uh, I, I am hearing you, but with some yeah. difficulties. Okay, I, I'm hearing you now. project or are you uh, mostly there on your own uh, well in and in this project I uh, sorry sorry ah, okay. and also uh, do you also uh, usually communicate with your team during uh, this process uh, in which way okay so um, for the, the the last productions that I did, uh, I was the what let's call it the main designer. I would I would even call myself the lead designer, because I always end up uh, uh, creating games that 
uh, I was not the the the, the original uh, creator of the idea, and that's the the most common uh, thing to happen uh, actually. Uh, but I end up being the the designer, but. Um, it's not a single process. I always work with everyone on the team because everyone has ideas. So I, I tend to think myself, of course, I need to come up with solutions, but I tend to, th I, I, I tend to think of myself as a filter that I need to structure all of the cool ideas that are running around the studio. And then I need to present them in a way that makes sense and then create gameplay out of it. Uh, so in the end, I end up collaborating with everyone on the team uh, uh, in the design sense of the of your question um, and uh, you also uh, ask me about how I present this to 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 the team how what tools I use for, for that um, it depends on the team sometimes I use stuff like uh, Wikipedia not Wikipedia but wiki 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 page documentation sometimes I like to put stuff on the wall because the team responds more to that it's, it's just a matter of adapting to to whatever the team uh, uh, uses uh, like the the for me the most favorite thing right now uh, from the last project that I did is to actually do some sort of like a, a PowerPoint presentation or a Google slide presentation uh, and have the team uh, uh, present the design to the whole team and not even do a big document uh, because people don't don't read those so just make cool diagrams people respond very well to that uh, and of course the best form of, of uh, presenting an idea in games is creating a prototype so if you have the time to do it to do it just do it like that so I either create the prototype or I create a visual presentation that people can understand what what is the idea and make them uh, allow them to contribute to that okay, thank you okay so thank you very much mr Wilson Almeida for your time for your presentation uh, we'll continue thank you yes I, I will have unfortunately I apologize because I have to uh, have a class in in, uh, in a moment so I will have to 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 leave you for for today so I hope uh, I hope the, the conference goes as, as, as amazingly as it went yesterday and at least for now it has been very, very uh, interesting to, to meet everyone and to hear you all talk about these cool uh, topics that we've seen so far. So thank yes. you very much. Thank you. So uh, now it's time uh, for our uh, two special guests. First of uh, them will be Nicoleta Wood. Uh, so I, I tried to tell something about her. She will switch her microphone probably. Yes. Uh, Nicoleta is an uh, experienced VFX production coordinator based in London, originally from Preshow. Preshow is a small city in Slovakia. Uh, uh, who uh, thrives in a dynamic realm of visual storytelling. After completing an exchange program in uh, the USA, she moved to London to study film and eventually uh, earned a, a master's in production management from the National Film and Television School. She has a proven track record of uh, bringing completing, uh, uh, com compelling film and uh, TV projects uh, to life all uh, uh, while managing and uh, in the cases uh, of production with a uh, uh, genuine love of uh, uh, spreadsheets. Uh, she, uh, she's had the privilege of working with industry leading studios such as Apple Originals, Netflix and Amazon Studios as well as collaborating with uh, uh, world-class directors like uh, Steve McQueen and uh, Alfonso Cuaron. So it is just introduction. Um, uh, uh, in a minute I prepare your presentation, so try to uh, continue in this introduction. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me well? Yeah. Good. Um, thank you very much again. Um, uh, I mean, there's not much else about me to say. Um, I do quite frankly love what I do um, and I'm very thankful for every experience I've had so far. Um, I, I should mention um, I also recently married a VFX artist who is watching from London. Um, so go VFX uh, in our household. Um, and I think once we have a presentation we can um, crack on. 
um, I guess just to make sure we're going to talk about in economics of VFX. So there will be a couple of spreadsheets involved, but I promise you they're cool. And anyone working in a VFX production will agree with me that it can be very, very creative. Um, yes, or something about video pictures. I will send it again. Uh, uh, again. Or so I can try on my laptop. Yes, so it is the second option. I, I try this first one that uh, you uh, resend it. Um, obviously, I'll have my contact details um, on, so mm -hmm. if um, if, you have the the better. Um, if anyone um, wants to get in touch afterwards, it would be great to chat. Uh, yes, so it is uh, okay. uh, very close. Sorry for the picture. It was the most professional hit. Nice to see you during your explanation. So I try to find the way how to do it. It's not perfect, but it could be. Should I click on or is it present? Or is it going to? Oh, no, it's, it's going it's to overtake. It's too large. Mm, should I close it? Okay, that works. So the economies of the effects. Um, I think um, it's important to start how um, and, and to mention how the scope of VFX has increased massively over the last few decades. Um, it has been developing. I mean, in the early days, it was very, very limited to specific use cases, such as um, changing the changing the background, um, using a green screen. A, adding an alien um, instead, of, um, in, instead of having an actual painted background. Or it was animated, um, it was animating a character. Um, now these days, um, it can sometimes touch majority of shots, from cosmetic fixes to actors, um, de-aging, hundreds of cleanups. Um, and because of that, obviously, the budgets of VFX have increased um, greatly. And I think that's why the economies of VFX is so important these days, because it kind of provides a framework to, for us to make a strategic decisions, but still balancing creative vision and financial realities. Um, so um, let's go through some of the key decisions that um, VFX production has to make. Um, and the first one would be assessing the script for any VFX requirements and then, well, estimating the associated cost with it. And um, this is usually done by VFX producer and VFX um, supervisor. It's really a conversation about resources versus expectations or cost versus benefit equations. Now, almost any given shot can be done in many different ways, but is it worth spending more money on something which can be done for less? And the classic, classic example 
it's 3D as assets, 3D environments versus 2D. So do I need a CG fire or do I go to talk to special effects, shoot the fire against the black screen and just use it as a 2D element? Um, during those sorts of conversations, um, a good relationship between VFX producer and VFX supervisor is so, so crucial. Um, because to make most of the resources, they really need to work um, as a team. Um, and in terms of the budget, well, I think one of the coolest things about being in VFX and working in a VFX department is that you get to be part of the project from very early stages until the last shot has been delivered. It's one of the few departments which is actually there from the very beginning to the very end. And um, um, it's also because how specific the skills in VFX are, it's the only, um, it's the only department which is also responsible for allocating its own budget. And as you can imagine, because of that, it's questioned a lot <laughs> and by a lot of people. So it's very, very important that you're always prepared to justify your costs, um, no matter what. And also what doesn't help is Unlike with other departments, um, studios often won't see what they've been paying for in VFX until after a shoot finishes and we're well in post. Um, so in terms of that, it's also helpful to sometimes think about what upfront costs can reduce my costs down the line. And in my experience, um, production companies can be quite reluctant to spend more time and spend more money setting up screens during shoot. Well, you can justify it by then reducing the need of roto in post and potentially avoiding extra reshoots, which would be much, much more expensive than those couple of hours setting that screen up. Um, now, in terms of um, budget, that's mostly managed by VFX producer. But there are a lot of things VFX coordinators and assistants can do to make most of the resources. And that's where I'm going to talk about spreadsheets. Um, one of my ultimate favorites is LiDAR and Texture Photography Schedule. It's such a useful tool um, to efficiently use sets and cast. Um, many times I go to production designer. Um, I inform him about, my, um, about, uh, about the set I I'd like to scan. And because I go there in advance with a plan in my head, um, there our department is usually able and willing um, to maybe hold the set for me for the couple of extra days after they finish, instead of just dismantling it straight away. Um, the same when you're talking to first AD, um, you can try and cyber scan your actors during the take when they're not needed on a set. And having those scans can save uh, thousands thousands in post. Um, green screen, blue screen, um, it's, um, it's also such a useful dot. And it's a list of, it, it's a list which should inform everyone about specific screens at the specific places. Um, it should eliminate any sort of confusion. And for instance, what it means, it, um, it can allow grips to prepare the screens in advance rather than on a day, which again, adds delays, costs more money. Um, VFX plate summary, um, that's specifically useful for VFX supervisors and for your onset crew. Um, and that's purely, um, can act as a checklist for them to make sure that they capture all the assets that's needed. A lot of times you leave the location and you just can't go back. Um, and I cannot stress enough how important it is to have working database. Whether it's a spreadsheet, file maker, shot grid, unless, uh, it just needs to have the main information about all the shots, status, feedback, version numbers, and you make your life so much easier. My husband could tell you I've spent so many nights updating the database, but it just made my life so much easier um, moving forward. Um, some of the examples of um, green screen um, requirement out there. Um, I tend to mark everything in red, anything which has changed since my last version, and anything that needs to be done by a different department. 
because when it's in red or bold, they just they, they can tell you that they've missed it. Um, or they can try, but well, you refer back to your doc. <laughs> and the same with LiDAR and texture photography. That's more of a live document. I tend to have roughly 10 to 15 versions um, on average. Um, but as you can see, I just tend to mark wherever I want to LiDAR a set or when we have a LiDAR scanner standing by on set or when there are some VFX plate shoots happening. Um, now, one of the most important decisions VFX production has to make, and that's choosing vendors. Um, in terms of the in-house, um, having an in-house team, they can be quite agile when it comes to turnaround times, but you need to be very careful because unlike external vendors who are paid by shot, your in-house team is usually paid, either they have a day rates or you book them out for a certain period of time. So you really want to utilize their time and you don't want them to just sit around. Um, they are very, very helpful at the beginning of post as well, um, specifically for previous attempts. Um, and it's really good to get a firm, agreed direction before you go and you bid with external vendors. Um, and um, some of the other aspect of uh, vendor selection, tax incentives. Um, for instance, when we use Canadian vendors on a UK productions, we get almost 40% of rebate. Um, so again, that, that's something which a lot of VFX producers um, try to use um, to help their budget. It needs to be said that the ease of collaboration can be, um, can be, um, uh, can be a bit more difficult uh, when you're working with a foreign ven vendors, whether it's time zone, language barrier, etc. Um, but it's always worth considering. Um, now, the favorite and the most fun part of every project, which is deadlines and delivery, um, and the massive big crush. Um, always make sure um, that all the VFX crew at the beginning of as as soon as um, as soon as they're on the project. They should um, all have technical specifications because there shouldn't be any sort of confusion when it comes to what color space we're working in or what are delivery formats or I don't know whether all the vendors are on the same page when it comes to file naming conventions. And the last thing you want to do is just do redivily, uh, re delivery, sorry, um, due to incorrect specs because most of the time is just um, unnecessary wasted cost. Um, and something which sounds very obvious, um, but you'll be so surprised <laughs> how, how it's not, and it's clear feedback. Um, it reduces any delays caused by miscommunication. And just to give you an example, I have a rule. I, as a non-artist, never forward any feedback or notes I myself don't understand. Um, and it's just as easy as to go and, and check um, what your supervisor meant. Um, and now, talking about challenges and future trends, it, it's crazy to me listening all those things about AI because I would say five years ago we wouldn't discuss it so, so much and it, it, it hugely affects the effects. Um, well, rendering costs. Um, it, some of the, the like, very, very important part um, and a portion of costs associated with VFX is rendering. And real-time rendering engines like well, Unreal Engine um, can really help significantly reduce the cost and time. It can also help with um, um, doing the feedback more efficiently. Um, um, but one of the greatest examples currently where these technologies have been used is um, I'm not sure how many you've seen Disney's virtual production screens um, on Mandalorian. And it was mind-blowing how instead of green screens in the background, you had these great-looking shots right there um, in a camera. Um, again, there is so much potential for those technologies to bring down post-production costs. However, it's important to also realize that initial investment is huge. There is a lot of long-term planning most likely across multiple projects. And it's also up to studios and how they utilize um, these technologies. 
Um, and while talking about future trends, um, I do have to mention um, upcoming um, generative AIs. Um, it is becoming a serious factor, and it can as easy be a very useful tool, but also a big challenge. Um, and in, in any case, it looks set to shake up things in the industry um, massively, um, and especially because it, um, it, it kind of it brings potential of um, bringing a lot of cost down. However, it is um, at expense of artists' jobs. Um, now, conclusion to just kind of a sum up what, um, what we're um, chatting about. Um, balancing cost versus benefit is at the core of everything. So, so important. Um, being efficient with your available resources. Communication. Good communication saves so much time, so much money, so much energy. And it doesn't matter if you're an assistant who is making your coffees or if you're a VFX supervisor um, looking at the screens on a set. Always, always communicate. And when you don't understand, you just ask. Simple as that. Um, and to sum up, I mean, previously we've talked about how um, how is the, the VFX industry ever growing, but um, the demand is higher than ever. Um, and it's, it's so great to see that because of all those new technologies, VFX is not now just something which is solely for post-production, but it's so integrated into production. Um, and well, from a cost-budget perspective, um, VFX, um, it's definitely growing faster than almost any other department or any other aspect of filmmaking. And I think that's why the economies of VFX and to understand what I can do, what I can get from my resources is so, so essential. Um, and just to sum up, something I always, um, always tell myself when, when things get overwhelming because we work in film um, and games and, and we do long hours and things get overwhelming. So, um, just a silly image, um, which I sometimes tell myself on the way to work when I need a bit of a boost of motivation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions. Uh, so my first question will be, how you started your career uh, in uh, filmmaking? Uh, it was probably in London after coming from the USA. So uh, how it happened that you uh, become a partner to Coaron or next directors? Um, it's a bit funny. It was actually, I, I, was, um, I was here at, um, at this school 10 years ago when I told my parents that I am um, dropping out of uh, medical anthropology and that I'm going to study film. Um, you can imagine how well that go. <laughs> um, but um, I... Uh, I, I mean, I made that leap, so I kind of had to go, um, go into it fast. I moved to London. I studied film production. I actually focused um, um, in documentaries. I did a documentary in refugee camps, and um, then I came back. And um, I, I was feeling quite down how it was, um, how it was in the world of documentaries. Um, and around that time, I met my husband, who was already a VFX artist. Um, I loved I loved film production, but I just I, I couldn't really find my my, my, my place there. And uh, well, long story short, he, um, he he showed me the world of VFX. I, I fell in love. Um, I, I told him that I found the one, um, which was the VFX. Um, I then um, I then decided to go and study production management, uh, where I specified in animation and VFX. That was at the National Film and Television School. Um, which, which really helped in terms of creating a community of filmmakers. And then, um, I, I, then it was just working 14 hours without a stop. And I, I'm not proud of myself, and I'm, I'm not telling you it's good, because it, um, it, it, has, a lot of, um, it has a lot of negatives, but it, it was just working from one project to the other. I started working, um, I, I can tell you because it's out. Um, I, I, my first project was NLA. Two, um, and and then since then I just um, I, I've been um, in VFX and I'm loving it. Thank you, Mr. Shabik. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, 
thank you for an amazing presentation. Uh, question. Okay, I have a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, do these new technologies like uh, real-time uh, uh, rendering engines and uh, deep learning AI in this state uh, really accelerate the, the production of this caliber? Because uh, in Unreal, I, I don't know, if I want to get a good result, I switch to path tracing, then I can use Redshift probably <laughs> and do not have that overhead of transferring everything to Unreal or things, things like that. Yes, I mean, very good. It's something which is very new and um, it, it also depends on the scale of production. So when we're talking about the period drama where you mostly have cleanups and set extensions, no, you, you don't go into Unreal Engine. <laughs> but if you are, um, if you're working on something like Mandalorian, um, where you know that there are more, um, more things coming after, it is definitely, um, it, it's definitely good to set up that infrastructure. Again, as we, as we said, the initial cost. Also, um, a lot of, um, uh, it's with Unreal Engine, and I was talking a lot um, with the game students about this. Um, VFX people, they don't really know how to use Unreal Engine as much as a game design student, but at the same time, game, game people, they are not as familiar with the workflow of, of, of VFX. Um, so I do believe that more and more we will integrate these two um, departments. It, it will become even easier to set up. But yeah, it, 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 definitely, it definitely can reduce um, post-production costs massively. And, and as we were saying, in terms of feedback, we all know that VFX node is not like a sound node where you have it next day. <laughs> you have to wait at least a week sometimes to see, um, to see revised version. With something like virtual production, you have a supervisor, a director, then production designer right on a set, and they can make these changes right, um, right there before you really get into it. So um, it, it has a huge, huge potential. Everything tied together with their production. Yeah, I, 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 it's so great. Like, I'm, I'm so excited to see where this is going and how, um, how it's all going to be connected. Thank you very much. Um, please, um, Mrs. Varadarova, do you want to say some question? You can wait. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, it was a great presentation. I'm really thankful for yeah. for such a presentation, and I'm really thankful. Thankful to see a woman in such a position, great position. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, my question is that uh, you said really important thing that you VFX are on the beginning, should be on the beginning till almost the end of the project of the film. And my question is that uh, you studied. Uh, film and uh, production and management and if uh, I think uh, there is a really uh, important thing to study management and to know something about the management when you want to be a coordinator or a basic supervisor and uh, Could I agree more? <laughs> how, how did you feel it and what do you recommend for uh, such uh, maybe to study or to, to be uh, one of the study plans to film and television faculty to to make some kind of subject to have on the on the faculty to study it or and to know or how 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 to bring it to uh, to to pre-production mm -hmm. of the film and such such a such a knowledge. Thank you for the question, and um, yes, it's it, it's so great. I'm, I'm always so happy to see more women in VFX. Um, um, in terms of what you said, um, w w because it, it does start in a film school, and at NFTS, I actually studied production, general production management. They didn't have um, they didn't have uh, VFX production management, but um, while I was there, um, I already knew that I was so in love with VFX. Um, I, I, my husband helped a lot. Um, to kind of um, tell me what should I be focusing on. Um, it was a lot of uh, 
kind of my own just going off and, and reading about it. But um, to be honest, I um, it's also on on a school level. Um, I did a lot of extra projects. So um, with drama students, I, I did the film. I had to. I I helped them. I was a production management manager on on a couple of those. But for any of my extra activities, I helped produce a game, uh, which was the, the the atmosphere being in a like with the game people. I I just I, I was loving it. And the same with animators. Um, it was just completely different vibe. So I, as a student, was focusing myself on just sitting next to animators and just asking them what you do, how you do it, how could I help you, are there any spreadsheets that could help you, like all, all these things you kind of, um, and, and I've learned so much um, actually working in VFX as well, but I am so for bringing production into VFX because it's again as we were saying it's cost versus benefit and creative people want to have as, as many shots as they, they, they want to have the opportunities and to to have the time to have resources you have to manage them well so you can make most of it and I think it, it's, it's important to to value that production side of it because it can only help you I like a good VFX producer who can find pockets of money everywhere can then come to VFX supervisor and be like, you know, those 20 shots you wanted to do? Well, we can do five of them. Um, so I think, and, and more and more, I think VFX production is, um, is getting recognized. And, and the thing about VFX department as well, which was news to me, it, VFX department has two head of departments. It's not only VFX supervisor, it's VFX supervisor and VFX producer. Um, and I, I've seen it that most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of times it was VFX supervisor, then VFX producer, and then production, and then animators. But it's, they, they do have to collaborate. They both have so much to bring to the table. And the same with the VFX supervisors. They can advise what is more spending money on because VFX producer won't have that much of a technical knowledge. So if that relationship is, if that relationship is based on the trust, I think I think that's the way to go, and you really you can really make most of most of your resources. Still touched a, a lot of things that I would ask about, but uh, maybe because we have now in our audience uh, students of game design and uh, and uh, VFX students, can you compare the, your profession in one uh, profession or one industry and the second industry? Um, sorry. Uh, if you uh, can compare your experience uh, about uh, game design and mm. the film uh, industry, um, if, if, if there are some differences. Um, in terms of game um, design, my experience was on a student level. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I was helping to just kind of organ, like, just organizing um, a game designers or just uh, I was tracking some bits and pieces for them. I was making sure they're staying on the deadlines um, which they've set <laughs> for themselves um, because I, I, I didn't have enough knowledge to, 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 to set those deadlines for them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, could, if I could tell, if I could answer this question based on the, uh, the, the actual yeah. real life experience. But, um, okay, next my question, you touch also virtual reality. I feel that it is probably future of, of uh, the film industry in some way. So uh, how do you see in your experience, how, how often is uh, this technology used uh, now in your project that you did or you will do in future? More and more, uh, definitely more and more, um, but it does depend on the budgets. Um, smaller films are now, and by smaller films, I mean, around 90 mil budgets. Um, they're also finding out how, um, how useful it is to have, um, have a virtual production screens. Um, we used, for instance, LED screens um, because the budget was just not big enough to, do, um, to, to have a full-on screen. But they, I, I feel like in the next few years, it will, it will go more and more. Yeah. So the next better. question is uh, Mr. Mijo. Microphone. 
Hi, uh, my question is, uh, did you mention uh, importance of cause and benefits when judging the visual effects? Uh, I think that at the beginning of the project, the director has a huge vision. They see hundreds of shots and then, then they meet the reality. <laughs> they are not able to do it. Uh, what do you think are the variables and uh, or questions uh, the director should ask, you know, that uh, what, what visual effects or what shot is like important and when the benefit of visual effects will be important and in what shot not like? Mm. How do you see it? Um, well, in, in a best case scenario, that's when the director realizes the realities. But <laughs> to be honest, most of the time, they just, they, they, they just want those big CG shots um, and they want them everywhere. Um, even if it's not Marvel. Um, but um, I, I think what is very important, and it, it depends on what director you work as, um, with as well. It varies so much. Um, some directors are very much keen to sit down with VFX producer, to sit down with VFX um, supervisor during those initial script analysis, and they are trying to work with them. Um, with some directors, um, you unfortunately, it's not as easy. Um, it, it also it's also good to think about how much um, how much experience director has with VFX because if um, if you have a director who hasn't done much, for instance, CG set extensions or, um, you know, a big, big shots, um, what you don't really want to do is show him a concept just, well, what you don't want to show him is very, very rough previous with grayscales and a, a, a lot of screens because it will freak him out. What you want to do with directors like that is to do a concept to to maybe not show him a moving image, but to show him how it will look at the end. Um, with directors who have experience with VFX, it's so much easier because you suggest to put 20 by 20 massive big screen, and then you show them a concept of what you can put on that green screen, and they can, well, they, 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 they trust you, and, and, and it's, it's much more collaborative. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it, it, it's so broad. It, it really varies um, based on based on director, and it's and it's again. It comes back to relationship, and it's very political in my opinion. You have to know as a VFX producer and VFX supervisor how to talk to directors, and everyone is different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, in the afternoon at the two o'clock, we'll start our workshop, and then there will be open space for our students to put any questions. I didn't get ability to put now, so in the afternoon it will be time for professional questions. And uh, for now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I want to welcome Peter van Hoyte. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, Nicoletta is uh, Slovakia slash uh, uh, England, so uh, uh, Peter is uh, Belgia slash Canada. And uh, this slash Canada is very interesting and important for me. Uh, so we try our technique to prepare it, and uh, uh, in a moment we will continue.
uh, sorry for the break, but you can uh, <laughs> jump for a coffee or something. Something. Okay. start in a minute
Final second. What's that? Oh no, you have to wait until they're all there. That's fine, I can, I can start my talk. But then, how is it going to be displayed on that screen? Okay, alright. So, um, uh, Mr. Peter van Hoyte came from a long distance. Uh, personally, I, uh, I like he came here. <laughs> he, he's a special wow. guest. Uh, we'll uh, speak with him also in the afternoon. So, this first will be just the uh, uh, first uh, uh, site uh, on, on uh, his profession or his uh, uh, informations mm -hmm. pre presentation and uh, later in the afternoon you can uh, have a workshop with him and uh, speak a lot a lot uh, absolutely uh, uh, straight so please peter thank you very much um i um i started with a perfect demonstration of um murphy's law um which is that everything that can go wrong, will go wrong, um, and also also uh, the importance of testing, <laughs> which we didn't do. Um, we thought it was going to be all straightforward, plug in a computer, and it will just work, but I didn't. Um, my name is Peter. Um, what I would like to do in this presentation, uh, especially after spending uh, a couple of days here, hearing um, stories about the school, uh, how the school's been set up, um, and in what kind of an environment um, you're all in at the moment. Um, I realized that it made me think a lot about my own background and, um, and where I came from. So I'm, I'm currently working in visual effects, and I have been for um, almost 30 years, um, but I started as a traditional animator pencil, paper, uh, just like 
our friends upstairs, um, exactly that kind of, that kind of environment. Um, it was at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Ghent, in Belgium. Um, and it was set up as, as, as an environment where people individually could express their own um, ideas um, in a very protected environment and a very traditional one. Um, however, as I went through the studies, um, I also uh, came in touch with new technologies. Um, Pixar was on the rise. There were things happening with something called computer graphics um, that, that really interested me. And um, what I ended up doing was I did my thesis in CG, and this was back in 1996. Um, the film that I made, and if we've got some time I'll show it here, if not I'll show it this afternoon, because I managed to uh, find the original master um, in Glorious Pal, which is 720 by 576, um, and, um, and I brought it with me. Uh, but it was, and it still is, the only CG generated short ever to come out of, of the Academy. And in order for me to be able to do that, I had to kind of go against the grain of the system. Back in 1996, um, the, one of the rules of even graduating is that your thesis had to be delivered on film, on actual film, be it 16, 35 millimeter, didn't matter, but it had to be on film. Now, um, for me, that was basically a financial concern because having something digital to be printed onto film was a very expensive process, which you had to pay with money, which I didn't have. So what I did instead is I made, I, I, I offered up myself uh, as sort of the president of, of the student council for the animation department, um, because the student council, together with uh, certain teachers, also determined the internal legislation of, of the school. So I did, I did a whole talk about you know, the move to digital formats and uh, things like that, and, and that the, the requirement of, the, of, of, of delivering something on film was getting outdated, and shouldn't we do something about it? Obviously, that was completely self-serving, um, but I, 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 I succeeded. So I was already well into rendering my own film when finally, much to the, um, the horror of my, <laughs> of my teachers, um, the decision came through from up above that that requirement um, as of that year was scrapped, which meant quite simply that I was allowed to graduate. Um, the film was shown um, and, um, and I got top marks in the end. Um, so I, 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 I graduated as as, um, as top of my class, even though people didn't really understand what I was doing, I was outside the system, there was, there was a lot of critique, uh, which was mentioned in my, in my, uh, in my final, final assessment, but, but they agreed that this was something, something new, something that they hadn't seen before, and, and in that way really fit into their philosophy, uh, even though it was technologically uh, really, um, really different. I am gonna see, if, if these files have stopped copying, and they have, because what I want to show you now <coughs> is um, following on that, um, that film, I was then catapulted into, um, into making commercials, CG commercials, back in 1997, um, because I did my thesis, because obviously I didn't have the computers nor the software, so I got in touch through my editing professor um, who liked me because I liked editing and it was editing on steam back with film cutting pasting um, and I ended up editing all the films of my uh, fellow students because nobody else liked editing but I, I, I did I somehow you know I liked the cutting and pasting and sort of uh, having having that control over how a film flowed and sometimes you know making suggestions while you put that shot in front of that shot instead of something else changing other people's work love changing other people's work um, so 
That person knew someone, also very young at the time, who started a, um, a, a company making what they called at the time, they were called CD motions. So in Belgium, there's a big sort of dance music culture, and they, 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 they release all these dance compilation CDs, and then they made this kind of format um, where you got the cover of the CD and then you had to turn it around and then put some titles in CG, render it, that was all in Lightwave. People know what that is. Um, and um, so they had lots of, lots of software, hardware, and I was allowed to use it, uh, which was mostly late at night when everyone else there stopped, um, stopped working. I would put music on really loud and then work through the night, do my own stuff. Uh, which was much more artistic, obviously, than, um, than, than what happened there. Um, but on the back of me graduating, they were like, why don't you come and work with us? Because now you know, you know what we're doing. So here's a cover of a CD. And they gave me seven days on my own to just to, to make this commercial. I had the CD, I had the audio. I'm going to try and play that back now. It's the first commercial that I've ever made. My first, my first project outside of outside of school and I hope it plays back all right. So let's see. If I double click this, what's gonna happen? Oh, well, that's me. Inside track. Why isn't the mouse going that way? I can I can drag it until the end of this screen but not further. So what do I do? What's that? Or a Windows key and arrow in the direction. And okay. Well, all Windows these keys, all these keys are black, line. and there's black lettering. On them. I can't see. <laughs> um, so let's see if this plays back. Oh, do we have audio? Yes, it has to be. Okay. All right. Ready? Oh, I'm not ready. Where's the F? Right on. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so this is the first time I've ever shown this in public. Uh, and and I, I understand why. Um, after seven days, that was that was basically my my, 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 my sort of test. Like, am I ready to enter enter the um, uh, the professional circuit? And and client loved it. Um, everything was, but I had n literally no idea what I was doing. Um, uh, but what happened is that I I, I like this process. I like design as well. Um, and it went and it went further to the point where, uh, which was really fun where the style was being, was being <laughs> copied. Um, this is another one, more to the, more to the end of it, which kind of shows how these things evolved over, over the time that I was, that I was there and, um, and sort of increased in, in, uh, in complexity. So by the time I made this one, I didn't only know Lightwave, but I also uh, was using a program called Fusion. Um, and I think, I think it was version two, um, which, which was, um, which was what was called a compositing application. I, I didn't know what things meant like alpha channel, RGB channels, whatever. It was, for me, it was a collection of nodes. Well, it wasn't really nodes at the time. It was, it was somehow an interface with like bricks and pipes. Um, and it was you couldn't move the notes freely. It was it was very very um, very different from what it looks like now. But it did basically the same thing. Um, and having the ability to incorporate compositing into my three D work uh, allowed me to increase complexity much more than what you uh, saw back there, which was which was basically just lightweight renders. System Non-stop clip sounds. Stop there. Fun fact. You see.
see the hair over there, remember Dirk Lambrecht from yesterday's presentation? That's Dirk. Um, so that's him um, playing on turntables. Um, my boss was, was uh, Frank de Wolf, who's still quite a well-known DJ. Uh, and he had... Anyway, that's Dirk playing there. Uh, so I filmed him and used him as another layer in, in, inside the... Um, See, it's all, all connected. Russian Roulette, Mara Picato and Madre Dink. Club System, Zesty. So now I'm gonna take you on a tour of club. Club System, Zesty. Nu verkrijgbaar. So this is, all, this is all made on machines that have, you know, your, your, the phones in your pockets have got more, more power than those machines have now. More memory, more, um, more everything. Um, so, Grid, that was a company, they don't exist anymore, but that was a company that I worked for. Not only did commercials, but then also became more ambitious and wanted to work in, in, in film. Um, so we ended up working on a children's movie called Plop. Uh, and Plop is like a little sort of tiny person with a funny hat. And there's this really crappy story about them making a balloon flying. Anyway, it's, it's, it was the first project I've ever done on film. So what that meant was... Um, from start to finish, I did a, an awful lot of nodding uh, because not only did I have to kind of apply what I already knew and thought I understood, but the whole sort of world of film was added to that. So we were working with Sinion and people were talking about scene deferred, display deferred, uh, graphics, gamma. We had to kind of um, calibrate our monitors with patterns of vertical and horizontal lines and then you had to squint and you had to kind of do contrast and brightness until you didn't really see the lines anymore and then you got an idea of what gamma your screen was, whatever that was. Anyway, lots and lots of nodding. <coughs> and we worked on film. So what that meant um, back, in, back in those days as well, reviewing was not the same as it is now. Now, you know, everything, everything is playable in, uh, in HD or even, or even higher. We couldn't play back HD in real time. That was absolutely impossible. So what needed to happen for the shots is we had to have them printed on film. Then we had to drive three hours to a theater in Amsterdam, sit down in a dark room, and then the projectionist would play your three, four, five shots back on a loop, and then we play it three times, because that was all that the production could pay for. So three times you had like second long shots going shh, shh, shh. and it's like, does it look all right? And then that was done. That was done. That was also your, your, your first and your last chance to uh, find mistakes, to give notes, and then it's three hours back to, you know, your workstation, do your other, do your other stuff, and then, and then at, at some point it all gets integrated into the movie, I'm going to show you a little clip of that and what that looked like. Um, it's actually not, not that bad, I think. If I can... Unless I... Do I copy this? Well, yeah, I do. So I'm going to do... Triangles? Yes. Right. So this is my first work I did on film. There's no audio to this. So there's the titles. That's a few. <laughs> clouds are obviously real. There's no way you could do CG clouds. First time working on green screen. I think our heaviest, there we go, is these shots that I was working on. Um, I, think, I think we had one machine with one gig of RAM. And this is, I mean, 
the, the, the resolution here is not, because this comes from a demo reel, which was, which was just PAL. Um, but these are 2K frames. This is what CG looked like back then. These are, in fact, these are, in fact, CG, CG clients. That shot of him landing, I think that took two days to render in comp. Not CG, in comp. So that is that. Um, I worked for about four years at, at that company, um, and at, at that time, I was already in my 20s, um, but I also grew up in the Flemish countryside, which meant that I, I hadn't really, I hadn't really travelled at all, um, but I had, I had a sense at that point that I needed to see some other parts of the world, so long story short, I, I went backpacking in Australia. Um, but I also had in my backpack um, a VHS copy of some of the work that I did at Grid. And when I passed through Sydney, um, I passed by a company called Yatic, and they did a lot of uh, motion graphics and design. And the, um, the, the creative director over there loved my work. And I was like, oh, we want to get you over here. The producers were not not as fond of me as he was, because they asked me, they asked me about my process. You know, how do you storyboard something like that? And we're talking about motion graphics and typography. How do you storyboard it? How do you, how do, you do animatics? Didn't. It's just like, I've got a, I've got a week and a cover, uh, or a week and an idea, and then I just go wild for a week, and then what I have at the end of the week, I put it to an edit of audio, and then it looks cool, and that's what I, do. Um, but anyway, um, somehow the creative director managed to convince their producers. So they offered me uh, a job in Sydney to come over. But it's it's not like it's not like today where you just fill out some paperwork. I mean, I don't want to minimize it, but it's very, very easy compared to then to go to another country and work. So it took a long time. In the meantime, I quit my job at, um, at Grid. I quit my job on my birthday. Um, and um, even though the deal with the Australian company wasn't, wasn't yet set, um, but on my birthday, I got a little drunk at work. Um, and I got a phone call from a production company in um, Brussels asking me, well, you know, we've heard you're quitting your job. Uh, we've got this thing going on in Montreal, in Canada. And um, would, you, would you mind going over there? It's about six weeks of work. We need, we need some CG for an animated feature. And someone needs to go there to guide a small team in Belgium through doing some vehicles and, and, and things like that. So I was like, ah, yeah, sure. Sure, I'm up for anything. Uh, when do I leave? day after tomorrow. Um, so I did that, and that turned out to be the triplets of Belleville. Um, I wasn't at all in traditional animation anymore, but that was, that was simply a beautiful project. Uh, uh, but but same, same thing happened as before. Um, there were a lot of things asked of me then that I had no experience with, not in the least supervision. Um, um, as I went there and looked at the volume of work that needed to be done, it was obvious, obvious that it was much more than six weeks of work. There were three teams, one in Montreal, one in France, one in Belgium, that needed, uh, that needed guidance at the same time. Um, I was keen to do it. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I've got, I've got Excel, and I've got this, and I've got that. Um, and then um, I just said yes to everything. And I started making things up as I went along, including uh, speaking French. Um, I, am from, <laughs> I am from Belgium. I had some French in school. Fran Fran uh, French is also one of our official languages. But I was far from fluent 
in it. So in the beginning, especially for the French team, I was known, as I learned later, as the supervisor who didn't know how to speak French. Um, and everything was over the phone. There wasn't, there were, you know, no video calls, no nothing. Um, we did try and, um, you know, film some things on a DV camera, then put that on an FTP site, that goes to the other side of the world, and, you know, by maybe two days later, you get a response back. Um, those six weeks, became over a year. Um, I also got involved creatively on the film after a very, very big fight with, uh, with the director who was very fond of creative people, Sylvain Chaumet. Uh, very fond of creative people, not fond at all of, act, um, of, uh, of production people. But when, when, when I was, after the fight, when I got into sort of the creative process, then you know, uh, we, became, we became friends. Um, and I was, I was uh, made responsible for the integration of the 2D uh, and the 3D in the film. Um, has, who, who has seen the film, actually? Who knows what film I'm talking about? Because I didn't bring that one. Nobody? Yes. No. Oh, wow. Okay, well, look up Triples of Velvet <laughs> and watch it. It's, it's, uh, we were nominated for an Oscar, uh, which, we, which we lost. Uh, we didn't win. Uh, it was against, I think that was Finding Nemo, um, so that's, that's that era. Um, and to this day, I'm glad, I'm, I'm, I'm more than glad that I did what I did on the film, and I nearly worked myself to death. Um, because to this day, it's still, especially in the animation industry, it still opens doors. Um, if I if I tell anyone that I've worked on that film, uh, especially studios that have been around for longer than a couple of years, doors go open, I'm always welcome. It's 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 a great thing. I did learn one thing after the film because we got a, a, a ton of publicity, um, and I did learn one thing. Whenever you do any work and there's anything clever, do not say to the press that you've just used what was already available just a bit different than anyone else. The press loves new tools, new developments, new... So what, what we did on the, on the film was we did come up with a new way to, um, to uh, manipulate 3D to make it look more like 2D and integrate it into the, into the film. And it was very successful. Um, but I kind of undersold it in saying, well, we just use some light wave and we just use some fusion and it's off the shelf tools and we put them all together and then out comes this magnificent result. And nobody was really interested. I know now that if I would have sold this as new technology that we would have developed in house and we had our own tools, we would have got a lot more out of it. So just, just a, little, a, little, a little tip for when, whenever you come up with something smart, don't, don't undersell it. Um, so based on that film, I was asked to work on um, Sylvain's next film, which was The Illusionist. I didn't do the entire project there, and that's, that's, that's a long story. I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on that um, in the workshop after. Uh, but through Sylvain, I got to meet Richard Williams. Um, the writer of the animator survival kit and we got along um, and he was working on his personal project and um, had lots and lots of wonderful drawings he just didn't know how to put them together so I was I flew to Wales where um, Richard and Imogen his wife lived then um, to with my laptop and some software, and then uh, and um, uh, a camera. It was a what was it? A D twenty something something fairly simple consumer camera. Um, filmed some of his drawings, put them together in what was called a line tester, um, which was developed by one of my old teachers uh, at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. 
um, and then taught him how to how to manipulate that. So I, I taught I, I actually taught Richard Williams how to use a computer. Um, uh, so that's that's my claim to fame there. Um, but then based on that, uh, we got talking about his idea of making his book into a video series. So I worked with him for two years, um, filming 33,000 drawings in his barn, putting them all together, timing them. I wrote, I, I'm not a programmer at all, but I needed to find a way to get the timing data into my compositing software. So I taught myself a little bit of scripting, just enough just enough to be able to create a tool that could convert um, what was basically a CSV file into a Fusion comp, and then do all those hundreds of examples that are on the DVDs, they're still available by the way, um, um, into, into comp and, and then to DVD. Then I had to teach myself the structure of DVDs, how to build those because then I was put in charge of of, 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 of designing the whole, um, the entire interface of the DVD, how users interact with it, all stuff that I, I, um, that I didn't know anything about. Um, and, and I'm gonna just play this back. Um, I also got to do, oh, where's that bad thing? I also got to do this. Which is the logo? This is not the final logo, but this is this is um, this is a test that I find more interesting than the logo itself because it shows all the drawings, the drawing numbers. Um, I I animated two um, two characters. There's two CG characters in there um, using using techniques as well that I didn't I didn't I didn't. You know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the red thread through everything that I've done over the years, is I often said yes to things that I wasn't certain about, and then kind of made it up as I, as I went along. Um, so this, that's one of mine, and there's another one as well. The amount of effort that's gone into this, um, See the swimmer over there? The day after Dick Williams animated this one, I think it was something like 700 drawings, taking five hours each, he had a heart attack and was rushed off to hospital for a triple bypass. And then a couple of weeks after that, um, I came to visit him in Bristol at the time. And he was all, he was all happy about it. And he stopped in the middle of the street and. Showed, showed me his massive scar. Um, yeah, what's, what's happened there? And, and I put this, um, this together in a 4K composite back in the day. Um, and I worked on it for four and a half months, just in, mostly in my spare time, but for four and a half months because I, I, I wanted it to be absolutely perfect. And the 4K version of this is on, is on YouTube. You can, you can, you can can find it. So what I started doing more and more uh, then as well is, is, is trying to work with people who are very creative. Um, and one of the people I, I also admired at the time was Terry Gilliam. Um, I've always loved, loved his films. Uh, Brazil is, is still, has kind of, has been forever been my sort of desert, desert island film. Um, and via working with this software, I got a tour in London and different visual effects houses, and I ended up by chance in Terry Gilliam's um, studio. Um, and I met with uh, a man called Paul Doherty, which was his visual effects supervisor. Uh, and um, the only thing I had in common with that person at that time was that we both used the same software to do color correction, which was Fusion. Um, so we got, we got to talking and um, I started from that day, I cold called him every single week for an entire year saying, you know, is Terry doing a new film? Is he doing a project? How's it going? Can I come to London? Can I do something for you? The answer was always no, until after a year 
he actually called me back and said, you know what, Terry Gilliam is doing a film and I want to give you a chance. We're not using the same software. Can you ship us your workstation, your software, and you come to London uh, to, work, to work on this film? I said, yeah, sure. So I shipped my workstation over there and my software and everything. And I worked on um, the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, um, uh, which was in fact Heath Ledger's final film, and not his role as the Joker in, uh, in Batman, which was not a running joke. You don't, you don't joke about these things, but um, that, was, that was a thing. Um, so I ended up working with, um, with Terry Gilliam as well, um, just just trying, just trying. Um, behind all that, um, I, I also was very active in an online community called Pigs Fly at the time. Um, Pigs Fly was a forum for, uh, back then, Ion Software, Ion Software Fusion. And um, I took it on myself to sort of help people who were starting out, who weren't very technical, Sort of, you know, how to how to use Fusion. Um, Nuke was a big deal back then as well. So, oh, I've seen people do this in Nuke. How do I do that in Fusion? Just sort of. So, so, so I became together with a handful of other people, um, like a, like a, a um, like a, a, a front runner in in in, um, in the online community. Based on that, there was a company. In Los Angeles, called Uncharted Territory, they were the supervisors for Roland Emmerich, who wanted to do a film about Shakespeare, weirdly enough, and came to Germany to do it, to film it, to do the visual effects over there. The visual effects had to happen in fusion based on his experience on 2012, where uh, two people working on Fusion, just by being clever about things, it's not just the software, it's also about how, how, you, um, how you use the software, but these two people managed to add pace a team of 40 compositors <coughs> on a different piece of software, just by being clever about it. And, um, but people who, were, who worked in Fusion were hard to find. So they um, trawled Pigsfly, came up with a handful of the people who were the most prominent on the forum and invited them to come to Berlin for a, for a, for a talk. And among them was me. Um, and on Anonymous, we had a slightly gargantuan task to do a lot of, because it's a period piece. It's uh, 16th century London, we had to do London. Um, lots and lots of set extensions, lots and lots of stuff happening on the Thames. Um, which meant water, and that was all planned to be in CG. Um, it was. It turned out to be too render intensive. We couldn't finish it. Um, so together with Ronnie Susan, who was then my supervisor, um, we came up with a way of doing realistic-looking water, or what you know, what, what looked realistic to us back then in compositing. Um, let me see if I've got the... Yeah, I could probably show you this. That's beautiful. So a lot of what you see here, all is snow, it's all cold. Um, most of the atmospheric effects. Um, people who work with fusion, may know the volume fog tool that one was developed on this show so volume fog was first a very complex setup uh, which we sent to ion software and they made it into into a tool but the whole what they call their sort of deep pixel workflow originated on this film so we got into this uh, with 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 all these techniques that we got in cinefx you know, we had a big article about how we did all these, all these things, all these little mists, all these little smokestacks. That's all. That's all fusion particles. Um, so many things that were traditionally 
uh, a 3D operation was, was, was now all in common. So all of a sudden, um, we had a system where we could do water and then, you know, at, at the start of a review, we said, well, oh, I think these waves are a little bit too much. Well, by the end of the review, we could have another version ready for the director to see. He absolutely loved us. So there as well, there's not that much water going on. I think there's a little bit at the end. I'm gonna, because I know, I know I can, I can play it. Here's an example. That's cool. That was over there. So that whole scene, that whole scene is cool. The, the, the castle, everything is just, it's just, it's just, um, it's just an image play. And we managed to reflect it in the water. We managed to put all of that all in cool. There's no even, even the, um, sorry, even um, when they're in the wintry landscape, uh, just the uh, the breaths of um, when when they're talking. So we um, we tied a particle emitter to uh, audio samples. So then we got you know we got the rhythm of, 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 of the speech in you know, simple simple things like that. But it was all about iteration, all about you know all about thinking smart. Um, so those people who hired me then then got me over to Los Angeles, and then I started my um, my US adventure, which was supposed to be foundation. Uh, Roland Emmerich was hired to make a trilogy of movies uh, based on Isaac Asimov's novels. So Foundation, which is now a series on Apple, um, was then a film project. And we did a lot of development for it. Sadly, all the funding was pulled. Um, studios didn't believe in it anymore. Um, and I was kind of stranded. Because um, I was on a work visa in the United States um, without work, um, which which meant that you know I had I had a couple of weeks time to find something, uh, because otherwise you're basically being booted out of the country because you're not allowed to stay there. Um, so I did. I made a reel with some of the stuff. I'm just going to show you this reel. This is this is the only reel I've ever made specifically to find a job. my US phone number, which doesn't work anymore. This is Terry Gilliam's film. That was a miniature. It's normal. That's your interest. So this is not 3D, but that's also comp. All the ripples in the water. Um, so this one, this one I did before um, before a moment. But I was already doing stuff with water, but that was a purely 2D solution. That explosion, 72 hours to render in court, there were 150 hand-drawn nails in that film. That was 2002. That shot wasn't even supposed to be in the film. It was already written out because they, they, they couldn't finish the 3D renders. So I caught that entire thing um, on one Saturday. This one's interesting. This started with one, one image, but we found ways to sort of displace it quite cleverly. To add some camera, camera moves and, and, and actual parallax. So 
this, this is, this is cool. This is inside the finish in 2010. In this trick, find some lines to displace something a little bit more. This is whatever, whatever works. Don't look at it from different angles because it won't, it, it'll fall apart, but it doesn't matter. This shot was called and rendered on my laptop. Because <laughs> it had a render file, it had peerless, but it wasn't set up for fusion. story there um, because I was I was um, talking with someone about noise reduction the other day um, this film they got so the production got a deal on some really fast film stock um, for very cheap and they used it to shoot blue screen um, some of the noise was as big as the guy's head and um, this was Paul Doherty again um, so I was in in London I was like, I can do keying, I can do keying. I was not allowed to denoise anything. The guy who said, there's only one rule, I want every pixel out there, and you're not gonna denoise this footage. So none of, none of the keys in that film have been denoised, and I, I learned how to key. So the guy was right. You know, so, you know, you don't need to denoise to pull a good key, you just have to, you know, you have to work at it. And, and he was right. No denoise was used on that film. During all this, all this, all this, this thing, I did, I did one, one other thing. So after, after this, I was hired at Sony Imageworks in um, in Los Angeles. So that was my first, the first time mm -hmm. I was working for a big box visual effects house on big studio films. The first film I worked on was Man in Black Three. Um, the VFX supervisor on that show was Ken Rolston, who's who's one of the founders. Of, of Sony Imageworks. Um, and the thing that was absolutely wonderful about working with Ken was he was one of those rare breeds of supervisors who could say, well, you've got your shot here. This is what people are going to look at. Get me that right. I don't care about anything that happens. I mean, it has to, that, there mustn't be mistakes in it, matte lines, you know, no technical stuff. But this is what people are going to look at. I want this to look great. If you get that looking great and the rest of it is without mistakes, I'll approve your shot. And he always kept that promise. Uh, he taught me an awful lot about how to supervise myself because I find that a lot of supervisors get totally bogged down on playing something back 50 times and looking mostly at stuff that's at the edge of frame because that's, the, that's usually the easiest thing and, the, uh, and, and, and most risk-free thing to comment on 
So they go all the way, so it's always back and forth, back and forth, with little noise, oh, this thing in the background, that thing in the background. By the time the shot is, is, has to be delivered, it doesn't look all that great. It gets a bit muddy, it gets a bit soft. There's a lot of soft comps out there. Uh, even in, even in, in very recent work, I find, I find compositing often, often lacking in visual effects. Um, you see that the shots have been worked on like 50, 100. I, I, I worked on, uh, this is a true story, I worked on uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2. That was the one with Electro. And I had the shot where, where you see Elec Electro first. He sort of appears, there's a bit of smoke, no, 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 no. I got a first version out pretty fast, um, which, which impressed the supervisors. The problem was that it was way before anyone else was working on any of the other shots. So nobody risked uh, approving it. And they made me do more than 300 versions of that shot. It's a two second shot. More than 300 versions. The 300th version didn't look all that different from version number one. By that time, it was over Christmas. Um, Sony had, a, I, think, I think they've changed it now, but it had a, a, what I call the bums on seats um, approach to visual effects, which was, Basically, as the quota went up, so went the requirement to work long hours. Um, and then everyone had to stay, at the end, 14 hours a day. Um, whether or not you were working, if you could finish your work in four or say six hours, you were there for another eight hours, just doing Facebook for a while. They, they would always say, I'll do some training, do some training. You'd get paid for the hours. So, you know, big, big paychecks, which was great, but it was, it was maddening. Um, so 300 versions, versions of that. Uh, and it's just, it's just, that would never happen with a supervisor like Ken Walston. Uh, so that's the lesson I, I, I took from there. Um, and I went into the big box visual effects circuit. I, 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 I sort of um, went from being a compositor, senior compositor, uh, to a compositing supervisor. Um, I moved from Sony Imageworks to uh, Method Studios. I also physically moved at that point uh, from Los Angeles to Vancouver because Vancouver is kind of, you know, a Hollywood sweatshop. Um, so with all the tax breaks and a cheap dollar. So a lot of work moved, moved over there. Uh, including including myself and my family and um, and there I progressed um, doing uh, different films I'll show you a couple of things if we have time still I'll show you a couple of things of the project that I'm most proud of uh, in, 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 in my sort of North American stint uh, a film called Obja uh, directed by Bong Joon-ho um, and uh, for Netflix um, and um, from uh, being a supervisor, it became clear to the higher ups, let's say, that I was, I was also quite good at managing stuff. So from composing supervisor, in, in kind of no time, I was the head of the comp department, and then I ended up being head of 2D for all of Method Studios Vancouver. And that was at the time where Marvel was doing an awful lot of stuff. Um, I was a supervisor on Avengers Infinity War, uh, which was not a nice experience. Um, people who have been working, um, I mean, maybe Nicoletta can, <laughs> can, can, um, can um, you know, especially through your husband, he might have some horror stories about working for Marvel. But Marvel was absolutely, uh, they were a, a horrendous client. Um, and I can, I can freely say this, of I course. Was that? I can vouch for that. There, there we go. Um, I've, I've never seen a studio, um, you know, pull entire sequences a couple of weeks before the project needs to be finished and completely restart it. Work of like, hundreds of people, they're already burnt out. Everyone's been working until five o'clock in the morning. We're two weeks from the deadline. You know what? We're going to change the whole bloody thing, but not the deadline. Thank you so much. You're great. Here's some more booze and some Snickers and, you know, go for it. Um, anyway, I was uh, head of 2D at the time. 
I was managing a team of 120 people, uh, but I was really unhappy because I didn't like doing management. I could do it, I could do it, and nobody else wanted to, uh, and apparently I did a good job, um, but I was so far removed from the creative process um, that um, it was time for me to do something else. So fast forward, also fast forward through the pandemic. I mean, that whole, that whole period of corona and pandemic and then reduced salaries, it was so stressful, it was so maddening. It changed the industry forever. Because now we're all sort of working from home and, and, and working by ourselves and you know, being quite individualistic. And I want to I touch on that too, because that's something that's really close to my heart. Um, at, at, at the end, I just had enough of the, of, 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 of the whole, it, it just didn't work for me anymore. So um, through those years, the person who was my supervisor on Anonymous, who by that time also had become a good friend, we were just talking, 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 and then we said, why don't we just start our own thing? Um, so together, we've now co-founded a small, completely decentralized and very, very efficient uh, visual effects shop, uh, which now has an office in LA, has an office in Brussels. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we don't have a building, we don't have a lot of people. We have, we have our knowledge, we have our experience. Um, we have an enormous list of people who are keen to work with us that we trust, we have completely reduced overhead so that money that we make can actually go to artists and not to time lost. And there's, there, there, is, there is such frustration with people from the industry who have seen uh, these big structures and how, uh, I can't even tell you the amount of meetings that I've been a part of where, where at some point I even said, you know, the combined salaries of all these people in this meeting for these, let's say, two hours is more than the amount of money we are trying to save by having this meeting. It's absurd. It is really absurd. And it's all, and it's all true. Um, so we started that. And another thing I did during all of, all of this stuff, uh, what happened with the online community called Pixfly is that the server wasn't maintained anymore. So uh, what that meant is that new users couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, register anymore on, on, the, on, on the forum. Um, information like um, it was getting old, um, nobody was really maintaining it. So I said, why don't I try and set up a forum by myself. So I, 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 I got my domain, uh, I did some research into open source software because none of this still doesn't, is gonna make me any money. Uh, so I can't, I can't really spend too much money on it. Uh, so I found this software called PHPBB um, and I set it up and I think we were maybe a dozen people at the time. It's like, oh look, I've set this up. And it's a little bit like Pixfly. It's a different kind of software, but we can, we can chat and then new users can, um, can register and we can, we, can, we can start talking about Fusion again, yay, with new people, yay. A um, couple of months after that, I had maybe like 100 users. I lost the entire database because I didn't know. I didn't know how to back things up properly and restore them properly and, and you know, um, I wanted new features because I'm a bit of a geek and I get, I get you know, I get, I get carried away with, with you know, feature creep, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. Um, so I lost a lot of information along the way. Um, and this was in 2014, so, so, so the forum is gonna be 10 years old. Uh, well, yeah, the for, after, after the one that I lost the database on. Um, that's gonna be 10 years old this year. Um, and instead of just being, it just being um, two dozen people and you know, I'm talking, talking a little bit. There's now almost 12,000 people on there. A pretty active community. Quality of the posts is really high. We're nearing like 50,000 posts. And, uh, and we're kind of known as sort of the fusion community in, in, in the industry. So you know, people are registering every day. 
um, and, 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 and trying new things. And, and it goes from learning basics that were, still, that, were, that were already basics 30 years ago to some of the new technologies and um, introducing AI and um, recently, which is something that I, I, wanna, I wanna see if I can do that for my users. I've, um, together with the help of a Russian developer, I've integrated um, AI chatbots into the forum. Uh, but because I'm also wary of getting sort of the wrong information out into search engines, um, it's only in forums that bots can't read. So all of that output is not being indexed. I'm thinking of all that stuff. Um, but there's uh, ChatGPT4 is in there, Midjourney is in there, Dali is in there, Stable Diffusion, and a couple of others are gonna are gonna come as well. So so you know if if anyone's interested, just come register. I'll give you access to the forum. Send me a text, um, and uh, and I'll make sure because it's it's paid accounts. It's like Midjourney, ChatGPT, but you know who. Who's gonna pay twenty bucks a month, you know, for all that stuff for generating like five, six, seven images? Just, you know, if we can do it together, it's another one of those together things. Then, you know, it's 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 gonna cost a fraction of of of, uh, of the money. Um, and 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 recently, some other guy um, started a topic about the history of fusion. Um, wanting to figure out um, you know, how fusion started um, and uh, where it came from and what were the ideas behind it. And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a fun topic. Um, so I found an old VHS copy of my student film and uh, put it on my new YouTube channel, um, put that in the, um, in the topic, and then, and then the same user said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you could, you know, I'm teaching, I'm teaching at, in, in, in this school in Bratislava, and we've got this, uh, wouldn't it be nice if, 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 if you could come over and, um, and, and talk to our students about some of this, uh, some of this stuff. And this, this is basically how um, I met Michal. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and um, Mr. Lavik, and, and, and how I ended up here doing this, doing this talk. So it, it's, it's kind of, it all came sort of weirdly full circle, just by, by a lot of saying yes, a lot of saying, you know, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, and then, and, then, and then just riding the wave of whatever, whatever it is you've started. Um, I'm sure that for, for every kind of like I'm, I'm, I'm telling you I'm telling you all the fun and exciting bits uh, of, of, of my journey obviously there's a lot of it which I haven't liked there's a lot of stress there was a lot of hardship there's a lot of you know all of that I'm not gonna uh, but that exists as well so for every 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 fun anecdote and every sort of exciting story there are also other ones um, but overall, overall, I would say, um, just by every now and then trusting, trusting my instinct or sort of sometimes just closing my eyes and going, you know what, I'm just going to step this way and see what happens. Um, I've had a pretty exciting journey so far and um, hopefully um, with this new venture that I'm starting with my partner in Los Angeles and um, you know, together with um, the online community that I've started 10 years ago. And sort of, we're, we're trying to meld this all together and see, see where, we can, where we can take this. There's a, there's, there's a big plan uh, of, of when we get into exciting visual effects projects to share how we've done it to share it on on the forum i i i myself i learn things every single day from my own forum i may be expert in my field but there's a huge influx of new sort of minds and and, and, and younger people or, or older people who sort of say oh, well you know why don't you try something this way or that thing that you've done over there that took you 10 steps i've done it in two and it's very exciting it's very exciting to still learn so I'm going to end this by uh, playing our new reel, um, which
which is basically, I'll show you, or, or do you want to, or do you want to see the Okja stuff? What do you want to see? So both, all right, fine. Um, good answer. Uh, so here's, oh, no, I got this as well. Um, I was talking about AI and how um, all of LinkedIn is now full of, you know, AI is going to break everything. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to kill everything. It's going to, uh, it's going to take away all of our jobs. I want to show you something that we've done, you know, because and, and it's and it's recent, and everyone thinks, oh, you know, in the past in, in in the past two months, and how you can do digi doubles with you know zero efforts, and, and and you couldn't do it. This one here is a real for face replacement. This was using AI, deep fake tech, in uh, yeah, this is from 2021. So this is already um, three years old. You know, a, a lot of what we're seeing today is evolutionary. It's not as new as you might think. In fact, um, so Realm Effects, the company that I started, we have last year partnered with uh, a company specializing in AI. They're not in visual effects at all, but they have very interesting technology, and we're looking at making that available for, um, for visual effects. So there's, there's, there's a whole other thing that I'm involved with now trying to find um, funding for that. Uh, but they've been working with AI for the likes of Microsoft and Google. They're actually in their sector, they're quite big, um, since 2010. You know, that's now almost a decade and a half. None of this, none of this is new, and, 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 uh, and I think a lot of the worry and the fear for AI is, is because of this, this, this sudden explosion of everyone using it, and everyone's getting uh, the FOMO, right? the, the fear of missing out, because oh, this thing happened, and and I haven't seen it, and I haven't been on on this bandwagon, and it's gonna it's gonna replace me, and it's 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 not like that. It's evolutionary, um, and we should just you know this is gonna evolve for another couple of decades. Uh, so just just jump on that train whenever whenever you feel like, but don't ignore it. This was an absolutely fantastic project. I was on set for that one. In, um, in New York. That was actually filmed in, in Wall Street. The visual effects supervisor of Ogja is uh, a man called Eric. Eric de Bourge, who won the Oscar for uh, Life of Pi. Wonderful guy to work with. Absolutely wonderful. No secrets, uh, and someone who, who is absolutely happy himself to learn new things and to give other people a lot of responsibility. Um, I was I was the onset supervisor for some of uh, not this one, some of the shots in the house, and that was because this one, for example, I was on set for this one. Uh, and the guy who's in this in the suit is um, that's my friend Steve, Steve Clee, wonderful, wonderful guy, great animator. He was the animation supervisor, so he spent he spent like five months in Korea. And that's a sock sort of going over her face. Wonderful. Um, so Eric got married in the middle of production and asked me to go to Korea and New York uh, to supervise two different uh, sets over there with literally a two day overlap, uh, which was another one of those, I could have said no, uh, but I said yes. And I learned an awful lot, uh, also how not to do things. And in some cases, um, you know, I've, caused, I've caused a bit of extra work. Uh, having to go to our very fine hairs because we wanted to avoid the use of green screen and but in the end absolutely <coughs> beautiful 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 result we were long listed not short listed long listed for the um, the academy awards for visual effects on this one as well that's Ogja and then in our new reel. Uh, uh, yep. 
you'll see that you know this is this is none of almost almost there's a couple of cheeky sort of shots at the end uh, but almost all of the work in here uh, is has nothing to do with anything that I spoke of um, simple reason being that um, you're kind of not allowed to showcase work that you've done for other studios as your own um, but um, some some of my visual effects supervisor friends have, have given me a couple of ways to get around that. <laughs> so there'll be some, some more personal reels on the site later. Uh, but this is the reel that we're, we're, we're basically now starting with. So this is, this is work that we've done as Realm FX uh, in the past year and a half or so, uh, starting, starting again from, from scratch. Uh, maybe I can ask you a quick question. Uh, it's amazing to see you here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I just was on my phone that uh, I remember on Pixar Forum and Twitter uh, 2007. <laughs> so, so we maybe met in. Maybe, maybe we chatted before. Like, where, where were you in 2007? Uh, I registered on Pixar Forum. Like, oh, no I way! I just on my phone, yeah. <laughs> What's, uh, what, what was your username? I don't know really. What was my? <laughs> you know, I have not used it like. Uh, Are you on Lisa Class? Sorry. Are you on Lisa Class, which is my which is my present forum? No, I need to register. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. That's that's the name of the forum, by the way. I forgot to mention that altogether. It's called Lisa Class. If you if you Google Lisa Class Fusion Forum, you'll find it. You can ask Michal as well. Uh, he's 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 on there. Or Steak Underwater. That's yeah. his also story. When I moved to New York, I just. So he disappeared from this fix file, but yeah. That's fine. It, it, it come back. Uh, <laughs> my, my question is that uh, I have many questions, but like uh, we seen you know huge progression you know, from when you maybe most of the people here are like younger than uh, like you, you were more <laughs> in the industry like the the people are here uh, the, the people that just went. I'm old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I, I get it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, we see the progression, you know, from um, when you wait three hours to go to cinema <laughs> till now when you yeah everything online and mm -hmm. the cloud. Uh, is it something you see that uh, disappear in pr in this progression that was like good, but because of this progress <laughs> that everything is faster, better online, it's not so good. I mm, it's a ooh, good question. It's a, it's a double-edged sword, um, because yes, there are, ooh, there are things that you can do now in seconds, which, which would take days. Um, I think there's an inherent uh, sort of, what's, what's, what's the term? I can't, I can't really think of the, of the, of the word. Uh, complacency, sometimes, that I've, that I've seen, uh, especially in people entering 
you know, there's, there's, there's a kind of impatience um, and sort of an expectation that, that, that tools are going to work for you and do everything really fast. And, um, um, and the amount of stuff that people now, and I'm, 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 I'm talking about sort of my experience as a supervisor as well, the amount of stuff that people just put on a render file just because there is a render file available with like 10,000 CPUs, just gonna put this stuff out there and, and then you know make 30 versions and then, and then make it render, but, but, but without that much progression, it's, 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 it's a bit of a, um, it's almost like it's a bit of a free-for-all. Like people are a, a, a little bit more careless um, than, um, uh, than, than what they tended to used to be. Um, I, I asked a question yesterday um, um, to the, 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 the game developer group, the first one from Portugal, about you know, how they felt whether you know, either story or technicalities um, sort of were a limiting factor. And they mentioned as well, so like, you know, sometimes when, 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 when you are limited in some way, you become more creative. Um, and I would also say, you would be, you, because you have to, you become more efficient. And it's not because now you can have uh, uh, like a comp, a comp that had 30 or 40 nodes was, um, was, 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 was seen as, as a very large comp. Now you've got comps with thousands of nodes. And it's not because you can do it that way that you should do it. I still, I still get a kick of taking something that's that large and doing it with, with just that. Um, and I feel sometimes that that's a little bit, that's a little bit, um, that's a little bit lost. And I see that a lot with, uh, with AI now as well, because you can get so many iterations uh, that instead of, um, you know, um, what was it, uh, what was his name? Um, oh, I forgot his name. Um, through Morgan? Yes, so Tobias. Tobias. Um, you know how he talked about you know have to be really, really careful about your prompt. It's 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 kind of similar. It makes me think of the same thing. Whereas instead of starting to think of the prompt and learning how to properly do a prompt, um, people would just do the same prompt, but they would let it run four hundred times, right? And then they'll see it becomes a bit of a lottery rather than rather than an actual an actual goal. Um, which is something that I've always found as, as well. When you, when you have a goal, it's, I can't, I can't really work without, without the goal. There's a lot of stuff that I would like to learn, for example. I would love to learn, I don't know, C++, or, um, or um, Houdini. I don't know anything about Houdini, but I love what it does. I would love to be able to do it, but I haven't had uh, a project that required me to learn Houdini, so I don't learn Houdini. It's not how that works for me. Um, but there was a time where, for example, I, I, needed, I needed to have a plugin that could read a WAV file and turn that into a curve in Fusion. Um, and I wrote it. Um, but, but, and it's like a brute force thing. It's in Lua, which I didn't really know. It's a scripting language. It's a scripting language in, 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 in Fusion. So I learned the structure of a WAV file. I learned how to open that. Um, I, I, I learned, you know, where the bits were, how to how to read that, and then there's mathematics with it as well. So I learned that, and then, and then put it into code, and I ended up with a plugin that's still being, you know, downloaded. I don't know how many times a day um, that can do that. If you would ask me to rewrite that thing today, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would barely know where to start. I completely forgot about it. But I had that goal at that time, and I just stuck with it until it was done, and then I put it online, and then now it's living its own life. It's fine. Um, but but that's, 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 that's how that works for me. Maybe, maybe not so much for other people. Did that answer your question? Uh, or did I? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I did maybe just one, one more uh, question. Sure. Very brief, maybe. Uh, you, you mentioned the type of uh, supervisor you want, which like, Mm -hmm. with advice that you brought them, which is what was in uh, and it's uh, in my script. Okay. Uh, you can continue. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then there is a second group. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But okay. go, go for, your, for, your, for your second question as um, well, maybe, Dale. I was going to ask, um, and this, uh, I'll, I'll reference my husband because he's a VFX artist. Yes. Um, what, he, what, what, what department? Um, so um, he does, um, he works on independent films. He, yeah. he works um, on, on his own films with just a small group of people. And it, okay. it, it's madness that when they yeah. plan it, they can do what we in a studios do for six months. They can just power through in two weeks. Yeah. And I was going to ask because I work for big studios. He works for a small independent company. Would you suggest um, young professionals to be actually a big fish in a small pond rather than go to ILM and do Roto for 10 years? Oh. <laughs> because, I, you know, I, I always feel like in that way, like he got his hands on so, so, so many, mm -hmm. um, so many things. And even for me as a production person, if I, if I went to Marvel, I am just setting up reviews for six months. If yeah. I'm working on something smaller, I get my hands on from LiDAR Everything. scanning to greens to, producing, to yeah. quirky reviews to, to so many more things. Yeah. Um, but what's your opinion as, as someone who, who's been in the industry for longer? It's going to be the most boring response ever, but it depends. Um, it, it, and it, it depends so much on the person. There are people who are happy doing 10 years of Roto. Mm. Um, and, and there's something to be said for it. I mean, if, you can, if, if you can make a living with that, and you're happy with that, and you're happy in your headphones, and you're doing, you're doing this stuff, stuff day in, day out, or tracking shorts, or doing something very, very um, uh, specialized, that's great. That's great. Um, if you want to um, get your hands dirty in, in, in more things, then you either need if you want to do that in big box VFX houses, you either need the right project for it, or indeed you need to sort of get involved, um, sometimes in your own time, with 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 a different project. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's there's like a halfway house where you work in a big visual effects house and you take that knowledge and you take that to like some local independent art house production. Um, you know, where they don't have a lot of budget, but they have time, so you. you you're not st stuck to deadlines, so the two don't clash. You kind of you kind of have to figure it out for your for yourself. I don't think there's like a magic uh, a magic path where you know I was I started as a as a generalist and I still consider myself relatively generalist uh, in, in in sort of the broadness of my my of my knowledge and 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 I have I have a, a, a love for smaller more creative uh, projects uh, you know the, the, the project that i'm the most proud of is is the project that i'm also uh, happy to show to other people for, for for different reasons sometimes it's a story sometimes it's the idea behind it sometimes it's the experience but but the story behind the project is also almost sometimes more important than than the project itself um, i mean both of them are great and fantastic we've won the lottery um, but that doesn't mean that that's the right path for, for, for everyone to take. Yeah. Um, yeah, much, much, much depends on, um, on where you see your, your creativity as well. Because there, there, there are people who are sort of, how am I going to say this, sort of visually creative. Uh, but creativity, you can find creativity in, in technology as well. So, you know, finding finding what new new ways to to uh, to apply to technology um, that it's not meant for. You know, that's creativity as well. Um, and maybe that kind of well, actually, especially in technology, if you want to be creative in technology, don't go for the for the big box VFX houses because they're so you know their pipelines are sometimes decades old. They're very rigid, but they're also very 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 precise and very um, very robust. Um, but you know, it's, it's how are you as a person? Are you are you someone you you thrive on knowing what you're gonna do, or, or you thrive on you know, a certain amount of stress, or the, the unknown? Like it's it's it, people are very 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 different that way. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So, and the last question from Philippe from uh, online a connection. Uh, I I cannot I see you, so Philippe, please. 
Uh, I don't have a proper question, just uh, to give a big thanks to Peter. This was an amazing journey. Uh, in my previous life, I did some VFX research with new compositing, etc. But I work a lot with VHS, uh, with in PAL format, interlacing, interlacing oh, yeah. soft and hard maths, etc. <laughs> And it it was uh, uh, fantastic, but I would like just to share one thing. It was amazing that I discovered that you, you made probably one of the most uh, funny uh, scenes uh, in explosions in cinematography, which is in Le Triplet de Belleville, yeah. uh, that oh. amazing movie, the explosion to fish some frogs or... <laughs> It was it's it's one of the most funny scenes with explosions in the history of cinema. To be honest, I love that film, and and I was really really happy that you shared that uh, and that you have a, a role on that. So fantastic work that you have. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you that you found it funny. Um, Silva was about to fire me. At, 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 yes. at, that, but, at that moment, um, because he didn't believe and, and I, I was up to it. I said it funny in a negative, in I know, a good way, of course, in negative, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, oh, no, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very funny scene, um, but that was, that was the shot that kind of nailed um, my, my relationship with, uh, with uh, Sylvain, because it was rendering that long as well, and he, he had never seen, um, he had never seen a result that he liked. And there was just one, it was, it was either the one that was rendering for 72 hours or it was none. And if the shot wouldn't be ready, then the production would miss a certain uh, close up deadline. And then the insurance company who was going to put the film somewhere in, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere else um, would, uh, would come in and, uh, and stop production. So it was, it was absolutely nerve wracking. Um, but Sylvain liked, liked that version, and then, you know, the rest is, the rest is history. Yeah, because probably you have that experience working VFX in, in realistic image sometimes is a little bit easier than we are working with, in animation with an authorship and we want to combine different Absolutely. technologies. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, especially when, yeah, when you go into something that's a bit more abstract and, and, and um, a bit more uh, uh, a vision of of a single person. Uh, it's it's hard to, or harder, um, to really get a feel for that for that realm for that uh, for that universe. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, okay, so now we'll uh, take a break. We have some lunch here. It, it is uh, yeah. very cold now. I, I wish that everybody <laughs> will eat. <laughs> what what uh, is prepared and uh, uh, the questions and the workshop will continue maybe in a half of hour or as we eat as we have to because we don't have what to do it so please eat it and, and in half of hour we continue with workshop with uh, Nicoleta and, and there will be a uh, big space for questions and answers. Fantastic. Thank you. Are you all? Thank you very much for having me and our students also. Yeah. Have fun with the workshop. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you again. Bye bye. 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 What do I do
Maybe a coffee as well. <laughs>
zatiaľ s konferenciou. Ano. Za mňa super, za mňa skvelá. Včera išiel viem, dneska šok, ja som včera poslal behnúť, ale sledoval som. A bol som veľmi akože, pozitívne prekvapený ako Belgičanin, že čo sa týka akože, projektov, tak už je fantastické a ohľadne prezentácie, že sa fakt dobre pozeralo, tak to je, je, je tam cítiť akože tá úroveň tej školy. A no, a sa to za mňa, za mňa super. Škoda, že nie je viacej toho času, lebo veľa čo sa mi stalo to, že som sa chcel spýtať otázku a ten čas na tej otázky mi pršal. Tak to je také ako hento a myslím, že to malo veľa ľudí tu. No, bo, 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 bohužiaľ, no, no. Proste, ako, aj, aj tak sme, viete, v tejto chvíli sme 3 hodiny cez. No. Ne, či, čiže sme posunutí, po takomto čase sme, ja sme mohli už uvažovať, že končíme s workshopom. No, no a teraz máme tu takú predstavku a, a tak predpokladám, že ešte dve hodiny. Ďakujem. Jedzte, koľko sa dá, aby zostalo čo najmenej.
máte prístupku kamere, teda tam ovnosno? Tak môže, že na chvíľočku, len potom ju treba zabudnúť to zase spustiť. Dávam tento kábel. To je o čameru, bo neviem, či tam bude všetko. Určite nebude predvera, ale môžem ho tam tiež. To by som možno neriskoval, ešte by som to dal do gredu. message yeah there are people from um, from online from the forums and everything oh. but great talk Okay. Oh, like a debate. And he will share your call. Fantastic. Yeah, but probably this space will have perhaps a bit much confusion. I'm not sure about competitive Yeah, definitely. Okay. Is this being broadcast as well or not? Yeah, this is broadcasting. And the, the YouTube is that still? No, no, YouTube it's uh, working. It's, it, it, it so YouTube is also is also still broadcasting. Uh, it, yeah, now it is uh, switch on once more. It, it yeah. paused for a second, but now. It okay. Is, uh, yes. All right. Uh, and uh, and it's being recorded as well, right? Uh, yes, it is recording, and I uh, make some uh, editing. Okay. <laughs>
s Kablikom. Ok, ja som vedel, ja tak len uvediem a potom ja som s nimi dohodol, že oni vlastne spolu budú asi. Ešte. We can begin. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to, to this workshop slash I don't know, uh, extended talk part of, of the conference. Uh, we have two excellent guests here, uh, Nicoleta Wood and Peter Van Aute, uh, here in person. And I want to thank them. Thank you very much for coming. And no, I don't want to delete my, my great speech. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to basically uh, welcome you here in the ground of Academy of Crippling Arts in Bratislava. And this part will be more open, the, 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 the presentation, uh, more interactive. Please ask questions. Uh, help us to form where we are heading in, in this discussion. It, it, it will be quite fun. <laughs> yeah. Do you have quest questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, when working for a studio, uh, don't you get the feeling that you are selling uh, a piece of your soul when uh, <laughs> uh, creating an art for money? And uh, to to which point uh, you can combine? Uh, uh, like to do the things that you want, but still get the money from it. <laughs> from the studio. <laughs> that's, that's the dream. <laughs> do what you want and still get paid to do it. Um, and, and some people, some people get there. 
Some people do exactly what it is that they want, and they and and, and they get paid for it. Um, it's a, it's a very broad question, and um, a lot of it a lot of it depends. Again, it depends on the person. It depends on on uh, on who you are. Um, it also depends on your. I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna try and go too philosophical. Um, but it, it, it kind of also depends on your definition of art. Um, a lot of, uh, I think the lion's, the lion's share of the visual effects industry and the entire um, Hollywood machine, and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna really generalize when I say Hollywood machine, um, is, is, is not, the, the main goal of that machine is not to make art, it's to make money, right? The only reason why Hollywood is producing so many movies is because those movies make money. It's an economy, uh, and a very large economy. So in that sense, you could argue that you're not really an artist. You're basically, you're an, you're an employee, and you're, you know, you're doing, you're, you're, you're fulfilling um, a, a very specific task for a very specific goal. Um, I like your question because I, I have found myself in situations where, um, where I was glued to a desk, working on something that I didn't like. I didn't like visually, or I didn't like the idea behind it, or I didn't like the people that I was working with. Um, you know, not every single team that you're a part of is, 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 is a team where everyone gets along. Um, there's a lot of politics involved, there's uh, a lot of personalities. Um, and, uh, but I'm also someone, I, I, um, when I, when I do something that I don't enjoy, I can't help but imagining what I could be doing with that time instead and kind of make it worse for myself. Um, so in that sense, Yes and no. Sometimes, sometimes you can get that feeling. So you know, you're selling your soul to um, to the devil, or um, however you wanna, however you wanna express it. Um, but it helps. It helps also taking a little step back sometimes and ask yourself, well, you know, right now, I'm. Well, hopefully, hopefully, when you do find yourself in a situation like that, I, I, I do hope that you're at that point making money with it. Um, is um, um, is making money at this point a valid reason for me to do this? Um, and I will extend that a little bit to um, something that I've done in the past, and it's it's one of the only things I regret in my career to have ever done, and that is to work for free. Um, unless unless it's absolutely something that you you want to be a part of uh, unless it's 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 something that you feel should be um, should be completed and if you can just help that along you know it, it has to have a very specific importance for you uh, but if 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 that's not the reason for you to do it then never work for free um, don't work for free because you know someone says um, you know, I do this one for free, but we've got stuff coming down the line, um, and and we'll pay you handsomely for that one. I've heard that so many times as well in my career, and I've never known that to be true. Um, once you work, either for cheap or for free, for someone, um, I'd say with ninety nine point ninety nine percent certitude that those people will come back and expect you to do the same the next time. Uh, I did get a tip uh, very recently from someone who said, well, instead of doing that, uh, you could say to people, people who say, you know, you've got all this stuff coming on and um, we're going to pay you, um, you know, next time double if you do this one for free or for cheap, you could say, you know what, I'll do the third one for half price. <laughs> pay me my fee now, pay me my fee next time. If you come to me a third time, pay me half price. Um, I've yet to try it out, um, but I'm keeping that one uh, in the back of my head. Um, 
So that's sort of, I think, I think that's the, I think that's, that's the, the moment where I have felt that I've sort of sold my soul to the devil, is sort of working for free and spending all that time and money, uh, because doing, doing something for free actually costs you um, for something, um, for something that wasn't mine that I wasn't, you know, or just, just because I felt I had to, or um, I was somehow um, not tricked, but kind of maneuvered into that into that position. So that's what I would that's what I would say to that. I tried this one and it didn't work for me. It, it didn't work. Either. No. <laughs> but we can try. It. Keep at it. Yeah. Keep at keep it. At if it. enough people do that, it, it, it might become yeah a new it standard. A, a new because standard. It's, uh, nobody is willing to when, do it for when free. Nobody, you know, when nobody is willing to work for free, then, yeah. then eventually yeah. nobody will, will be free. Yeah. quite old for them. Yeah, definitely. Okay, this, this was great. Do we have another great group? Oh! Uh, I have a question. Great. Okay, bye. Have have fun. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Headshot. Uh, I have a question for Nikolata. And uh, I just wanted to ask that when you work with uh, people who do not really understand how much time, work, and skill goes into VFX, especially like directors or some people in production, uh, how would you maybe explain to those people that uh, doing some really uh, complicated CGI shots is just not possible within like maybe four months? I am especially asking since uh, at this school I know that there is a lot of demand towards uh, VFX people. When I wasn't involved with VFX I had the same issue that I expected great things from uh, the artists and I didn't really know uh, how much it actually costs when it comes to the work. So. How would you maybe explain to those production people and those directors that there is there is a border that people cannot cross, and uh, we can do this this way, and it will be actually possible, <coughs> or we cannot do this at all? Um, I myself, when I started in um, production in VFX production, I didn't have that much technical knowledge, and one thing which a lot of animators told me they appreciated is that. I just I brought them a coffee. I sat next to them and I was watching what they were doing for hours, um, after my work hours. Um, but when you are in the position where you want to explain to someone, um, I, I suppose can I ask, are you in a VFX production or are you an artist? Uh, well, at this school, uh, as an artist, uh, is super, well, we have this. Thing. I'm just now entering first year, so as an artist, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be working with a lot of directors. At the, like, we have films that we are supposed to be working in teams, and there is always a VFX artist present. And I know that there is always like a very high demand. So I can tell you what helped me to understand how VFX artists work, and it, it was to seeing it with my own eyes. Um, it, it's. I guess it also varies about, um, you know, it, it depends on people and how, how, how much they take in um, and how much you have to find. I, I don't think there is point in um, being aggressive or, you know, I, I don't think there is any, any point of fighting it. Um, try being very, very patient. I think patience go, go, goes a long, long way. Um, but I think at some point you also have to draw a line. And if someone is not receiving, if someone is not understanding how much time, how much, well, how much generally resources you need to achieve a certain thing, then it's just going to be, you know, every time something comes up, you will always have to have the same fight. Um, so I would, I would say initially try to have those conversations. What helped me really was to actually see it when you know when when artists were rotoing, for instance, um, and and I really realized how tedious it is and how it, that it is it, it's it's a hard thing to do and it is very time consuming. But um, I guess at some point, um, when when someone is not working with you, 
it's just it's always going to. I know it's not very useful, um, but it's. I'm not sure. Do you have anything it's, to add? It's 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 communication as well, yeah. right? And communication communicate communication both ways. Um, I've I've very often seen. Uh, artists go back to their desks because they were given an assignment which they knew they couldn't complete uh, within within the given time frame, but they wouldn't mm. speak up. Mm. Um, so it's it's there's I don't think there's ever going to be anyone really upset with you when you voice <coughs> a, a, a proper concern. Um, you know, um, especially especially production people, but even you know. Creatives can be a little bit less patient with it sometimes. Um, again, it depends. Um, but there's no one who's going to say, well, I wish you wouldn't have said that. You know, it's always better to know things beforehand. Um, and especially if, if I mean, bonus points, if you can uh, um, um, breach that topic by saying, well, you know, I can't do this because if you're asking me to do this, I need X amount of time. And you only given me a third of that but I can maybe do this um, but one of the things I mean Roto is, is, a, is an excellent example so what, what, what very often happens is that uh, a director will sit with a visual effects supervisor and then say well I need to do this and that and that and that uh, okay and the visual effects supervisor will do quick annotations on the image like okay we need Roto for this we need Roto for that we need Roto for that um, then the rotor budget explodes, um, and then by the time it's uh, it's time to comp the shot, it's it's already you know it's already past the deadline. Everything is due yesterday, but then it's uh, it very often helps to have the compositor sit with the rotor artist, and then and then and then and then sometimes like, well then the compositor says well if you just rotor me this little bit over here. That's enough. That's enough for me. I don't need anything else. I don't need this whole thing rotated over the entire entire scene. And again, it's communication, and it's and it's communication between uh, people of, of different departments of, of uh, and of and of different levels as well. Uh, so communication can can solve maybe even most of the problems before they before they even happen. Um, but, but people people are too often sort of a bit a bit a bit shy or a bit sort of um, especially when you work as an employee it's just well you know give me give me my brief and I'll and I'll just do it because that's what I'm that's what I'm paid to do. Uh, and then they end up working twelve hour days and through the weekend and everyone's miserable. So. I would say also to be straightforward and not to lie because people yes. will people will find out. And I I, I I've heard people <coughs> telling me that something will um, and this is why, I, I, sorry, I have to mention him again, but it's so great to have a husband who is a VFX artist because so many times someone told me, oh, this will take me a week. <coughs> and then I went to a toilet and I'm like, James, how long does it take to do this? And I was like, a couple days, two, three days max. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also, th th there's no point of, you know. Don't, don't try and please people too yeah. much. Yeah. Either. That's, I've done that too. Especially when I was when I was starting out, I said, of course I can do that. Of course I can do that. You know, because uh, you know, you're, you're 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 young and you're starting out, and you want you want people to want you. It's 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 just you know, it's it's part of human nature as well. It's it's uh, but it doesn't it doesn't help. It doesn't help. You're only shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, and it also works here at school. It, it it's sometimes hard, but the communication will will help. I, I was here in the first year of the visual effects and. Yeah, just communicate. Everybody then knew nothing about visual effects, and a lot of people were very scared and hated us, and just communicate, communicate, communicate. Someone will be good for you, someone not match your style of working, but with, with no, no problem. That's, that's great about the school. You can jump between teams, try to work on something uh, by yourself, try to work in big team, try to work with other people. That, that, that's absolutely great about this school. So you mentioned that uh, when you are working, uh, I don't know, for some studios, 
then uh, you are like just an employee not uh, as an artist mostly uh, do you think uh, that this approach uh, that uh, we are making money not art um, is what uh, why marvel films uh, for example <laughs> Uh, are getting worse, <laughs> yeah, and worse yeah, and that worse. Is, that is exactly why they, why, why they shit. I, feel. That's, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna. They are, they are tested to death, you know, and and, and it is a little bit. Uh, and this is this is this is a personal view, right? I, I have nothing against Marvel fans. I have nothing against you know people who who, who do enjoy these movies. They are eye candy. I've enjoyed watching some of them. Um, and, and, and definitely um, the, the, the people that have worked on them are hugely talented. So I have, to, I have to be a little bit careful that I don't put sort of artist against employee. And, and so it's, it's, it, it's, it's really not black and white. It's, it's a balance. It's a balance. You can't be a 100% artist. You also can't be like a 100% like button pusher. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit, it, it's, it's an organic it's an organic uh, process, um, but I do think that in terms of in terms of storytelling, in terms of character development, in terms of um, you know, also sometimes blindly, sometimes not, sometimes not so blindly, uh, following the the, 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 the narratives uh, from the comic books, and then you know because comic comic books aren't movies; it's a, it's it's a different medium altogether. There, there are certain things that you can do in comic books. Um, that you can't do in movies and, and, and vice versa. That, that again, that requires talent, that requires artistry, that requires you know, proper, proper writing, designing, all of, all of that. So in that sense, you know, even, even when I say, you know, or, or when I, I appear to have said, <laughs> you're not an artist, you're an employee, that's more from the, from the point of view of a studio system. That doesn't mean that you're not an artist. Of course you are an artist, but it's your artistry that's being used to create something that makes that makes money, and uh, I think I think in terms of in terms of Marvel, I think that the numbers don't lie. Their movies aren't aren't nearly as profitable as they used to be, and, and, and people are not nearly as excited about the movies coming out as they used to be. And some of the stuff that they're churning out uh, faster than we can watch it on 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 uh, Apple or Disney or, uh, or wherever wherever it's it's it, 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 it's appearing on. People are just getting tired of it. Uh, you know, purely personally, uh, what's what's the point of having half of your characters die when they just come back in in in, in the next movie? Because ooh, we've got all these universes now. There's no there's no tension there anymore. Um, you know, you're, you're you're almost breaking every single rule of storytelling and and, and of, of of sort of having characters that you can relate to. Um, you know, it's like it's like characters who are, um, and that's a problem that most superheroes have. Characters that are um, uh, immortal or infallible, uh, they're boring. They're boring. It's it's how can you as a as a human being? How can you relate to characters like that? We we aren't immortal. We aren't infallible. Um, you know, um, wish I could fly, but <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of that there are there are certain certain things that are exciting about it but in terms of in terms of telling a story and, and building building a world that's that's believable because that's that's ultimately you know ultimately you are going to go past past the eye candy and even these films with all the massive visual effects and everything they will date visually they will be watched watch them again 10 years from now and they will be dated i can still remember the first time i saw toy story and I was I was absolutely blown away. I mean, I saw I saw Toy Story. And it's like the, the amount of realism that was in there was was just it was beyond beyond anything. I thought you know now they've nailed it. They've nailed realism in computer graphics. And that was my honest opinion. Um, I, I fairly recently watched Toy Story again. Um, it looks very 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 dated. Um, mobile game. So, so it'll, it's going to be the same with these movies as well. And now, what's left is, you know, is is the story compelling? Is is the content compelling? Um, so, I think, I think, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with with making money at movies. Quite, quite, quite the contrary. You know, the more.
more, the more the better, because it's going to mean more work and you know more interesting work and, uh, and all of that. But um, but yeah, I think I think is, if the emphasis is on creating fodder for the masses, I think I think that's 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 going to show at some point or, an, or, or another, and that's that detrimental to quality. I do believe that. The um, examples that AI for me uh, and also the, the testing of Marvel movies like median of median of median. <laughs> it's 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 a little bit like that. Yeah, it's it is a little bit like that. It's sort of you get you get the average yeah. the average of, of, of everything. Um, and I've I've I was fortunate enough to work for um, sort of unique movies where it's the vision of one person um, and and studio studio movies. Uh, sometimes at the same company, right? Like Ogja was was clearly the vision of one director, Bong Joon Ho. Uh, whereas Marvel, which was the uh, which was literally the movie I just I did right right after that, was a huge studio film, and the difference couldn't be couldn't have been starker. Mm -hmm. And could you suggest a solution for this universe? Like they returned half of the heroes from uh, from the dead. Uh, could you suggest something that could could be done to like uh, to reveal the drama back from the point that they are now. Yeah, or uh, you oh. just don't see <laughs> don't see any good things that can be done. Because if they say uh, they um, they can die now, do you believe them? No. No. You, you can't do anything. Maybe after that another cycle, you believe them if they die and they stay die and stay dead, but. I mean, yeah, there's, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the right person to ask, to ask that question. So also, also, I'm not, I didn't grow up in American comic book culture, so I already don't, I don't really have an affinity <coughs> with, with the whole universe to begin with. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd say for the time being, you know, as long as it makes money, they'll, they'll, they'll keep making them, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, we'll just do something else as well. Would you say, just to check how it's still recorded, just so I know if I, how uh, We are recording. Yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's still recorded. So talking yeah. broadly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Go um, on. All these end <laughs> like, um, Would you say maybe it's a bit of a studio's fault as well? Because I, 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 I've seen yeah. am amazing, amazing directors who, yes. who, who have, who have proven that they are incredibly creative, but they maybe happen to work with a studio who, if there is a problem, they just throw money at him or her. Uh, and then even the director then just kind of becomes, you know, kind of like there's not, there's not that drive of trying to come up with different things. Oh, if I know that, uh, you know, I, I'll run over it. They'll just give me more money if I want to take. If mm -hmm. I want to do three hundred versions of a shot, and because I can't make my mind, it doesn't matter because they'll extend the schedule by six months. Yeah. There's, there's there's a lot of stories out there of sort of independent directors who are then catapulted into the into in, into the studio system, and then make a film that's just just mm -hmm. a bit muddied or um, just you know it's it's, it's too grand, um, and it's, it's it's again that same. The same question of limitation and is limitation is that good or bad for creativity? Um, I think sometimes that's a that's a very good thing. Mm. Um, I mean, you can go too far, um, where you know it's 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 only through a lot of hardship that something something gets made, and then I wouldn't say that end justifies any any means. There are independent directors who who fare very well in the studio system. As well. That's what I feel. Again, it depends. Um, I think I think studios, ideally, have a responsibility to keep a director like that on track and sort of support them in 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 in, in the right way. Because um, it is a little bit like you know you pull you pull someone out of an environment that they are familiar with and you put them in, into a completely different environment and then expect them to to do the same thing. I don't think that's that's necessarily realistic uh, without without the proper surround uh, um, the support around it. Mm -hmm.
I haven't found myself in that situation. But so then she's do not do you not come into my mind? <laughs> right but now. June, but June, is, June is. Uh, I haven't. I haven't seen part two yet. Um, but I said Lynch is Dune. Oh, Lynch is Dune. Lin oh, because sorry, yes. It, yeah. it correlates to this, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, Lynch is Dune was a challenge. Um, yeah. Interesting film. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one's a bit. <laughs> yeah, but it's a bit nicer. Th that's basically a director from this different background mm -hmm. that they at the time and. It was cool to, to this big project, and it, it created something. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, we have a question. Uh, s sorry, uh, the first. He was he was first, and here's Mike. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we touched a uh, little bit on that communication, and I wonder uh, what is your experience as an artist and also as a supervisor with working uh, remotely. And also as a producer with people. Like in in general? In in general. <coughs> um well two there's two sides to it. Um actually it's a very good question. Because on the one hand, um the so when the pandemic happened, before, if, 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 before the pandemic, if you would say to a studio, like half of our artists actually want to work from home because they have families, they have this and that, they have their own reasons, um, no one would even entertain the idea. Like, there's, there's no way, not going to work, not going to be efficient, um, you know, we're going to go over deadline, over budget, etc. Um, and that's and that's what um, most studios were very afraid of when the pandemic happened and people had to start working from home. And in the beginning, it was it, it was a very difficult process and people had to uh, get used to it. Uh, but soon it transpired that, that yes, you can do very complex projects where virtually everyone is working um, from home. Um, my own experience with that was, was, was similar, I have a family, uh, I could spend a lot more time with my family while still doing my work, um, but I have missed and still do um, live interaction with, uh, with people, uh, especially supervising, I find, I find that very difficult. Uh, it's not impossible. Um, but I've always enjoyed sitting with an artist, looking at their work, seeing how they're doing things, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's what was mentioned earlier today as well. Body language is, is such an important, important part of, 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 uh, of communicating. You can, you can see by how someone holds their shoulder, or what happens with their shoulders, whether, they, whether they've even understood something or not understood something, or whether they find something difficult or not. There, there, there are subtleties in that that you just don't get when you're um, when you're on on Zoom. Or, um, I have one great concern with the work from home model, um, and that is especially for uh, for junior artists, um, because it has been so important for me to be around people who knew more about stuff than I did. So I could walk past their desks, I could ask them questions. Um, when they were having a coffee break, you know, they weren't standing in their kitchen, they were standing, standing in the communal space. So you just pass by and say, like, oh, just passing by, oh, I wonder. Um, and then, you know, you, 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 they start to get to know you, you start to get to know them. In order to grow from junior to mid-level to senior artist, you have to have that interaction with people who know more about the stuff than, than you do. And, uh, and, and, and I, think, I think the industry is going to run into a wall at some point because more and more senior artists, especially the people who are so talented that they are specifically by name chosen for certain 
uh, for certain tasks, they now have um, so much leeway that they can say, you know what, um, I don't want to live in Vancouver anymore uh, because it's too expensive. I want to go uh, and live in the UK or I want to go and live in Bali or in Italy. Um, and I've seen it happen. And studios, because, because those people are so crucial, they will say yes to that. You know, I have seen people literally move to from the west coast to the east coast, but even to Europe, to Asia, um, you know, and they live somewhere in, in luxury because it's dirt cheap over there, but they still make the American salaries. Um, but they, they are never in touch anymore with um, mid-level or junior artists. So how, 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 to, solve, how to solve that? That is, that, is, that, that is a big problem. And I don't, think, I don't think the industry is there yet. I don't think the, um, you know, but once, once those senior artists are gonna start to retire or just go out of visual effects altogether, um, and that's happening too, because you know, we, we were briefly talking about the, the strikes in Hollywood as well. Mm. A lot of people have had enough of visual effects. You know, and it's especially the senior ones uh, who are typically also the ones who have some money saved and, you know, because they're not starting out. And they're like, well, I'm going to take my money that I've saved and I'm going to put it towards something entirely different. And they're out of the industry. And then again, you've got, you know, lower level artists. What are they going to do to grow? Um, you know, so in, 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 in that sense, and I, I, I put it in the, in the title of my talk as well, um, which is why I still... I spend an awful lot of time managing my online forum, for example, um, uh, because I, 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 I really, really, really believe that it's crucial to keep sharing knowledge um, with people who are uh, sort of, let's say, a, a lower level artist than you are, but also people who know more, you know, because because. You've got people of all sorts of um, uh, capacities and qualities, and they all they all are thinking together about um, about different problems and building, especially in the work from home environment now, building that community of people that know each other but don't know each other. But you can, you know, as I said earlier, I've I've learned so many things myself just from setting up that forum. Um, so it's, it's not just me sort of providing some, something to, to, to somebody else. It's also, I get a lot out of it too, sometimes in areas that I, I don't expect at all. Uh, I, I still don't think that's the same as sitting together with, with, uh, with people in the, in the same room. I'm sure, for example, just, just today and yesterday, if I would have done this on Teams, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had this. Mm. You know, my talk would have been completely different. It would have had slides. It would have been, you know, it would have been a completely different presentation, and uh, with a lot less emphasis on 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 sort of the uh, um, um, the, 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 the sort of traditional artistic background, uh, but much potentially even much more technical. You know, I might have had a presentation where I, you know I open up Fusion and I, you know, I, I start explaining how 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 IKEA works or something. You know, it, it could have been something completely different, but um. I'm pretty sure it wasn't going to be this, and that's and that's and that's that comes from being somewhere in person, and 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 meeting with the people and, and, and sort of, you know, almost almost feeling in the in, in the atmosphere, um, what makes, what makes a conversation tick, as well. You know, if 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 I would see all of you on a tiny little screen, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to see if you know if four or five of you are playing video games or falling asleep. You know, it's, it's, it's not the same thing, but I could, I can tell now. <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, it's 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 different, um, and and I am I am truly concerned about about that, that sort of shifting from junior to mid level to, to the growing in the um, growing in the industry, and that's going to be bad for the artists and going to be bad for the industry unless unless we find we find ways to uh, we find ways around it. And I'm not 100 percent sure about what what that needs to look like. Um, but uh, I think there's 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 um, there's there's real danger in, in becoming too individualistic um, and trying to get all of your knowledge just from from YouTube uh, and because um, uh, there's a, there's there's a lot of knowledge out there.
but the knowledge is very unfiltered, uh, which is another reason why I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of sort of a, a, like a flat forum system like the one, the one I'm running is because it, it, it is a, a fairly tightly controlled source of knowledge. Um, there's a lot of moderation that goes into the content from people who, you know, there are people on there with, with, with more experience. The, um, uh, my supervisor, Mr. Paul Doherty from um, Parnassus, is one of the users on the forum. You know, and he's, he's well into his 60s now. Uh, you know, huge amounts of experience. And he's there, and you know, he's, he's enjoying being there. Sort of sharing information, and it's, it's 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 great, and he's helping moderate, you know, some of some of some of perhaps a, a, a younger artist might say, well, you have to do this and that, and you know, if someone goes on there and says, well, first the first thing you're doing for King is denoise all your images, I can imagine what goes through his head, right? So he could he he would then chip in and say something about that. You know, I, I think it's very important to keep. Keep moderating and to build, to build an actual, uh, even a virtual, even a virtual community. Even even though it will never replace um, face to face contact, mm -hmm. I don't think that's possible. And it goes for production as well. Of course, for sure. Um, yeah. I I um, I myself had producers who, it, it was uh, maybe I was a bit annoyed because we were in the office for twelve hours and you know the laundry was piling up and. When I worked from home, everything was done. But at the same time, looking back, it was like you said, we just had a lunch. She was um, working on a budget. I, I was there, and she said, you know, the producer, the VFS producer would say, would you mind just, I don't know, helping me double check this? And I, I got my eyes on the documents. I would never be able to see otherwise if I worked from home, because no one would ever send it to a VFX coordinator. Um, so th th there's definitely benefit. I do have to say, I, I do enjoy like a day or two working from home sometimes, oh, yeah. especially when I really need to focus on something. And in the office, it can sometimes, when someone sitting next to you doesn't have anything to do, it's chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. Um, and then your mind is going to explode. But at the same time, it's, it's so useful, it's so essential to be there in the room. Yeah. The ideal is probably somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, there are there are many advantages of, of, of working from home, um, especially especially if, if someone lets you be in charge of your own time. Mm. A little bit. Oh yes, well, if there's a trust, if there's if there's tr trust is trust is everything. It's also it's also you know what we do with artists that we work with, professionally, when we, we we're trying to exclusively work with people that we know we can trust, but we all we also realize that we have to give other people a chance as well because. You know, we need to have we need to have other people as well when when all the people that you trust are sort of busy <laughs> doing something else. So it's a, again again it's a it's a balance it's a balance there. Yeah, I'm trying to push that in the studio that I work on, the new ground. Yeah. Uh, we work three days in the studio, every day from home. Yeah. But they are not like into that, so I'm not much into that. But They're not into that. Why they want to they want to work from home more, or they want to be in the studio more? No, they want me. To they want you in the studio. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, because well, now it's all bouncing back, isn't it? Because, yeah. because it's like, oh, back to office, back to office. And there's, uh, um, there's great resistance uh, because there are advantages to, to working from home. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost with everything like that, isn't it? Everything goes one way and then it bounces back the other way. And then eventually there'll be, there'll be something it's it's like it's like when I when I started working in in the US and you would dare mention a union for visual effects. Oh, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, oh, here's this European guy with his uh, you know communist ideas. Um, I'm not sure that lands well in this room. <laughs> but um, uh, but now it's different, right? Because it's nobody wants to unionize if every everything everything is going well and there's money being thrown left, right, and center, and you know people are like, oh, when when are we going to do overtime? Because I want to buy a new TV, and you know it's like, oh, what's my Tesla stock doing? Um, and then um, now now what happened is you know the Hollywood strikes, who, who, which have had 
major repercussions, mm -hmm. much, much larger than anyone had oh, predicted. Yes. Like, much, much lighter, uh, uh, larger. And we're, we're starting to see mass layoffs in, uh, in large uh, studios. Because, and, and we're seeing the mass layoffs now, because it, it is so cynical. Um, uh, we're seeing mass layoffs now because the studio executives know that the employees are going to unionize soon, so they're going to try and lay them off before they can actually unionize. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. But now people are obviously open to the idea of unionizing because, well, the pendulum has swung the other way. Um, and now they need it. So it's it, it always it's not it's, it's it's not that it's particularly right or wrong. It's just it's just how it happens. And it's going to happen like that with the work from home. And you know, there's going to be people standing on the sidelines saying, "Well, look here, look here. There's this big problem coming." And people, are, no, it's not here now. So let's just ignore it. It's just it's also how nature works. <laughs> okay, we we had a yeah. so hi. I have a question from a bit different topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask about super supervising. Yeah. And currently, even on your own shots when you are working, and even on the shots when you get job get shot from someone who made composition. Yeah. <coughs> you have to give some opinion on it. Yeah. What's the way of your thoughts? Uh, what you are looking at at the first, and how do you decide decide on what you are looking at first uh, when you get the shot? Is it the main? Is it depends on the story, or is it depends on the from shot to shot, or is it what is important for you to know wh what advice would you give? Okay. Um. Overall, I, I'm trying to, well, there's, there, are different, there are different aspects to it. There's obviously a technical aspect, right? Uh, how, how well is something integrated in something else? You know, is, is a, um, are your gamma levels, are they, are they, are they correct? Does it, does it sit well together with the shot? So, so uh, for people who are not in compositing, so what compositing actually is, is you have all these different sources all these different, uh, these different, these different elements that are shot with or rendered with different systems, different cameras, and in the end, the, the the goal is to put all of them together as if they've been shot through the same camera, through the same, the same, the same lens. Um, so there's there's on the one hand there's there's a lot of technical stuff there, which goes from color, over grain matching. Uh, Motion blur matching, um, all of all of these things. Does it does it sit well? Um, there's the vision of the director, which is obviously important, and there's continuity. Does the short work in context? So if you've got five different artists and they're all working in five shots that follow one of the other, you play them back together, <coughs> and then and and then just look at it. Sometimes just squint. Um, just look at it in as many different ways as you can, and if something, even even intuitively, uh, and this is this is also just experience. I mean, by the time you're a supervisor, I, I assume, uh, unless it's for your own film, but I assume you've you've had experience as an artist and and being supervised, and some supervisors will, you know, will will will, will teach you a thing or two about what's important in supervision. Other supervisors. Um, you might not get along with very well, but that will still teach you some things. So all of that comes together um, to a point where, 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 where you look at things different ways, and I'm literally talking, you, you, you look at things in context. Uh, look at shots flipped, just turn them around. If you've seen shots like 10, 10, yeah. 10, 20 times, just turn it around, and all of a sudden it's a completely new shot, and you see completely new things. Where things, you know, you're, you're, uh, the, the brain is a tricky thing. Uh, in the sense that it can it can get used to stuff like which is why for example uh, there are people out there who say they can see white balance not possible 
people cannot see white balance. It doesn't exist. But people will say that they'll, they'll, they'll be able to see that in, in isolation. So that the brain goes as far. I, I love this experiment. Ha, have you heard of the experiment of the, the upside down glasses? Right? So you can, you can get glasses with lenses that literally turn an image upside down. So you see everything upside down. Wear those glasses for long enough. At a certain point, you'll open your eyes and everything looks normal. It's a true thing. Everyone can do it. Then you take off the glasses and everything, without the glasses on, everything will be upside down. And that's just, and, and that's just to illustrate how, how, how malleable the brain is and how self-correcting the brain is. Um, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is absolutely amazing. Um, and this happens. This happens in, in film as well. And, and the more we are used to systems that can play back 4K in real time, uh, 50, 50 times in a row, the more we have to find tricks to sort of reset, reset our brain. And that's, and that's very important. Play them backwards. Um, for animation, that's, that's great. That's yeah, great. exactly. But for live action, same, same also, thing. But um, I, I, I have even played stuff upside down. Um, that city shot from, uh, that was almost a running joke because uh, the city shot from uh, Anonymous, we turned it upside down and then it looked like uh, a scene from uh, Independence Day with the, 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 bottom of the, the bottom of the spaceship. So that was funny because it's, you know, Roland Emmerich. Um, but uh, so, so, so it starts there, and then it's and then it's and then it's knowledge. And um, teach yourself film language. You know, uh, understand the psychology of, uh, of, uh, of 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 how how people watch movies. People watch the eyes. People watch the mouth. People watch faces. You know, we are hardwired to focus on faces. So something that happens outside of the face. Another one. Another one. You should. You should. Um, look, oh, I wonder if we should play it. Wonder if we should play it. Um, we can. I'm gonna. Yeah. Maybe you wanna. Yeah. Just yeah, expand yeah. on the uh, topic a, a little bit. Um, <laughs> you might. You might have seen a thing or two. But I'm um, just gonna. <laughs> I can try um, from a production point of view. Um, I, I did. It's funny you mentioned flipping the shots because I remember on one of the projects, um, our supervisor kept flipping the shots and I. What the heck are you doing? Like, can you just give me a feedback? Like, I need to, I need to say it. I was like, I'm just checking perspective. Um, so I suppose if if um, if you're well on a technical side of the things, there are there are certain tricks you can do to review the shots. And to be honest, sometimes actually I am asked to to help and review the shots when when our supervisor is too tired watching one shot 50 times. He's like. You know, new set of eyes. Like, yeah, new set of eyes. Um, um, and it, it is quite refreshing because I'm going to be watching something completely else, what he's looking at. Um, I, I'm using a small, a small HD ca uh, camera display with false colors turned on just besides, oh. that just to see basically the different version of the image and to uh, exactly see if the images in sequence are in the same exposure levels and, and things like that. And Anything that can help you to uh, pick something up. And also, my question is also because, as there was said, on the things that are on the sides or yeah. the frame, and that they are not so important. And most of the time, when we if, work if so, the, so if long the on the side, is not. Yeah. yes, and most of the time when we are working on something, we are just trying to do details and add something and in VFX and CGI when we are working on details most of the time we, we lose a lot, lot of time so I would like to know where when I look at the shot at what is important to yeah. look at and uh, I what I just it's not important to yeah basically some some m maybe order in what to yeah. track things or well there's there's you know um, uh, if you're working with dialogue eyes faces um, anything that's in the foreground uh, story super important if if nothing else you can't you can't do you can't do everything focus on what's on every single element in the shot that's telling the story 
get those right first. Really? <coughs> one of one of uh, if if you're ever in um, in the situation where you supervise something, um, don't go with oh let's do the low hanging fruit. Right? There's always a couple of things that you can do. Start with start up the hardest things the earliest possible. You know, there's there's too um, too many th uh, times I've seen where um, you know you've got 200 shots to do. There's 10 really difficult ones. 191 uh, other ones are, are relatively simple, and then uh, just for the sake of quota, let's just go. Oh, let's go for the easy ones first, and then at the end, everyone's working all nighters because those 10 shots have not been started, but everyone's doing just versions of those of those easy shots yeah. over and over and over because it goes so fast. Clients go, oh, these guys are working really fast. So I'm just going to ask for another couple of versions, you know, even when they're not strictly necessary. <coughs> and then, and then those hard ones, you know, get get to the hard stuff yeah. first too. Same with shots when you supervise them. Okay, what's the hardest thing in a movie? Is basically, I mean, the only role of a movie is 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 to tell a story. So that needs to be that needs to be right. If you want to faff about doing, you know, hey, this little soldier's helmet over there would be nice if it was a slightly different shade of green. Sure. At the end, when you've got time for that, and it's like, you know what? Why oh, is the green in the helmet? Let me show you. Operation. Anyone who's already seen this, don't say anything. Okay. Um, but this is this is this is a wonderful. Um, so I don't know if, if they're gonna explain uh, the test in the movie, uh, but if because it's it's been it's been a while since I've seen it. But the idea is, so you've got two different teams, and they're gonna pass. Uh, basketball uh, from one another and you need to I think they're gonna say it, but you need to count the amount of passes that <laughs> they um, yeah. the team in white make right. so count, count the ball team in white <laughs> The answer is 13. <laughs> got it. But did you see the moonwalking bear? for transport for London, uh, but is, it, it is, uh, I, I thought I saw the original test as well, um, but I, I find this, um, I used to circulate this film every time I was working with a supervisor who was a bit too involved with, with, um, with details, um, obviously I didn't send it to the supervisor, is that what <laughs> Um, but it is, people do get worried about, you know, about their own shots as well and about their own ability to, um, to finish something um, because they start feeling like they're, 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 missing, they're missing something, something crucial uh, in their shots, which is not good for their, for their self-esteem, for their confidence um, and, and for morale. Um, so that, that helps sort of you know, put put things in perspective, so to speak, um, and it, it, it's also it's also great for morale. Um, you know, to make people feel like they're not they're not they're not alone, um, and to to make them realize as well um, how little importance some some of the stuff that they're working on um, has, especially when it when it plays in the when it plays in the background. Um, you can, honestly, you can you, you can you can give notes forever, yeah. you know, which is why why everyone, including supervisors, including directors, we need deadlines. You need you need at a certain point to say it's done. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, it's 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 the old saying: uh, it's like a shot is never finished; it's delivered. Oh yeah. Right. That's you'll know that one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong, I, f I feel like that's <coughs> when you have a good producer, a good VFX producer behind you. Definitely. Because as an artist, you obviously want to, and especially, it's, it's, it's your name. Um, yeah. You know, a, a viewer's audience won't see the spreadsheets or the budgets, they will see the image. 
but I always feel like in my eyes the good VFX producer is the one who will not only help you to prioritize the, the heavy shots first and then let's go for a cleanup, but also someone who will say, it's good, let's deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Go on. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you've developed a lot of new tech uh, when it comes to like the plugins and you mentioned the Yes. Uh, like the wavelength plugin, and I just wanted to ask, like, do h how do you approach uh, when you're developing this? Yeah. A point where uh, you need to do. Uh, well, uh, let me rephrase it. <laughs> uh, how how do you uh, when do you know if you have to stop? Like, if you're developing new tech and it's just not working, how do you know that this is enough? I cannot go any further. Okay, specifically for tech? Uh, yeah, like, uh, especially the plugin, like, if you develop any new ones and you're kind of going into this zone where uh, it hasn't been done before. Yes. So now you're working on it, and how do you know if it's even possible when you're developing it? Well, when I'm... Oh, right, so, 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 so are you saying, suppose I start developing something and then in the middle of development I realize that I can't develop it at all? Yes, and if you have that, or if you have a way of crossing that in like your mind, maybe. Okay, so if 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 I am developing something and I arrive at a point where I can't develop it, I'll call for help. I'll I'll call someone who's a developer, um, and I know I know a fair few of them, um, and that's that's something that I that I often do, not just with development. If I get stuck. I ask for help, um, and uh, and I, I, I take that very very broadly as, as well um, because um, I've always tried I've always tried to also get in touch with people that I that I admire with people that I you know I like their work I like what they've done I like what they're doing uh, I try to get in touch with them. Um, but yeah, development in that sense, because I, I wouldn't start developing something if I wouldn't believe that it can be developed. And also, I mean, my, my development efforts, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna over, um, overestimate them. Um, you know, I've done, I've done some development, but it's, it's, um, I, I, I don't, I don't develop. I don't develop AI, or I don't I don't develop an operating system, or um, you know anything anything as complex as, as a full blown compositor. Um, I have done uh, a lot of beta testing, and that's something that I've uh, I've really enjoyed. Uh, I did a lot of that at uh, at Sony actually. Sony had a lot of internally developed tools, uh, and some brilliant developers um, who weren't artists at all. And then some of those developments have, have been going on for like, sometimes several years, uh, but no one sort of volunteers for for, for, for beta testing because you can't really use them yet. Uh, and I enjoy doing that. I enjoy sort of seeing where something breaks. And uh, I'm I'm a beta tester for for uh, Black Magic Design Software as well. So you know, there's a secret beta for it for us um, on the Black Magic Design website. So. Um, so I enjoy I enjoy doing that. So in that sense, I I, I have a notion of, of of how development works. When uh, when I was head of two D, especially, I had uh, weekly sit downs with the pipeline team. Uh, so there as well, I learned about you know agile development and sprints and this and that, and they've got their whole terminology. Uh -huh. um, so I learned I learned a bit of of that too. I I, I kind of know how development works, even even though I'm not a developer and I'm not pretending to be one. Um, but in terms of my own developments, it, 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 it's always followed from a need to do something that I either can't do at all or I can't do it efficiently. And then, and then I, I, just, I just start doing it, doing it myself. And then I come up with, um, with my sort of minimum viable product. It's like, okay, what's the minimum that this needs to do? And that often doesn't have a UI yet. It doesn't have any parameters. It just does exactly what it is that I need to do. 
and then so it's 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 usually so so for the audio plugin for example I just had a sample reader and I, I could get I could get uh, data out uh, but it didn't have any parameters it was only after that I said well how can I make this useful for other people that I started exposing parameters and then you know you could uh, sort of um, make make the curve a bit a bit larger a bit smaller you could start animating it and, and, and things like that but that comes that comes after once once I know that the core of it works and then start start building on it. Okay. Uh, we we go up up. <laughs> Always up. Always up. Yeah. Hey, so um, I have a question kind of regarding AI, but in like a bit of a different way. Um, so you talked about how. Um, AI can simplify uh, some work and maybe in the future it will like I think we can agree that it will mm, potentially take some jobs and um, maybe productions some productions can become smaller in uh, in this way um, so uh, but we also talked about the greater productions where, you know, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of people like putting their hands on their project, on like an individual project. And what I kind of feel like you get in the end, like if I mention Marvel again, <laughs> uh, we get like uh, the voice of an individual person being like um, stomped into the ground and you get like this sort of mediocrity. Um, what I guess is the question is when we get to the point where an individual has all these tools in their hands and everyone can create pretty much everything with an idea, what do we get? Do we get more creativity or do we get even more mediocrity and maybe like a hidden gem somewhere in there? But how do you think this will end? With more, more content. <laughs> I think you're gonna get both. Yeah. I think you're gonna get both. You're gonna get an awful amount of absolutely horrendous looking stuff. Yeah. Um, but People have been able to make even feature length films on their own for more than a hundred years. Right. Since almost since the beginning of, 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 of yeah. cinema. Um, there are still very few people around who make feature length films on their own. But every time there's you know I, I wouldn't want to feed the amount of people that have done it. Um, some of them are very bad. Some of them are absolutely excellent. Some of them uh, no one has seen. Some of them became commercial successes. I mean, what, what, was, that, what was that film called? Uh, the Blair Witch Project. How many, people, how many people worked on that? That was, that was all over the place. Like four people did this thing. They made millions. You know, in terms of a business model, that's astonishing. That's astonishing. So why why are so few people, with four of them, making <coughs> million dollar movies? Because there's only a couple of people around who've got ideas good enough to go viral that everyone likes and that, that and that and that becomes a classic. And that's not going to change. I don't think that's going to change. I think I think if there's one takeaway from uh, the earlier session of of today is that we need to uh, we need to stop seeing AI as something that is creative. This is, this, is, this is marketing. This is the big studios, but not movie studios. This is, this is the big data corporation. Tech companies, yeah. Tech companies, it's all about data. Data is worth a lot of money, you know. So the only way those people are gonna make even more money is to get more data. And the more everyone is, using their tools and fine-tuning them and all of that, the more data it is that 
it, it's, it's again a money proposition, but none of these tools have any kind of true intelligence or, uh, or creativity, which doesn't mean that they can't be used in a creative way. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, but it's the same with 3D. It was, it was the same. It was the same with um, with uh, photography. Yeah. Photography was invented. Was like, oh no! All these landscape painters, all these, you know, they're all going to be out of a job. No, of course not. You know, it became it became a medium. It became an art form. Um, you know, then then styles began to blend. Uh, new forms of of of, uh, of storytelling were invented. It's it's just going to be with AI. It's going to be it's going to be the same thing. The, th the the thing that's going to be a challenge, particularly with AI, is the amount of noise, because it, it is it is just it's just spewing out data and content, and, and 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 that's going to be that's going to be a challenge. How do you find, you know, uh, how do you find the gems uh, between between all all that noise that's that's out? I read um, an announcement. Uh, from uh, uh, Hugging Face the other day that they were celebrating one million models <laughs> on their system. So when um, Flo, Flo, to, Tobias, Tobias said, you know, oh, you just have to pick one of the hundreds of models out there. We're not talking about hundreds anymore. You know, they, they announced they have a million models on their servers. Um, even in terms of, you know, say, say you are an artist and you want to you want to even make make some sort of an educated guess on what model would suit your creative vision best? How do you even start? I don't know. Are we gonna we, we, we're gonna we're gonna have to build AI to manage AI? It's 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 it's, it's endless. So that's that's going to be a challenge, but it's it, it's also an opportunity. Um, and I'm 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 100 convinced. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna create so much work, more work. The, the the face replacement reel I showed. Um, uh, so, the amount of work that I had to put in oh, yeah. to, 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 to massage what came out of, of, of the AI tools, I mean, the, the result <coughs> of the AI tools was, was, was great, but there were so many passes, mm -hmm. and there were so many points where, 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 where that breaks, and the stuff that I needed to do as a compositor to, 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 to fit all of that together was completely different from when that would have been a 3D render. Right, because a three D render don't, doesn't have sort of frames that all of a sudden disappear or all of a sudden turn into a different person or a, you know none of none of that. So so, so it's, it was it was it was quite fun actually because it was it was a new kind of compositing that I was that I was doing, and then you know what everyone else sees is like oh my god you know the face has been replaced and it's AI. No, it was you know there was AI was was in there as as a tool, but it was. It was a but it was artistry, yeah. absolutely it was. I think it's very much about how you look at it as well. Yeah. And one, one thing which came to, as you mentioned, the, the face replacement, that's like, there's so much more work involved than just, you have to feed air. Um, but I, one of the examples um, I thought of, let's say you're working on a smaller, more independent film, you need to resize the shot. I think it's so, so great that instead of spending so much money to go and maybe, I don't know, shoot the additional plates or what, I, I don't know. Um, you, you go and you ask AI to just create a little, little bit of the frame which is missing, mm -hmm. for instance. And from my point of view, it's not, it's not that creative because it's the, it's the DOP, it's the animator, it's, it's hundreds of people which, it's the production designer who, who designed the set. But then, you know, for, for some reason, you just need to resize it. And you can, use, you can use these tools in your advantage, save money, save time. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that it's not your shot anymore. No. It's just one of the tools which helped you to literally recreate that little bit of the shot missing. Yeah. It also doesn't mean that, that there's any less work. But it, what it does mean is that it, it will allow you to, um, to put your resources to something that's maybe a little bit more in the foreground, a bit more important to the to the story, um, and you don't have to, you know, do a lot of boring stuff. Um, and it's it's evolution. Like I, I don't know, in nineties uh, you can work in a filthy pet shop and do 
practical stuff and yeah the mm -hmm. 3d cgi came and they are under the job mostly but we have a lot more vfx jobs mm -hmm. <laughs> it, yeah it, it's evolution and it the will probably change well. something mm -hmm. this technology yeah, yeah but that doesn't mean that there, there will be no work because no. look at a studio like leica <laughs> and and kubo and the two strings and the giant skeleton they didn't even use composite uh, to, 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 or, or 3D to make the skeleton look larger. No, they actually built a six meter high skeleton and animated that. It's, it's, it's madness, but it's beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. People still do it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. If you, haven't, if you haven't seen the making of, of, of Kuba and the Two Strings, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I, do, I don't think there is a way to avoid it. So I would just say, let's use it to our advantage. Because I, I, I don't think at this yeah. point, we I can yeah. just not use like... No, the greatest, I would, probably the greatest danger of AI is to not get involved with it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that marketing, that it is AI, that's, that's probably the biggest problem. Because if we just call yeah. it a deep learning, okay, uh, Real-time rendering is coming to VFX. It, sure. It's a threat. No, yeah. you're enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, this is that's the problem of that idea. It's uh, it's some kind of AI that is yeah. taking my work. Yeah, but it's 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 all it's also. I mean, we're still. I think we're over the the biggest hype yeah. now. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, I think it's flattening out a little bit. I think people have have started realizing as well. Um, especially, especially last year, I think I think people lost many, many tens of billions of dollars just investing investing in things that weren't a thing at all. Mm. There was a there was a huge scandal. Uh, I think I think as late as last week about about something. I forget what it was, but it was also some things like you know AI is solving this huge thing. There was nothing behind it, but someone ran with like two billion dollars. Um, so it's it's it, it's a hype, and everyone jumps on it, and everyone thinks it's gonna be it's gonna change absolutely everything immediately. Uh, it might well change absolutely everything. It certainly is not gonna be immediately, um, but it's but it's here, and it's and it's and it's gonna it's gonna stay. Um, so at the very least, uh, learn about it. It's one thing. It's one thing um, that I've also <coughs> always done is uh, my, my memory is not that great. Like, I know, I know people who can read a book and recite it. Um, I can't. Uh, I, I, I forget stuff. Um, but what I have always done is I've, I, I, I know where I can find stuff. Um, I used to have a game with some people uh, online. Um, and we, we, used to, we used to play this game and someone would ask some random question and then like five or six of us uh, would have to either google it or find something something out about it and then you know who, who, whoever was the first to come back with the answer was was the winner silly silly game but it it that was that was when uh when alta vista was still around right so 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 before google there was alta vista it doesn't exist anymore but so the, the earliest the earliest uh, search engines and and it wasn't at all like it was today. It was a lot slower. It had to be a lot more precise. It took a lot, um, but it, the, you know, as 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 I was dealing with it, there were there were certain patterns and certain ways of of, of, of searching for something that were more ex more successful than others. And that kind of stuff I can remember uh, much more than. And then and then I've got a whole part of my brain full of sort of factoids that doesn't. That don't, doesn't serve anything, but you know it's it's there, and I can't use it for anything else. So that's, uh, Five last questions. Okay, uh, but uh, you, you had a question before, I think. Okay, we can. Okay, so uh, you've got two questions. Yeah. Uh, first, <laughs> but not all five. Uh, he, he was <laughs> he was before you. About strike. Uh, oh. How, <laughs> how did it affect it uh, affects industry from your perspective, and what's your prediction for the future? Uh, how it affected the entire visual effects industry, or, or me personally? It's been a disaster. It's been an absolute disaster. There's so much work has gone away. Uh, Personally, I think we're now, 
I mean, it's not, it's not like we haven't been working, but it's, it's, it's like nine or 10 months without paid work, um, which has been good in, in other ways. Uh, I mean, one, one thing that it did show us is that our model and how we started up our company works. Uh, we are much less vulnerable for sh uh, to shocks than um, some of our larger or older counterparts. Uh, we can scale up and down very, very efficiently. Um, so that's 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 been that's been great. But in terms of overall overall work, uh, yeah, it's been. If 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 we would have been um, as tight as some of as some of the studios are. So one of one of the things, one of the little uh, known things about the visual effects industry is that the margins have become very, very, very tiny. Um, so I hear numbers like three or four percent, even for large VFX houses. That's what they make on their productions: three or four percent margin in North America, in, in in Canada, and that's including tax breaks and all of that. Um, smaller houses are effectively financing current projects with the promise of the next project. Um, as long as there's continuous work, it's it sustainable, but it is so vulnerable. So as soon as something like this happens and work falls away, uh, in, in most visual effects studios, uh, the lion's share of the expense is personnel. So the only thing they can compete, or um, or um, what do you call it, um, save save money on is the term, um, is is personnel. So it, it almost immediately means layoffs. Either layoffs or other things that we've seen is reduced salary, right? And I'm talking about uh, a, a particular company that has about three thousand <coughs> employees worldwide, and everyone's salary has just been slashed by thirty percent. It's 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 absolutely it's it's been absolutely insane, um, and uh, I mean it was it was sort of a perfect storm because uh, first the writers are striking and the actors are striking and then you know and everyone kind of knew the outcome, but everyone's you know it's 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 how these things happen is everyone goes to the very last mm. you know they're trying to squeeze every last bit out of out of out of their adversaries as they as they see them it's just like you know david goliath and you uh, left and right and green and, um and uh and i hear that iatsi um iatsi is negotiating now there is a sort of a specter of another strike in the summer which nobody <coughs> expects to really happen but just because the threat is there uh, there's uh, you know studios are holding back and, and, and not wanting to not wanting to invest where it's been good is solidifying our network, um, thinking of uh, th uh, thinking of how we're going to do things longer term, strategies of how we want to work with different partners, be them uh, be they artists, other studios, and even um, even um, companies in different in different areas. Like 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 we said, we've partnered with uh, a company specialising in AI. They have absolutely nothing to do with visual effects or filmmaking mm. but they have technology where we came in and we said oh if we do this and that and that with them we can apply it to visual effects so we're hoping to we're hoping to see that partnership blossom into something into something that's exciting for the industry um, you know so in that sense it's been it's been good it's been good to take a step back to look at to look at the bigger picture and, and, and sort of you know and to sort of manage stress levels and and and, and all of that you know again Again, I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope. I mean, it's 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 fine. Things 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 are coming. Things are moving. Very slowly. Very, very slowly, are. but things are moving. And um, uh, I haven't had a day where I had to ask myself, you know, how am I going to get through the day? What am I going to do? Uh, there's always there's always stuff stuff to do. Um, it's been going on for too long. Uh, I will agree. Absolutely agree with that. Um, I've seen companies in LA close doors after 25 to 30 years. A company who works on it works on Babylon 5 or Star Trek mm -hmm. on you know never been without work in 25 years and they had to close their doors. 60 employees, boom, out in the streets, nothing to be done. So 
that's um, that's tough. That's really tough. Um, I hope it's also a little bit of a wake up call for you know for the industry uh, and to to take a look at, at at how it's run and how fragile it has become because um, there has been they call it internally they call it the race to the bottom and it's just like you know everyone trying to undercut everyone else. Um, I have uh, I know someone with a very small studio who's been undercut by a large VFX house, like large, large, I'm not going to name names, um, the same VFX house that they did subcontract work for in the past. Oh, it's, you know, mm. it's a doggy dog. Um, so it has to stop, and it will stop. It will stop. Uh, there's, there's a huge hunger for new media. Um, which which needs to be it needs to be fed we need to feed the beast and uh, and the beast will be fed and there's going to be probably probably a couple of months from now i think especially in the fall we're all going to have more work than we can handle mm -hmm. and it's going to be it's going to be the other way around yeah. uh, and then we're all going to complain that we don't see our families and we don't you know it's, yeah. it's, it's true um so hopefully hopefully that can be to me, it's still so funny how I mentioned to you um, before the launch. I was like, it just completely like bypassed me for like half a year. Yeah. Because I was, uh, I was, I was in a job in Rome, and obviously we were we were going, we were in post, um, and I was there I think five months, um, and then end of last year I came I came back um, uh, for my wedding, um, did the wedding, went straight to work like in two days. Um, and it was a production in the UK, and I started a job, and people were so, they, they were so worried, like, what are we going to do after this, and, and, and they, were, they were holding the schedules, and, and I just, and I started kind of noticing how everyone is worried, and I was like, like what are you worried for? Because just before I went to Rome, which was five months before that, which was beginning of last year, I had seven, six jobs offers, which were, I, I, I was... <laughs> I, I had to say no to jobs because they were above of what I could do and I didn't want to ruin my reputation. That, that's how busy it was. Um, and, and suddenly it was just, it really came, it really came down, I feel like, end of last year. Yeah. Um, with the strikes. Mm -hmm. at, least, yeah. at least that's how it was in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the US, it was a bit, it was a bit early. Probably, so er so probably so earlier. So and early then summer. Because we were still, we, we still did a lot of posts, so there were, yeah. there were still posts finishing, but there were no more things, there were, obviously there were new things coming, so it kind of caught up. Yeah. That, um, but uh, as you said, I, I think, what's the point of freaking out about what's going to be the next project? Because when we're on the next project, it's going to be 12, 13 hours, mm -hmm. not seeing your family, yeah. being completely exhausted. Yeah. So just enjoy it. <laughs> like it's not, it's not going to be if, if you can. If you if can. You can. And th another thing, if you can, if you're in a lower positions, like assistants, yeah. coordinators, th it is a bit trickier if you, if you didn't make that financial reserve. Exactly. Okay, so. yeah. and, and the visual effects tend to concentrate in very expensive areas mm. like London, oh, Vancouver, yes. <laughs> Los Angeles, you know, hugely yep. expensive places to live yeah. um, for some reason and, uh, and yeah so it's, 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 it's tricky there's a lot, a lot more people living from check to paycheck to paycheck than, than you think. Mm. Yeah. Question number four. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I, I had second question. Uh, I would like to ask about distraction. Uh, distraction or destruction? <laughs> distraction. <laughs> distraction. Yeah. Uh, how do we deal with uh, distraction uh, in terms of internet and online resources? <laughs> and, uh, how does the pipeline change um, when the internet was the kind of rifle? How did the pipeline change when the internet was the, the, the what? A dry, dry force. 
uh, like a the medium for for storing uh, stuff, for learning stuff. Uh, for Probably be like, like before and now. Oh, before uh, sort of before and after work from home. Is that is that what you're no, referring no. to? Oh, uh, before the things resources were at the available. In, in oh the right, yeah. be before the internet. Yeah. Ba basically, <laughs> uh, here's another person yeah, the, the reminding me of my age. <laughs> what was it like before the internet? Um, the internet did exist uh, yeah, yeah. when when uh, when I when I started work, um, and online resources uh, already uh, did exist. Uh, God, uh, actually, surprisingly, little has changed um, because in most. In most facilities, uh, workstations are not attached to the internet yeah. for security reasons. Um, so the internet is available. Uh, it's usually sort of physically in a different room, and there's uh, th there are people in there. Uh, if you want to download something, you ask those people to download it for you. They'll copy it on the network for you. So, but but in terms of how you work in a pipeline, it's completely localized. Um, if there are cloud services uh, attached to a project, same same process. So everything, all the work files, they, they, they will be generated on the local network and then it goes outside. And then that's a whole different thing. And then <coughs> it comes back inside, but inside it's all, it's all, it's all local. Um, if you work on your own and you work on a workstation that's connected to the internet, good for you. Um, but in terms of, um, in terms of my own example, yes, my workstation is somehow uh, connected uh, to the internet in a, in a sort of probably not quite as secure way as some of the bigger VFX um, houses, but secure enough. Um, our, um, our storage, for example, is on a completely different network. Um, so that, you know, where the, where the files are, where the important stuff is, that's not connected to the internet at all. I mean, it's connected to the internet because uh, because we're working between uh, Brussels and Los Angeles, for example. So I've got 100 terabytes sitting in Brussels, there's 100 terabytes sitting in LA, and that's, that's real time being, being synced all the time. And it works brilliantly. Uh, but, it's, but it's a closed loop. It's over the internet, but it's not on the internet, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, and how do you deal with the destruction of the internet? The destruction of the internet? Uh, very badly. Um, I get distracted, just like, <laughs> just like everyone else. You know, I'm 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 a I'm a visual I'm a visual creature. I'm a you know it's it's it's, it's sort of, I like visuals. It's 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 what I do. So yeah, the internet is is there. I I get distracted all the time. So I have to you know. I have to find mechanisms not to do it. Sometimes I set alarms. Uh, sometimes I, I I I do fairly strict schedules and say you know. This one hour, I'm, I'm going to do nothing to do with anything online, even even if I need it. I just need to focus. Uh, very often, if I have to do rote tasks, you know, something that's quite repetitive, I just put headphones on, put some music on, just get into the zone and and and, and do that. Um, but uh, I'm I'm really no different than anyone else. It's it's a huge distraction. I did. Um, um, I did spend some time on Facebook a long time ago. It's about 10, 10 years ago now. Um, and that's one of the best, one of the best things I've ever done is delete my Facebook account. <laughs> that was awful. Uh, um, also, I was all of a sudden sort of conversing with people that have been out of my life for like 25 or 30 years. And that's, that's, that's fun for a, for a while, but then I started thinking, you know, maybe there's a reason why I haven't been in touch with these people for 25 to 30 years. Um, I feel like LinkedIn is a new Facebook now. LinkedIn is becoming the new it's Facebook. Crazy. It is. It is. It's it is so, such a time There's so much content. Like, such a time what, What's and going on? Especially now with AI, it's like I can't open LinkedIn anymore. There's a new model. There's a new this. There's a new person. Or people thing. being, or, or people freaking out. Or people freaking out. It's yeah. one or the other. I, I, yeah. I still, I, I could. Yeah. I always want to check like. Who did something? But now it's either yeah. AI or people freaking out. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, LinkedIn used to be sort of the, 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 yeah. the one place where it was still mm. sort of professional. Yeah. Yes. Right. And it was just it was just to, 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 to build and to grow your professional network. There was there was a huge uh, I, I, I remember there was a huge um, uh, thing uh, on, on on LinkedIn where people would start posting their personal stuff and mm -hmm. people would ship it like, hang on, this is a professional network. 
<laughs> you know, it would sort of self-moderate. Mm. Not at all anymore. Yeah. Not at all anymore. I mean, it's just it's just as much as time suck as 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 Facebook used to be. Yeah. So that's that's a problem. That's a problem. I'd rather spend some time on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> presentation you know you talked about uh, fusion so I would like to ask uh, why do you prefer it uh, to something like nuke what are the advantages or is it just personal preference no it's not just personal um, <laughs> it, it's very personal <laughs> no it's not it's not it's, it's not I mean I, I have um, I have used and made all my money with nuke for more than 10 years um, so it's not like I haven't used it uh, it's not like I don't know the qualities of it um, it's an excellent piece of software for many 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 reasons um, but I find fusion as an all-round piece of software I find it better uh, and it goes it goes to some some very very core principles of the software the biggest one for me is that between the two fusion is the only one that's truly resolution independent yeah. right so if 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 you have a comp in Fusion, and you've you've comped everything in 2K, and the client stops by and says, you know what, I want a 4K version of this. It'll take you no time at all, right? You change your sources to 4K, and everything works. Almost, okay. almost. There are exceptions. Yeah. There are Beautiful. exceptions, but 95% of everything will just look the same at 4K. I have had to, it was on Oz the Great and Powerful, I have had to convert a shot from 2K to 4K and it took me weeks. It was one of the biggest shots that I, that I worked on on the film. It took me weeks to convert it. In Nuke. In Nuke. It, it, it was atrocious. Nuke is advertised as uh, being resolution independent. It is not. What about Cinema 4D? Hmm? Was it a Cinema 4D for... Cinema 4D is a four day, a four D uh, is a is a uh, sorry is a three D three D software. It's three D software. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, you're yeah, yeah. It's uh, talking about uh, about uh, about composing software. Uh, Fusion's got a, a much a much better caching system. Um, so uh, when you have enough RAM, um, and because it's resolution independent, you can work on you know a half, a third, a quarter of the resolution, which you can kind of do in in yeah, Nuke as well, just not not as well so it's got a brilliant caching system which is fairly um, it's not perfect again but it's fairly predictable um, so what that means is when you have enough RAM you can um, uh, store many many frames at once in your in your RAM you can scrub you can uh, you can see things in real time which is fantastic for animation so I do a lot a lot less network rendering with Fusion than I than I do with uh, with Nuke. Uh, the particle system is like miles better, miles faster. Uh, the 3D system uh, they're now integrating USD in it. Um, <coughs> Nuke was the first to come out with um, USD in a composting application, but uh, with the new Fusion 19 beta, you can get uh, a taster of what it's going to become. In Fusion, and it's it's phenomenal. It's phenomenally fast. It's very advanced. Um, when you really geek out about Fusion, you can sort of search into inside the DLLs, uh, <laughs> inside the actual system files, and uh, you can sometimes search for uh, human readable strings and have like a an educated guess of what else it is that they're working on. It's uh, I think I think Fusion has now come past. The, the, the task of having to be converted for Mac, for Metal, for the new technologies, uh, for the Linux platform. You know, Fusion didn't have a Linux, like a, a true yeah. Linux version for, 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 for many, many years. Um, all of that is now passed, and you can see that they are starting to focus on new features. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're in for a very, <coughs> very, very exciting ride, especially, especially for a piece of software that costs. No, the studio version is three hundred, four, three ninety five, is it? Uh, three. Well, let's say let's say four hundred dollars. I think it's two ninety nine. No? Is it two ninety nine now? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's cheap, and it comes with a limited right. random notes. So the, the the cost is just I it's, it's crazy. Nine years 
Oh, so it's and not a subscription. No, no, Fusion is not it's a subscription. not even maintenance. No, not they even maintenance. Everything is a subscription. Unlimited, I know, unlimited render notes. So you can, you can literally, you can outfit an entire studio with one license of 395 dollars. It's too low. And the, in, my, in my view, it's, it's yeah. the only reason Blackmagic Design can do it is that it's basically a hardware. Yeah, yeah. You know, software is, is kind of their side project. But don't forget also that um, uh, in the latest beta, the, um, the interaction between Fusion and Resolve is, is getting ever better. Uh, and Resolve is quickly becoming the standard for color grading in the movie mm -hmm. business, yeah. right? Um, <coughs> and um, every Resolve user. If I, if I get my, my sort of my, my, my spidey senses right, I think I think they're after Avid as well to become the, the de facto um, editor Edit, yeah. in, the, in the film world as well. And to have Fusion right there, I mean, it's. You know, Nuke, 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 great piece of software. I've seen things done in Nuke. I don't know how I would do them in, in Fusion, especially in terms of you know custom tools and pipelining, uh, which makes a lot of sense for uh, for very large houses. Uh, but I I wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole for uh, for small productions, mm. personally. But I I'm, I and don't think any ill of people who think who think who think differently. And um, you can write a small pipeline. In Lua for Fusion. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. I have mine in the Lua. It supports, it supports Python. Yeah, uh, Python too. They have a new Python developer on board. Uh, oh, on, on great. The, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, um, the scripting language of Resolve is Fusion Script. Yeah. So, Fusion yeah. scripting engine has been integrated yeah, in, in Resolve. I, and I, we see every, every release, yeah. you get more and more features more. in Resolve that are scripted. Yeah, it's quite badly documented right now. That it's badly it's documented. But it's, which is I, I, I use that uh, because you have an NLE with scripting. It, it, it's great. I, I, I was doing yeah. a TV show with hundreds of shots, and I, I, I automated basically anything queuing to render anything. Mm -hmm. It's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, I would like to ask you if you could share something interesting that you recently learned in compositing. Wow. <laughs> oh. oh God, how how recently? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is, that is hard. Um, also, because because I haven't been composing all that much recently. Um, Maybe for your colleague. <laughs> or what you learned on, the, on your forum from other users, you could create a concept. I know, that's what that's, 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 or that's from what supervising. I'm, what's that? Or from supervising. Something that I've learned. <laughs> so long ago. No, but there's, there, there are so many. There's so many different things, but there's 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 not one that, that, that sort of sticks out as something. Oh, I wish I knew, I knew that thirty years ago. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna can I can I can I think can I sit on that question for? <laughs> Is that, I find that surprisingly difficult. Denoising keys. Mm, Denoising keys. No, that's 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 yeah, old. Your that's old. Um, oh, there was one thing. It was a it was a very small thing. <laughs> oh no, it's not. It's, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a technical thing. It's a, it, it, um, it's a it's a fusion thing. Uh, but but I never knew. Uh, in you know in the in the user interface, what's annoying is that when the controls come in the viewer, yeah. uh, they slightly overlap your image. Yeah. There's this, there's a setting apparently that you can you can, you can you can uh, the, no in the in the preferences that you can yeah. uh, you can you can give it a border. So it doesn't go all the way to the edge, so the controls never overlap your image. I think I set it up uh, quite a long ago. <laughs> right. So that's I found but information about it on your forum, I think. <laughs> yes. Um, no. One one thing I did do is I um, one thing that uh, Nuke had at the time, <coughs> but this is this is not this is not recent, so it's not it's not it's not a very fair answer to your question. Oh, it's okay. But um, uh, Nuke had um, uh, what was it called? The IBK, the yeah, Kia, the IBK Kia, which Fusion didn't have. Uh, um, I so I set out to recreate IBK in Fusion, um, 
and then yeah, and 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 I succeeded uh, also because um, I looked up these things because so, so apparently IBK started as um, as a fusion gizmo, uh, as a few uh, as a uh, new gizmo. As a, a, sorry, as a as a new uh, gizmo. So, so basically, yeah. it was built out of out of standard tools. And then I started uh, talking to people as well. How, what do you remember from those days? And how, how would you do this in, in tools? And then I ported that to Fusion. Uh, and then I built on top of that because then I could uh, mimic one-to-one -one what IBK uh, did. And uh, ION, back in the day, put it on their, on their website. Um, and, uh, and I built on it. And people are still, even, even though Fusion now has Delta Kia, uh, and the clean play tool and all yeah. that. Some people are still using CAC, which is how you know is the kick-ass key. Um, yeah, in Slovak language, the shortcut sounds a bit funny. <laughs> CAC is poop. Yeah, in, in Dutch as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is why it's a brown node. <laughs> no. Um, true story. So uh, and and to this day, people people <coughs> use uh, use that one as um, as, I'm, I'm as still as using it main, sometimes. Main, yeah. main keys. It's still it's still um, still one of the keys that is best at um, getting fine detail out of um, basically out of, like out of green like screen. IBK. Yeah. And I, l I learned a lot of that. I, I um, just just I I, I I researched all sorts of. Um, Difference keys yeah. and, and and additive keys and learned about what that meant and how can I integrate that into something that I already have to improve it. Uh, so it's got a ton of sliders and, and and really for the latest versions of Fusion, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna probably if and when I've got the time, I'm gonna rewrite it and and make <coughs> it a different a different type of tool set. But I haven't I haven't got to that one yet. That's really cool. So Thank it's uh, reconstru reconstructing the the background, uh, like behind the the actor, uh, for be better feeling, like the background. Uh, yeah. So so one of one of like yeah. It's 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 how it's like building. The, it's how it's building the, the 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 clean plate. Actually, a lot of ideas also came from Ultimat. Um, uh, so so basically, what it does, it's it's it, it works in two stages. So it, it first makes a very hard mat to cut out. Uh, as a core mat. Like a core mat. And then based on that core mat, it can, it can sort of um, edge extend. The pixels? Uh, it's, it's, it's not really eroding. It's, it's, it's like eroding, multiplying, and all of that. But, but, but it kind of extends the, the, the pixels inwards. And that's how it creates uh, a very accurate uh, clean plate. Um, and then on top of that comes the same Kia, but with different settings. Um, uh, but because you have a clean plate, it, it can it can extract really fine detail, um, you know, including including actual actual noise. So it will it will it, it will extract noise differences um, in its in its sort of purest setting, which often you don't want. So you have to rework it. There's lots of sliders, and then and then after that, there's a whole stage where I'm using colors and brightness from the, 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 the actual background that it needs to be keyed on um, to do. Um, oh, that's actually something uh, I think I may have found a different technique that will allow me to um, recolor um, gray edges that don't have the same luminance <laughs> as the green screen uh, in the background and then sort of recolor that with background colors. Um, so that the key might be even even a little better. That's 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 only a couple of weeks ago, and I suspect that's a keying technique that's not in in my in my setup yet. So I'll if if that's the case, then I'll integrate it in the in the next version, which is going to be cool because it's going to be it's going to be cut, but I can write the A as a four, right? So it's K four K and it's oh, version oh, four. Oh. So so, nah. so for that alone, I want to I want to do it. Cool. <laughs> Keep keep learning, keep learning, because um, because um, that technique was posted. I think it was on LinkedIn. Every now and then, there's something interesting there by by a fairly young artist. <coughs> so we'll see. It's it's not always it's not always experience. It's just some experimentation. Yeah, experimentation. Someone figuring out something and you know shared shared learning. It's 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 a great thing. It's a great thing. <coughs> Last question. 
the best, the best question. It's a philosophical question. Oh. Uh, it's a question from Mark. Uh, I don't know if I answered the first. So during your presentations, uh, you touched two times uh, uh, to your family. Yes, so uh, in the case of uh, the point about your husband, in your case about uh, your family, you uh, spend some time with uh, as much as possible time with your family. Mm -hmm. So uh, family values. Uh, it, it, it means that uh, uh, can you imagine that uh, you could be successful as uh, a film artist or a visual artist uh, uh, in your career in, in case if you will not have support from home? From uh, and it means also connection with uh, probably mental health or, or uh, not to go out. Okay, um, no, I wouldn't be able to work if I didn't have the support from my husband. And um, real life examples, when I started working, um, we did six weeks a day. Um, I was traveling on set um, two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. Um, and if it wasn't for my husband who did cooking, laundry, um, pretty much doing everything, um, it, it wouldn't work. Um, then it was, it was when I was starting as well, when I had no idea about technical things, I, I would run to the toilet and I would ask him about what it means. Um, also, a few months before our wedding, I said, the wedding was in Slovakia, we lived in London, and I said, look, um, I got a job offer in Rome and they want me to be there in two days. Can I go? Um, and he just, he fully supported me. Um, another thing, uh, it's such a long day and so many times I've seen my colleagues getting phone calls, when are you home, when are you home, when are you home, you're late. Um, and it just, it doesn't help. Um, I've never gotten that call. Um, whether I was in the office until 7 p.m. or 3, 4 a.m., which does happen during delivery, I never got a call, when are you coming home, you said you would be here five hours ago. Um, and I, it just I, I wouldn't be able I wouldn't be able to do even even when I when I just and I ended up in hospital last year because I, I overdid it a little bit um, and it happened on our wedding day. <laughs> Oh. Um, yeah, huh? um, <laughs> and um, I, I, I thought that this is it, that he will set me down and he will tell me you have to take months off and like no work. And a uh, couple of weeks um, after our wedding, um, I got a offer on, I, I got a job offer on a project which I really, really liked and he just dropped everything and he's been my biggest fan because he knows how important it is for me. So I, uh, I think I, I don't think I would be able to do it um, without the support. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I, I agree. Um, but I also, because it's a bit of a philosophical question, so I want to... It would, it would not be possible to do this without the support of your family when you have a family. Mm. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in visual effects who don't have a family, um, some of whom want to have a family, uh, but some of, some of whom are also perfectly happy without a family. Um, in that sense, <coughs> if, I, I, I will say that visual effects requires a flexibility which is rarely seen in let's just say more conventional industries like, like if, if there is if there is like a notion of what um, as, as my parents used to call it a real job um, <laughs> is then you know you're thinking nine to five and you're home in the weekends and it's, it's sort of you know um, visual effects is not like that um, and personally I don't I don't want it to be like that. I, I like, I enjoy the, 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 the rush of a deadline. Um, to, to a point, to a point, to a point. Um, and, and, and the sort of, 
there, there, there's very particular kind of camaraderie within a team uh, that happens, but it, it does mean that you know you do very long hours, and there's often we've often spoken about you know 12, 13, 14 hour hours. <coughs> I've done I've done those as well. Um, if 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 you have a family or a partner who wouldn't be able to s to somehow support that kind of lifestyle, then then no, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be that wouldn't be possible. Um, but you could you could say that 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 difficulty only exists within families. Um, so in that sense, it's it's um, you know if you want to go philosophical about it. <laughs> Um, coincidentally, one of one of my best friends, uh, my 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 daughter's godfather, um, is uh, um, has specialised in um, work family relationships. Um, written a couple of books about it. Um, he um, he he worked at the University of Barcelona and taught there. Um, so he's he's been he's been using me a little bit as a as a as a test case. Um, uh, amusingly, he also got divorced while he was <laughs> while he was uh, while he was researching researching the the, the, the topic. Uh, and I never I never really got a clear answer from him either. Um, what exactly the relationship is, or what the balance should be. Between um, between uh, between family and work, and it turns out to be <coughs> a very um, a very elastic, very elastic concept. And again, it's a, it depends it depends on on the people. It depends on, uh, but it it does um, it does require uh, a partner who's who's. In certain areas, at least, at least yeah. as flexible as as, as you are, um, and that's not that's not a given. It's certainly not a given. Um, so um, I can I, I, I yeah I, I, I can say that with with a different a different type of, of partner or even 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 family like my, my 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 kids they're still they're still quite young and they don't like it when I go away for uh, for a while. Um, but they understand, I and mean, it's it's kind of their their normal. Um, you know, the first the first couple of times would have been a little bit strange for them, but you know, I'm always coming back, and then you know, it's it, and then I'm home. Um, and and the um, the flip side of it is that when work is quiet, uh, or um, when I'm working from home, um, especially now that I've set up um, a, a business with a partner in Los Angeles. Uh, we've got the nine hour time difference, which means that when I work with them over there, uh, I've got my mornings off. So I can, I can take my kids to school. I can you know, do, do, do things with them in, um, in the mornings. I can do bedtimes and then, you know, it, it, it means there's, there, there are other challenges. I, I often start work at nine o'clock at night and then I go on until two or three o'clock in the morning because I'm also a bit of a night owl. Uh, I'm not a morning, I'm not really a morning I work. I work best when I'm when when it's late and when I'm you know when certain parts of me are a bit tired and don't bother me as much. <laughs> um, I, I, I I tend to I tend to focus a lot, um, and I, I tend to focus well when it's late at night for me. So there's you know there's two two sides two sides to the to the to the story. Yes, there is there is uh, definitely definitely support from from family is is hyper important. Um, but it's you know there's there are nice things about it too. I don't know I don't know if it's coincidence, but so far most of the women yes. I have worked with in a high up positions yeah. didn't have a family. Mm. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, I think and I, I think that's that's a very large that's a very large discussion that, <laughs> that's a very large discussion I, as well. I think I do think that women, especially in higher up positions typically have to work a lot harder than men to get there. Hmm. I, I feel and like it's are, changing and are, though. And, and I, th I, think, I think that's changing and I think, uh, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think, I think 
part of that may also have been um, the notion that they should mm. work harder. I mean, for the longest for the for the longest time, and it still it still happens today. Um, like women will get pretty much laid off as soon as they get pregnant. Mm. It still happens. I was surprised to find out that, for instance, <coughs> studios like Warner Brothers have like a little kindergarten now. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is quite. Yeah. yeah. The I first, like the it. first, the first studio I knew that did that was Pixar. Mm. Edwin, I did say that I will name my first um, son Edwin, by Edwin Cavill. <laughs> <laughs> so the last word for our guest, Nikolai Trafik. The last word. The last word. You have finish in. Oh my minutes. goodness. Um, um, <laughs> if you really, um, okay, um, if you really enjoy what you do, um, do take breaks. Because it's not it's not worth to overdo it, and then I, I know it's a cliche, but it's so true. <laughs> it is so true. Like set your priorities. Work is not everything. Mm. Peter, um, one one last thing because of the the, the men and women thing. Uh, Weta in New Zealand. Um, there's a uh, there's a group for uh, all the um, all the wives of the um, visual effects artists over there, and they're called the Weta Widows. <laughs> no way. Yep. <laughs> True story, today. Oh. So it's, 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 it's a largely, I imagine then, a largely male um, visual effects crew. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, they're called the Weta Wid Widows. But Weta, Weta apparently works their people very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, anyone want to see my student film? This has got a couple of a couple of a couple of minutes. Um, so this is this is really old. This is this is also uh, for people interested in fusion. This is the first the first thing I ever pulled through fusion. Uh, it was literally just a a, a, a color curves node. No idea what curves even did. Um, this was uh, together with a, a friend, colleague, partner of mine called Luke van Lisse. Uh, it was my, he, he was my, my, my first employer, and, um, and um, uh, we were just sitting together one evening, um, and Fusion was brought into the studio by another dear friend of mine called Ralph Schoenmakers, who later uh, created the Crocodile plugins for Fusion. <laughs> Uh, he was the first one to bring version one of Fusion, or, or it might have been version 1.5, into the into the studio. Um, anyway, this is this is the first thing that ever went through there. So if you're wondering why it has slightly old Be colors, um, beautiful green thing. What's that? Be beautiful green. It's green. It's, it's, it's lovely. I, I I I absolutely absolutely love it. Um, let's see. I hope I hope it works. Oh no, that's not that's not VLC. This is my, my first my first in everything in 3D and, and yeah. um, 
things on the big, on screen. A big screen when I when I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> no joking. No joking. Yeah. So long time. Now. Thank you very much for your workshop, for the discussion yeah. that we had now. Uh, I, I think that uh, during these two days we uh, spent very nice time uh, speaking about the various themes from other students, from uh, uh, first class of uh, uh, graduate studies. Uh, then we uh, saw uh, spectacular uh, videos from uh, Belgian students and then uh, we could uh, understand philosophy from the University of uh, Rousseau for a today. We could, uh, uh, think about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, about uh, connection uh, of uh, with, with script writing. Uh, then uh, uh, we could uh, recognize uh, 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 game design from point of uh, not uh, too much familiar for me, uh, uh, from point of uh, uh, designer or or uh, animator. Uh, animator. Uh, uh, later it will be a uh, process of uh, a game design, working on uh, a game uh, product. Uh, then we uh, saw from Nicoletta a presentation about economics and, and uh, communication. And uh, uh, now we had uh, extended uh, explanation of uh, career and philosophy and the point of view of uh, visual effect artists. So please, before I uh, finish our uh, today today's meeting, so try to uh, uh, say something from your point, and then Peter, and uh, then it will be close as well. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It, it, it was honestly, it was um, it was such a pleasure to be here, and I, I don't know. I, I hope it gave you at least a little of what it gave me because I I, I think. It, it, it starts here, right? It, we, we, can, we can expect the, the industry to change to better, whether it's in terms of women having space or whatever, if, 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 we're, not, if we're not being taught these things from the early start. I always say, my, my tennis coach says, it's so, so hard to redo something when it's a bad habit, but when you're building something from scratch and, and you're, you're, you're building a good, good strong foundations. I, I think that's, that, that, that's a good recipe for success. So thank you very much again that I, I could talk to you and, and, and please do get in touch. Um, I love work, I, 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 I love talking the effects, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have plenty of you, so you will see. Oh, so hopefully we'll see each other soon. Well, um, same. Um, thank, thank you, thank you for in, for inviting me. Thank you all for for having me and listening to my ramblings. Um, you're all artists. You're all individuals. Um, through the, the the talks, also in some of the questions that I I, I, I was hoping to ask, um, I've. I've, I've often tried to emphasize the fact that even though you are very strong individuals, um, you're also part of a larger world. You're always working with people, uh, you're working with others. Uh, even art itself can't be art without an audience, right? Art becomes art in its interaction with the audience. It's gonna be the same for your films, for your work, um, but also, uh, to go back a little bit to Mr. Lavik's question, uh, to family, um, you're not alone in this journey, and if anything, a, 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 a fantastic barometer of how you're doing professionally, creatively, is also your your family. You can you can, and and I I mean family as in. Your, your partners, your children, your parents, but also family in terms of in terms of teams, in terms of friends, in terms of your audience. Um, you know they are a good barometer um, for how you're doing, how you're interacting with them, 
uh, and and the influence that you have on them, and and vice versa. And it's 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 a barometer that you'll 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 discover as you go along. It will change as you get older, as you get wiser or just stupider. <laughs> Um, it'll uh, that will grow that will grow with you. So in that sense, kind of family really is a crucial part of of your life as an artist, as a professional, uh, and as someone who's interacting um, with other people in many, many, many different ways. And you know, in 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 that sense, I I consider us all as as artists, as creatives, very fortunate. Uh, because our lives tend to be so multifaceted um, and, 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 and so, so, so complex as well. And to find, to find sort of structure in that complexity mm -hmm. is, always, is always a joy. Um, very happy to have been able to come here in, in person. As I said earlier, this will, would not have been um, the same. Um, you know, I'm happy to... To, to, to give whatever knowledge that I have, I, I got in return, I've got interesting questions, I've got a fantastic mm -hmm. atmosphere, a really nice vibe, really nice, I'm not, I'm not you know, terribly woozy in terms of, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a great energy. Um, so, um, thank you as well, and uh, I hope to repeat this in, uh, in, in, in the future. If you organizing this again next year, um, oh, make sure make sure to let me know. I'd be, I'd yes, be more than happy. To. Come from Los Angeles. Absolutely, or from <laughs> from wherever, maybe Bali. Or <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Thank you very much. Okay. So I want to thank you, uh, our guests. All uh, we will finish uh, this is, uh, last moment of our conference: uh, e International Visual Effects and Game Design. Conference Bratislava 2024 finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. No problem. It was a pleasure to meet you, by the way. Pleasure. Um, yeah. Some, some yes. things just. I know. We can be beat up. Yes. 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 Yes